Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 19. Chapter 451, Fate's Prank Goddess Bless Is he a believer in Evernight or an evil goddess? From the looks of it, it's likely an evil goddess. Lumian made a preliminary judgment as he listened to Annas's answer. Simultaneously, he sighed silently. No wonder people who believe in evil gods love to convert their parents, spouses, and children into one. Otherwise, no matter how cautious they are, many details can't be hidden from their families who spend day and night with them. Anthony Reed held the quietly burning cigarette in his hand and pondered for a few seconds before saying, How did Philip die? The information he had gathered so far indicated that General Philip had succumbed to a sudden ailment, but that was the public declaration. The actual situation remained unknown. Annis's tone drifted as she replied, he had a heart attack in the middle of the night and couldn't make it to the hospital before he died. Anthony Reed asked calmly, where's his body? It was purified, cremated, and sent to the family cemetery in Cartier de El Arito. What Anna said was public information. Lumian turned to Anthony Reed. Ask her about the fate of his Beyonder characteristics. He believed that Philip was definitely a Beyonder. After all, he had managed to rise up the ranks to general in the army, and he also came from an aristocratic family, the chances of him not being a Beyonder were slim. After the psychiatrist finished his question, Anna said in a daze, What are Beyonder characteristics? Anthony Reed analyzed the mentality and knowledge of the individual and changed his question. Where did the thing that emerged from Philip's body go? Or did he have any special items on or around him? Where did it go? Annis recalled and said, when the servant arrived to carry him downstairs to take the carriage, he told me with difficulty that if he died, there was no need to be surprised by any strange changes in his body. I was to stow away the thing that appeared and leave them for the children. Lay, later, too many things happened during the funeral, and I was too sad. That thing disappeared and was never to be found. Never to be found. Lumian had long suspected that General Philip was faking his death. Now, he was more inclined to believe it. He even felt that the other parties beyond her characteristics hadn't truly emerged. The phenomenon Annis saw and the things she had put away were an illusion created by a corresponding ability or ritual and they naturally vanished in time. Anthony Reed, who had discussed this matter with Lumian and the others several times, clearly had similar thoughts. His voice was calm as he asked, What did it look like? Annis's body of heart and mind replied in a voice, It was his fist. It turned skinless, and the joints were like black metal. They were very sharp, and they easily cut through the back of the chair. The beyonder characteristic fused with a certain part of the body, transforming into the potion's main ingredient. Lumian was experienced in this. Anthony Reed further inquired and confirmed that Annis didn't have much information. She didn't even know the sequence of General Philip's original pathway. Seeing this, Lumian circled the master bedroom, and his gaze landed on a photo frame on the desk. On it was a photo of Philip's family, but color photography technology that had emerged in recent years wasn't used. In the family portrait, General Philip wore a high-ranking military officer's suit adorned with numerous medals. He wasn't too tall, and judging from the surrounding items for scale, he stood about 1.7 meters tall. His hair was thick and slightly curled, and his eyes were small, but they had the sharpness of an eagle staring at its prey. The beard around his mouth was neatly trimmed, and the tip was even coated with paraffin. The bridge of his nose was unique, as if it had been broken and hadn't healed, causing the middle section to bulge. Lumian observed closely and memorized Philip's exact appearance and characteristics. If he had truly faked his death to escape his original fate, according to Madame Justice, this likely involved the loss of an old fate and the acquisition of a new one. It wouldn't alter his appearance. In other words, the current individual was likely a stranger who looked identical to General Philip. Lumian hoped to recognize him at a glance if he encountered him in the future. Let's go, Anthony Reed concluded his telepathy and said to Lumian in disappointment. Lumian wasn't disheartened by the setback. He nodded gently and said, 
to that charity organization. The purpose of the charity organization, known as the Dream Seekers, was to provide assistance to outstanding young men who had come to try or to pursue their dreams but had temporarily fallen into a predicament. To this end, even the staff employed such young men and provided them with free apartments. The apartments were located in a house rented by the Dream Seekers. The lower two floors housed workplaces, and the upper two floors housed staff quarters. Asa, who controlled the charitable organization, also resided there, indicating that he was genuinely assisting the Dream Seekers and not seizing the opportunity to amass wealth. After leaving Rue Viv, Lumian and the others hurried towards Cartier II, the Arts and Financial District. Cartier II was very close to Cartier III, where they were currently located. Before long, they arrived not far from Rue saint Vero. The Dream Seekers was located in Building 11 there. As soon as they alighted from the carriage and before they could approach the street where their target was, Lumian and Anthony Reed saw crimson flames rising in the dark night. Fierce flames transformed a building into a colossal torch in the night. Lumian's eyes narrowed as he had a bad premonition. After exchanging glances with Anthony Reed, they sprinted towards Rue St. Vero. Thud. 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 The two of them passed through an alley with a barricade and saw that the house that had turned into a fiery hell was Building 11. It was the office and staff quarters of the Dream Seekers. The crackling flames soared into the air, sealing off the four-story building and scorching it black. No one cried out for help or attempted to leap down from the windows. It was as silent as if everyone had died long ago. Residents of the street woke up and fled in a hurry, others wanting to help the firefighters or watching the commotion from afar. Anthony Reed looked at the burning building and sighed. We're too late. Lumian stared intently for a moment before slowly shaking his head. No. Perhaps fate doesn't want us to gain anything. No matter how early we arrive, we'll see something similar. With so many evil God-blessed involved in the planning, investigations would inevitably encounter various forms of interference. Some were direct, some indirect, some seemingly normal, some rather bizarre, and some seemingly failing to gain fate's favor. Lumian paused momentarily before continuing, at least this means we're on the right path. Anthony Reed fell silent for a few seconds before saying, this indirectly proves General Phillips' connection to an evil god's faith. My encounter with my comrades might stem from this. As he spoke, his voice trailed off. Dozens of meters away from the burning building, Lumian's face mirrored the fiery inferno as he gazed ahead, his voice steady. Do you still want to pursue this? This situation is getting more perilous with each passing moment. It's far more dangerous than the encounter with gunfire you've experienced before. Up to this day, do you still wrestle with the fear from that night, the sounds of sudden gunshots? Do you truly possess the courage and determination to press on? Anthony Reed lapsed into silence. The middle-aged man, battle-hardened and weathered, remained contemplative for an extended moment. Before them loomed a house engulfed in raging crimson flames. Masked firefighters in their red and blue uniforms, citizens in disarray, and chaos swirled around them. After an uncertain pause, the psychiatrist, his receding hairline and slightly plump face, spoke softly. Perhaps I perished in that attack. What remains is an avenging spirit, relentless in its pursuit of truth and retribution. I can be vanquished, but I can't relinquish the pursuit. That's what I felt when you mentioned the existence of Leeds and Hope. Lumian offered a sly grin and turned toward Anthony. Welcome to the Abyss of Vengeance. Returning to the market district, Lumian wasted no time in composing a letter to Madame Magician, apprising her of the night's operation and its final outcome. He couldn't shake the feeling that the current situation had stretched beyond the capabilities of his team. Regardless of the clues they unearthed, it seemed as though the threads of destiny conspired to sever them, leaving their investigations seemingly fated to failure. This uncertainty gave Lumian pause, making him wary of delving deeper into the mystery, fearing that their actions might inadvertently endanger the slim glimmer of the less significant leads on your own. Termoboros resides within you, a heavy stone capable of stirring ripples in the river of fate. He's not easily swayed, unlike the hope they still clung to. 
Before long, the doll messenger returned, bearing neatly folded papers. All fates intertwined to weave a grand drama. Should you come across any future clues, share the vital ones with me. Investigate the less significant leads on your own. Termoboros resides within you, a heavy stone capable of stirring ripples in the river of fate. He's not easily swayed, unlike the others. Furthermore, we shall make other attempts. Other attempts. Lumian sensed that the Tarot Club had undertaken numerous clandestine endeavors, yet like his own, these investigations had ultimately proved futile. Considering the Tarot Club's potency, Lumian suspected that this case might be met with direct interference from angels or even evil gods. After reducing the letter to ashes, Lumian reclined on his bed. As he prepared for sleep, he contemplated the direction his investigation should take. Linked to the hostel, individuals engaged in painting, writing, and those with a penchant for reading tend to encounter trouble. In the whirlwind of his thoughts, Lumian's mind settled on one person. Gabriel, the playwright who had once taken up residence at Aubert's Du Cope d'Or. Gabriel had relocated to Rue Saint-Michel in Cartier II, a district teeming with painters and authors. It was an ideal hub for artistic exchanges. Mr. K and the official organizations had only ruled out well-known painters and authors. Countless aspiring talents who hadn't yet made a name for themselves flocked to Trier. The investigation of all these hopefuls within a short span seems an insurmountable task. Moreover, many young dreamers pursuing artistic ambitions call this city home. The dream seekers had even thrown their records to the flames. Lumian quickly reached a decision. At the break of dawn, he planned to visit Gabriel, inquiring whether the playwright had encountered any obscure authors or painters who had yet to garner recognition, or if any unusual anecdotes had circulated among these artistic circles. Chapter 452 Manuscript At noon the following day, Cartier II, Rue Saint-Michel. Lumian quickly realized that it was only a short distance from Rue saint varro where the Dream Seekers charity organization was situated, just a block and a square away. As expected of the Arts District. Lumian raised his brows, feeling that he was drawing closer to the truth and edging ever closer to the answers he sought. He glanced away from the sun obelisk standing proudly in the square's center and strolled along Rue Saint-Michel, tracing the path that winded past the ancient and weathered buildings. He couldn't help but notice impoverished painters hunched over their sketch pads at the square's edge and along both sides of the street. Musicians played their diverse tunes with guitars, violins, and flutes. Every so often, white homing pigeons glided gracefully beside a fountain that sent water cascading in sync with the music. The warm autumn sun cast a poetic charm over the scene. Having spent a considerable amount of time in the market district, often consumed by thoughts of revenge, engrossed in investigations, or participating in banquets, Lumian had rarely immersed himself in the everyday life of Trier's core area. Unfazed by the sunlight and the languid ambience, donning a brown round hat, a light blue shirt, and a casual brownish-yellow suit, he made his way into a bar named Third Rate Authors. Here, most patrons sported well-worn attire, sipped affordable spirits, and engaged in animated discussions on various subjects. Occasionally, when inspiration struck, they'd retrieve well-thumbed notebooks and jot down their thoughts with the fountain pens they carried. As Lumian approached the bar counter, he couldn't help but overhear a lively discussion among some of the patrons regarding the latest art exhibition. That piece called Café is incredibly controversial. Some people laud it for its vibrant colors and audacious composition, seeing it as a silent protest delivered in an absurd form. Others think it's a deliberate attempt at abstract art, a ruse to dupe the public's intellect. I find it fascinating. The artist's ideas are vividly depicted through those overlapping colors. Just think about it. Isn't that how many cafes are? Noisy, bustling, with people from diverse backgrounds clashing and mingling like a chaotic blend. I'm willing to call it a groundbreaking masterpiece of abstract art. Are you talking about the kind of abstract art that's never been recognized or sold? Lumian couldn't help but think, Café. Isn't this the painting Mullen created using his buttocks? Someone genuinely holds it in high regard? 
could it possibly become the most renowned and valuable work of his life? He pursed his lips, inwardly sighing. You triarians. Upon reaching the bar counter, Lumian spent eight licks on a glass of absinthe and raised his voice. Everyone, I have a question. If anyone can provide the answer, this glass is on me. As all eyes in the bar turned towards him, Lumian spoke up, I'm looking for the playwright, Gabriel. I need him to write a script. In Rue Saint-Michel, nearly anyone one bumped into on the road could be an author or painter, let alone in a bar known for its literary discussions and artistic creativity. Gabriel had frequent meetings with fellow writers and may even host private gatherings in his rented apartment. After all, Lightseeker had seen successful screenings and was quite popular, which would bring him significant benefits. He hasn't shown up for a few days. He claims he's locking himself away to finish a story, a middle-aged man near the bar counter responded to Lumian's inquiry with a smile. He's probably swamped with scripts. Would you consider other playwrights? There are several equally talented young folks around here. Hasn't shown up for a few days. Lumian furrowed his brows momentarily before relaxing. How will I know if I don't give it a try? I come with plenty of sincerity. All right, the middle-aged man in the tattered formal coat murmured. I hope you won't be disappointed. He led Lumian to 34 Rue Saint-Michel and climbed the stairs up to the fifth floor, near the attic. The outer walls and stairs had a slightly outdated but still well-maintained appearance, and it was notably cleaner and more spacious compared to Aubert's Du Coke door. This is where Gabriel resides, the bearded middle-aged man informed Lumian, rapping on the brown wooden door of room 503. A muffled sound echoed, but there was no response. Perhaps he's out searching for food, or maybe he's completed his work and gone to see the theater manager who commissioned it, the middle-aged man suggested with a forced smile. Would you like to return to the bar for another drink? I'm an experienced writer myself, though I've never ventured into script writing. My novels sell quite well in the underground market. What have you written? Lumian asked, glancing at the firmly closed brown door, showing no signs of anxiety. The middle-aged man sighed and said, I wrote Monk Pursuing Dog and its sequel, Dog Pursuing Monk, but they weren't published under my name. For one, it would lead to my arrest by spies, and secondly, my boss wouldn't permit it. A sequel? Lumian hadn't visited an underground book market or a banned bookstore for some time. His last visit had been to purchase Emperor Roselle's Secret Chronicles. As he looked at the somewhat forlorn and slightly greasy middle-aged man, his perspective shifted. He could be considered one of his initiates into the adult world. It came out last month, the middle-aged man replied, nodding gently. These two novels have made my boss a fortune, but I didn't even get a tenth of that, no, not even a hundredth. Boss? Lumian inquired, recalling that Bard, a key member of April Fools, had once authored Emperor Roselle's Secret Chronicles. He saw this as an opportunity to gain insight into the workings of this profession and prepare for future tracking. The middle-aged man sighed again. We don't have authorship rights, just writing tools for the boss. He pays us a fixed but tiny salary for our manuscripts, specifies the direction and requirements for our writing, and then sells them through his own channels. On Rue Saint-Michel, there are many third-rate authors like me who don't even have pen names. We're like assembly line workers. Lumian, showing respect, asked, May I know your name? The middle-aged man replied, Rabe. His eyes were filled with hope as he gazed at Lumian. Lumian probed further into the world of underground literature, gaining insight, and ultimately said, If my attempt to reach an agreement with Gabriel falls through, I'll consider offering you an opportunity. Rage joy was palpable as he responded, As long as the boss doesn't assign me any new missions, you'll find me here at third-rate authors every day. Watching the underground author, an initiate for many Intus youths, descend the stairs, Lumian took a wire from his pocket and unlocked Gabriel's door. Compared to the playwright's room at Aubert's Du Coke door, this space was considerably more expansive, encompassing a bathroom and a small bedroom. Beyond that, it served as a living area, study, dining room, and kitchen. A coal stove for cooking was neatly arranged in a corner. 
Lumian quickly surveyed the room and noticed a jumbled stack of papers that resembled manuscripts on the desk by the window. He shut the wooden door behind him and proceeded towards the desk. It's Gabriel's handwriting. Rabe was telling the truth. This is definitely Gabriel's residence. Lumian mused as he held the stack of papers and began to peruse them. Moving into the bedroom, he spotted a pair of black dungarees casually draped over the bed. The sight confirmed his earlier suspicion, he was in the right place. This was a pair of pants Gabriel had frequently worn in the past. However, the playwright himself was conspicuously absent. Recalling Rabe's statement that Gabriel hadn't been seen for several days, Lumian's caution escalated. He meticulously examined every item in the room, much like a hunter tracking the movements of his prey. After a few minutes, Lumian picked up a white glazed porcelain cup with a single handle from the desk. He noticed that about a third of it still held cold water, with dust floating on the surface, too subtle for ordinary eyes to discern clearly. At least a day. Lumian's heart tightened with concern. What could have happened to Gabriel? Was it possible that his prominence had attracted the attention of government spies seeking a conversation? Or perhaps he had unwittingly become the target of money-seeking kidnappers? Setting the porcelain cup down beside the manuscript, Lumian meticulously combed the room, searching for any clues or signs of interest. His search yielded nothing of note. Returning to the desk, he picked up the stack of manuscripts, eager to delve into Gabriel's work before his unexplained absence. The script told the tale of a struggling author who crossed paths with a woman coerced into joining a criminal organization. Together, they found solace in their shared despair, pain, torment, and the harshness of daily life. They offered each other encouragement and warmth, ultimately leading to the author's recognition by the newspaper's editor-in-chief and a steady income. His reputation steadily grew, while the woman, still trapped in her circumstances, chose to vanish. Before the story could conclude, it ended with a passage about the lover's disappearance and the author's introspective musings, She's here, my beloved has arrived from the night. She's left, my beloved walked towards the distant hostel. The mention of the word hostel made Lumian's forehead twitch. Though it was an ordinary word in a script, it stood out to him due to his daily contemplations and associations, sparking connections in his mind. His gaze suddenly shifted from the manuscript to the desk. At some point, the white glazed porcelain cup with a single handle, which he had moved to the manuscript, had somehow returned to its original place. Lumian's eyes narrowed, and the muscles under his clothing tensed. As a hunter, he had an unwavering memory for any alterations he made in his surroundings, it was a fundamental part of him. A creature that is challenging to detect with the naked eye and can only be confirmed by certain traces. Lumian silently recollected the information Jenna had relayed from the authorities. Suddenly, he reached into his pocket and retrieved a pair of glasses. They were brown gold-rimmed glasses, mystery prying glasses. Chapter 453 Missing Author Lumian carefully positioned the mystery prying glasses on the bridge of his nose, and immediately, the room seemed to whirl and the ground beneath him trembled. Suppressing his nausea and dizziness, he observed the scene before him fragment and overlap, creating a surreal and captivating tableau. The bed pressed against the desk, which seemed to lean against the ceiling. Behind the ceiling appeared to be a tap, as if it were installed within a wardrobe. These scenes were like translucent canvases superimposed on each other, reflecting themselves in Lumian's vision. A pale white face materialized beside the wardrobe. The face had disheveled brown hair, naturally parted. Dark brown eyes glistened beneath black framed glasses. It was Gabriel, looking cleaned up and as though he hadn't burned the midnight oil in a while. The playwright gazed at Lumian with a vacant, distorted, yet strangely genuine smile. His right hand reached out from the void, waving gently before his face shrank into the depths of the translucent layers, vanishing completely. Lumian quickly surveyed the room, but Gabriel hadn't reappeared. He promptly removed the mystery prying glasses, replacing them with the eye of truth on his left side. This mystical item, composed of pale white flesh and dark blood vessels, 
cover the corresponding ear, allowing Lumian to hear rapid voices from the distant horizon. The intertwined purple blood vessels formed a lens that adhered to his eye, revealing faint blood, layers of colors, and the room with a third of it blending into the surroundings. An invisible curtain resembling mullion glass was also discernible. The latter two phenomena rapidly dissipated or gradually returned to normal. Before the whispers could become more distinct, Lumian removed the Eye of Truth and massaged his throbbing forehead. Based on the combined information from both mystical items, he deduced that Gabriel had been corrupted by Hostel, becoming a presence that couldn't be perceived or touched in the conventional sense. However, the playwright retained a certain degree of rationality. He recognized Lumian and even happily bid him farewell. Returning the white porcelain cup with a single handle to its original position seemed to serve as a greeting, an attempt to capture Lumian's attention. Lumian frowned slightly. Why does Gabriel seem to accept his transformation into a monster and was even pleased? When had he come into contact with Hostel? His gaze shifted to the manuscript on the desk. The story in the unfinished script felt eerily familiar. Lumian picked up the manuscript and read it meticulously, at a slower pace than before. After perusing the first section, he confirmed that the protagonist of the script was Gabriel himself. The character's personality, the details of his life, the cold treatment he endured, and the demand to produce vulgar works all aligned seamlessly. Regarding the female lead, who immersed herself in the underworld and persistently encouraged the male lead's creations, Lumian couldn't help but feel that if it weren't for the difference in gender, he could be the one with such a background. However, the female lead's personality, her way of speaking, and her encouraging words were entirely distinct from his own. Even in the scenes involving the mobs, Lumian could discern traces of Charlie. In essence, the female lead's identity, background, and experiences in the mob appeared to be a blend of Charlie's and my situation. It was however someone else who interacted with the male lead. Gabriel had previously mentioned that only me and the human model Seraphine encouraged him at Aubert's Du Coke door. Charlie merely drank with him without mocking him or teasing him. A human model. That's right. The human model for a painter. Seraphine spent a night with Gabriel before moving out. Lumian rapidly connected the dots, sensing that the root of the problem might lie with Seraphine, the human model. This woman had once accompanied a painter to a small seaside town as a model. After an extended absence, she returned to Aubert's du Coke door. Painter. Could Gabriel have been corrupted on that night when Seraphine returned? Was it possible that Seraphine had moved to the hostel? Lumian meticulously perused the script, leaving no word unread. Since this was a story born from Gabriel's own experiences, it undoubtedly contained numerous factual details and genuine emotions, invaluable clues. As Lumian continued to read the script, bathed in the sunlight filtering through the oriel window, he sensed the concealed love that resided within Gabriel's heart. He could feel the ache of remorse, reluctance, and the yearning for a relationship that Gabriel believed he could easily discard when he moved to a better neighborhood to start anew. In the end, he found himself unable to forget it. The protagonist, increasingly aware of his heart's true desires and feelings, ceased to evade them and actively embarked on a quest to uncover traces of his beloved. He sought out people who were acquainted with her, visited motels and hotels that occasionally haunted his dreams, and explored galleries in search of new artworks based on his lover. Yet, his endeavors proved futile, leading him to compose the inner monologue. It ended here abruptly. I can't tell if he found Seraphine. Lumian placed the manuscript down in disappointment and decided to check the drawer for any drafts, outlines, or notebooks that might contain further information or inspiration. Regrettably, the contents of the drawer only covered the first half of the script. By the time Gabriel had reached the second half, he appeared to have delved deeply into his emotions and penned his inner monologue in a single burst. Lumian looked at the papers before him, pondering the situation. From the script and the other items in the room, it's apparent Gabriel hadn't managed to locate Seraphine. In other words, he hadn't actually come into contact with the hostel. 
Furthermore, neither the script nor Rabe's description suggests that Gabriel exhibited any signs of corruption or boons until he ceased writing. While he was undoubtedly suffering from the loss of his lover, this was a typical emotional response. So, why had this person suddenly transformed into an untouchable, unseen monster? Just knowing about the hostel shouldn't lead to such a situation. Apart from me being special, Franca and Jenna know about the hostel. Anthony Reed, Teresa, the Demonist sect member in Trier, Mr. K of the Aurora Order, and a large number of purifiers of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church all know about it. There are ordinary people and beyonders among them, but none of them are in trouble. Beatrice of the Bliss Society knows the location of the hostel and aims to retrieve a painting, which was the reason Franca and I made a mistake. Bouvard of the Sinners prophesied a catastrophe associated with the hostel, leading to his corruption into a peculiar corpse. The Dream Seekers charity organization likely sponsored heretics connected to the hostel, such as painters and authors, and they were destroyed at the slightest hint of exposure. What was the reason for Gabriel? Could he have recently encountered something that deepened his understanding of the hostel, or perhaps he had found traces of Seraphine? Lumian made a preliminary guess and conducted a thorough search of Gabriel's rented apartment with a clear objective in mind. Nothing. He then left 34 Rue Saint-Michel and made his way back to the third-rate author bar, where he seated himself next to Rabe, who was engrossed in his drink. A glass of La Fay Verde, Lumian ordered as he tapped the bar counter. Then, he turned to Rabe and inquired, Do you have any idea where Gabriel has been over the past few days? Rabe pointed to a small round table near the window and replied, You'll have to ask them. As an underprivileged author working as a ghostwriter without a pen name, Rabe considered himself fortunate to know a rising star like Gabriel and attend his private gatherings. He had to work regularly every day to fulfill the missions assigned by his boss, preventing him from participating in their activities. Guided by Rabe, Lumian approached the small round table and was taken aback upon seeing the four individuals seated there. Weren't these the same individuals who had discussed Painter Mullen's art spoof art, café? In response to Lumian's inquiry, the leader of the group responded with a puzzled expression, We last saw Gabriel two days ago. We all went to the Trier Art Center together to attend an art exhibition. Art exhibition. Lumian's eyebrows twitched. Trocadero Town. Franca, dressed in a white jacket, followed Brown Sauron, who wore a black coat, as they navigated through the manor adorned with grapevines. With curiosity evident on her face, Franca, who had been invited, couldn't help but ask, Where are you taking me? Browns cast a brief glance in her direction. I'm taking you to meet my teacher. You've successfully passed the assessment and are now an official member of our section. Brown Sauron's teacher. A high-ranking demoness? Could this person be the leader of the demoness sect and trier? Franca's thoughts raced as she smiled and inquired, Does this mean I can enjoy the membership perks? The term perks was coined by Emperor Roselle and had gained recognition in Intus. Browns maintained a bit of distance from Franca as she questioned, What would you like in exchange? Without hesitation, Franca responded, The potion formula for affliction. Affliction was the name of the Assassin Pathways Sequence 5, often referred to as the Demoness of Affliction. Browns let out a scoff. Quite bold to make such a request. Do you believe you have accrued enough contribution points to ask for the potion formula for affliction? She paused for a moment before adding, Of course, if you can assist the sect in achieving something, this can be your perk. Franca, who had initially held limited hope and was merely testing the waters, glanced at Browns. And what's that something? Seizing the opportunity, Browns explained, We've received information that the Iron and Blood Cross Order discreetly smuggled an item into Trier through an underground tunnel several months ago. If you can uncover what it is and identify its possessor, you'll be entitled to the Affliction Potion formula. A few months ago. The Underground Tunnel. Secret Delivery into Trier. Franca suddenly recalled Rat Christo's loss of his biological brother. In an effort to aid the Savoy mob smuggling leader in recovering his brother and the transported goods, she and Lumian had been drawn into a strange mirror world, where they narrowly escaped. During their adventure, Franca had acquired a classic sterling silver mirror. 
Chapter 454, Hidden Honorific Name Franca had long harbored the desire to uncover the nature of the item that Gardner Martin had smuggled into Trier through Rat Cristo. However, in the months that had passed, Gardner Martin had acted as if the incident had never occurred, and nothing of note had appeared around him. From the looks of it, the demonist sect attaches significant importance to that item. That's right. Given that this item had triggered the strange mirror world, it is highly likely that it was linked to the powers of the assassin and hunter pathways. Franca took a moment to consider and then admitted, I know what you're referring to. She explained to Brown Sauron in the same manner they had explained the situation to Rat Cristo in the past. In essence, she shared everything except the fact that she and Lumian had been drawn into a mirror world. Instead, they relied on Lumian's unique ability to escape and how she obtained a classic silver mirror that led them to the mirror world. According to the rat, his brother and many of his subordinates turned into monsters, including the reversal of their left and right hands. This attracted the purifier's attention were eliminated. Franca deliberately elaborated, probing Brown Sauron gauge her reaction to the appearance of the mirror people. Brown's displayed a slight furrow of her brow. How did the official Beyonders become aware that something was amiss? She seems to know about the mirror people and their specific traits. Franca looked away and shook her head. For that question, you'd need to approach a purifier, not me. Without further discussion, Browns led Franca to a circular pavilion enclosed by grapevines and various vines. Seated in the circular pavilion was a woman donned in a black court dress. Her bright dark gray eyes held a touch of sadness, and her neatly tied black hair featured a few loose strands, which cascaded naturally and added a hint of allure to her otherwise composed countenance. Upon catching sight of the woman's slightly curved red lips, graceful jawline, and soft facial features, Franca was initially struck by the overwhelming beauty that met her gaze. However, her astonishment was quickly overshadowed by an unexplainable sense of sympathy. Although she was taken aback and touched by a sense of heartache, it took nearly ten seconds for Franca to remember encountering this woman before. She had seen her during her and Lumian's surveillance of the fake Teresa, Beatrice in court, at the concert. As the most beautiful woman in attendance, she had been invited on stage to take a photograph with the orchestra as a keepsake. Is she Bronze's teacher, a high-ranking demoness? It's no surprise having a high-ranking demoness overseeing the operation and ensuring its success. Franca was momentarily surprised but soon realized that this situation was in line with what she had anticipated. What she hadn't expected was that this woman had openly followed them and even participated in a photograph on stage. Brown Sauron introduced her teacher, saying, This is my teacher, Demoness of Black Clarice. Demoness of Black. According to Madam Judgment, Demonesses with a color in their title are considered exceptional even among the demigods of the Demoness sect. Some are even suspected of being angels. Franca placed her hand over her chest and offered a slight bow. In a polite and gentlemanly manner, she said, It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Demoness of Black. Franca avoided complimenting the woman's appearance. She understood that most demonesses in the Demoness sect took pride in their beauty while simultaneously harboring inner conflict regarding it. Compliments from outsiders were typically accepted with grace, potentially leading to some embarrassment. However, if Franca, who knew their true gender, were to offer such compliments, it might be perceived as provocation or mockery. Demoness of Black Clarice nodded slightly and said, Every member needs to believe in the primordial one. You should have known about this more than a month ago. It's time to officially pray to her. Franca was not surprised at all. Secret organizations that worshipped evil deities typically required new members to open themselves to their deity, thus gaining a measure of control and filtering out most insecurities. Lately, when visiting Browns, Franca had followed Madame Judgment's instructions, conducting a preliminary ritual that sought the protection of an angel from Mr. Fool. We are all the children of the primordial one, Franca responded devoutly and respectfully, adhering to Bronze's guidance during this period. Clarice's expression grew solemn, and her eyes were filled with admiration. Recite the honorific name of the primordial one with me and Hermes. 
the source of all catastrophes, the symbol of destruction and the apocalypse, the demoness who controls chaos. Although the demoness of black spoken in Titian, the surroundings darken significantly. The grapevines writhe gently, as though transforming into venomous snakes. Franca remained composed and repeated the three-line honorific name in Hermes. Suddenly, she saw grapevines extending towards her. They grew thicker and thicker, completely enveloping the circular pavilion. One of the python-like vines extended toward Franca, and a dark blue vertical eye opened at its tip. It reflected Franca's figure. The figure rapidly distorted, transforming into a man with a bloodied face. The man had short flaxen-colored hair, slightly thick brown eyebrows, and lake blue eyes. His lips were thin, and his appearance was ordinary. Franca was taken aback. This face was familiar to her. It was the face she saw in the mirror every day before consuming the witch potion. This was her past self, Franco Roland. In the deep blue vertical eye, Franco Roland's expression turned ferocious. His eyes held a tangible hatred, and his face was filled with a viciousness that could cause nightmares. Franca's body stiffened, as if she had turned into a statue made of rock. After staring at her for a few seconds, the vine with the blue vertical eye retracted into the canopy of grapevines, its eyes reflecting its unhappiness. Franca finally felt her body. She blinked and saw that everything around the circular pavilion was normal. Sunlight pierced through the gaps between the vines and shone here. There were no python-like vines, nor were there any blue vertical eyes. It was as if the bizarre and nightmarish encounter had never happened. All of it appeared to be a fleeting, surreal vision. She lowered her head and completed her prayer. As Franca continued her rituals, she couldn't shake the eerie experience from her mind. The connection between the primordial demoness and the underground mirror world was undeniable. She had encountered her past self, Franco Roland, in the mirror world as well. This time, it wasn't Franca reflected in the blue vertical eye either. It was Franca's former appearance, Franco Roland. Demonus mirror magic and mysticism's mirror world seemed to hold many secrets. What Madam Judgment told me isn't everything. With this realization, Franca raised her head and opened her eyes to look at the demoness of black Clarice and brown Sauron beside her. Clarice, with a black veiled hat on her head, nodded. Now, you're a child of the primordial one. Thank you for your guidance. Franca smiled and inquired, I thought the honorific name for the primordial one would include a description akin to the ruler of the mirror world. I'm surprised it's not part of it. The demoness of black, Clarice, replied in a cold, indifferent, yet pitiful tone, this isn't the complete honorific name of the primordial one. There are two more lines you can't know right now. The primordial demoness has two hidden lines for her honorific name? Franca suddenly felt that this detail revealed something, but she was uncertain about its significance. Clarice continued, every new member receives a primordial one statue. It possesses anti-divination and early warning abilities, and it can assist you in performing rituals. You must pray to it every day. While speaking, she produced a bone statue, the palm-sized statue vaguely resembling a beautiful woman with hair that reached her ankles. Each strand of hair was intricately carved with distinct, snake-like eyes, some open and others tightly shut, densely packed and unsettling. Praying every day. Franca hesitated, deciding to be patronizing on this matter. After Franca stowed away the primordial demoness statue, Clarissa's brow furrowed imperceptibly. Keep a close watch on the iron and blood cross order, especially Gardner Martin. If they make any unusual moves, contact Browns immediately. If the situation becomes critical, retrieve the primordial one statue, set up the altar, and perform the designated ritual. After completion, place the prepared letter into the mirror on the altar. Keep a close watch. Unusual moves. Franca extracted the key points from the demoness of Black's instructions. She sensed an impending catastrophe and couldn't help but grow anxious. Does the Demonist sect believe that the Iron and Blood Cross Order is on the brink of launching a major operation? In Cartier II, outside the Trier Arts Center, Lumian stood on the steps, contemplating the author's responses that flashed through his mind. 
Gabriel has been enjoying art exhibitions and galleries for the past month or so. He doesn't pay much attention to each painting. It's as if he's searching for the one his soul has been waiting for. There's nothing unusual about him. He didn't fixate on any other visitors at the exhibition. Dot. The information revealed by these answers left Lumi and puzzled about his next steps. Nonetheless, he had decided to visit the Trier Art Center to explore the art exhibition titled Future Impressions. It was scheduled to end in another two days. Before arriving, Lumian had secured a hotel and a room for setting up a ritual. He summoned a messenger and informed Madame Magician about Gabriel's encounter in the direction of his investigation. Initially, he had planned to relay the message from the bar's washroom, but he recalled that the doll messenger had severe misophobia and obsessive-compulsive disorder. Consequently, he opted to spend a bit of money to find a clean and suitable place. As he gazed at the colorful art center with its sun-like roof, Lumian took a slow breath and presented his ticket to enter the building. Future Impressions wasn't a large art exhibition, occupying only three exhibition halls. Lumian strolled through, admiring the artworks displayed on the walls. Suddenly, he spotted a familiar figure. Chapter 455 Two Children the figure he saw was a boy of about seven or eight, dressed like a young gentleman with yellow hair, brown eyes, and chubby cheeks. He had an honest and innocent aura, and Lumian immediately recognized him as Baron Brignese's godson, the peculiar boy, Ludwig. Ludwig stood in front of a wall painting adorned with donuts, his young eyes fixated on the artwork. Sensing someone watching him, he turned around and spotted Lumian. Lumian smiled and playfully teased, running away from home again? Ludwig, this time with more composure, replied, No. I told my godfather that learning can't be limited to textbook knowledge. It's equally important to read more, hear more, and interact with other things. Lumian inquired, and he brought you here to see the art exhibition? However, he couldn't spot Baron Brignese in the vicinity. He noticed that Ludwig's intelligence and knowledge seemed to have improved a bit, allowing him to come up with an excuse he had used before. It appeared that learning was having a positive impact on him. Ludwig nodded and added, yes. It's important for a child to cultivate an appreciation for art from a young age. Lumian clicked his tongue and continued, so, no textbooks, homework, or exams today. Ludwig responded, a joyful smile unknowingly plastered across his face, it's incidental. Internally, Lumian noted, there's been some growth, but not much. At that moment, Baron Brignese, donning a silk top hat and a black suit, approached from the other side of the exhibition hall. Lumian couldn't help but make a mocking remark, aren't you worried he'll get lost? As a conspirer, Lumian picked up on something unusual about this situation. Given Brignese's past anxiety when Ludwig ran away, he shouldn't have left the child alone in the exhibition hall. Brignese smiled and said, Ludwig has been doing well recently and hasn't tried to run away from home. He was engrossed in admiring the paintings, so I didn't want to disrupt him when I went to the washroom. Sounds like something an irresponsible parent would do, but Baron, you weren't like this before. I suspect you did it on purpose. You deliberately left Ludwig alone in the exhibition hall to see what this strange child would do? Heh <laughs> heh, you don't have to worry about him. You have to worry about the surrounding visitors. If this guy gets hungry and you don't provide food in time, I'm afraid someone will be eaten, Lumian criticized as he made a guess. He sensed that Baron Brignese had an ulterior motive for arranging this visit to the exhibition. It was akin to leading an experienced hound to a specific occasion, releasing its ropes to see if it would track down certain prey. After answering Lumian's question, Baron Brignese, clutching his bulging briefcase, looked at Ludwig. When you get back, write an essay regarding the art exhibition, detailing your feelings and the work that left the deepest impression. Ludwig's expression crumbled. Lumian was not surprised. He had plenty of experience being thrown into such a situation. Instead of conversing with Baron Brignese and Ludwig, he chose to continue his observation of the paintings. His attention fixated on the presence of any motel-like structures within the corresponding pieces, 
the existence of a human model resembling Seraphine, and the potential impact on the visitors' perceptions and their surroundings. Regrettably, Lumian's exploration of the three small exhibition halls yielded no significant findings. Instead, Mullen's café drawing, which he had created with his buttocks, drew the attention of numerous tourists, sparking both admiration and criticism. Standing in the final exhibition hall, Lumian contemplated his next move. Retrieving his brown, gold-rimmed glasses, he decided to give them a try. Since his unaided vision and spirit vision revealed no discernible issues, he opted to test the mystery prying glasses from the same pathway. Carefully positioning the glasses on his nose bridge, Lumian braced himself as the world around him seemed to spin and whirl. His focus remained on the scenes unfolding within his vision. Each painting took on a life of its own, breaking free from the confines of the walls. Some of the paintings seemed to regard Lumian with a chilling, penetrating gaze. Initially taken aback, Lumian feared that something extraordinary was afoot with all the portraits, potentially placing him in a dire situation. However, he soon realized that he wasn't under attack. The figures within the portraits merely stared at him with silent and cold intensity. It was as if they had attained a degree of consciousness and a sense of being, yet they hadn't fully emerged from their canvas confines to walk among the living. A revelation dawned upon Lumian. Through the lens of the mystery prying glasses, he was witnessing another reality. Perhaps, in some parallel aspect of the world, each painting held a semblance of reality. However, they remained two-dimensional, flat, and lacking in depth, incapable of significantly impacting the human realm or the spirit world. There might be exceptions, moments where extended contemplation of certain works induced feelings of delirium or anxiety. It occurred to Lumian that painters could potentially amplify the limited, flat nature of these objects, opening a pathway to the realm of the real. In essence, the characters within ordinary paintings might possess an incomplete, condensed, and spiritually deficient existence in this two-dimensional, flat world. With the aid of the mystery prying glasses, they were unveiled in their true form. Likewise, Lumian's perception unveiled deeper truths, the artist's most profound creative intentions. One painting depicted the future of Trier, a divided realm. On the surface, men and women reveled in lavish banquets, adorned in opulent attire. Beneath the surface, ragged individuals dwelled in dark tunnels, subsisting on earthworms, rats, and moss. Yet, through the mystery prying glasses, Lumian glimpsed fat, glutinous pigs with oil oozing from their mouths on the surface. Below, Grotesque, contorted visages and decaying hands reached upwards. This was the true message the artist sought to convey. In the next instant, Lumian spotted Baron Brignese and his godson Ludwig. The former appeared unremarkable when viewed through the mystery prying glasses, but there was a faint, brassy aura emanating from his form. As for the latter, something chilling unfolded as he abruptly turned his head, seemingly locking eyes with Lumian across two exhibition halls. Ludwig's chubby face took on an unsettling transformation, his skin seemed to writhe, as if it were on the verge of shedding, and something from beneath the surface attempted to burrow out. Lumian's heart tightened, and he instinctively removed the mystery prying glasses, instantly restoring the scene to its normal state. There's indeed something amiss with Ludwig. Thankfully, I reacted quickly. Otherwise, I might have seen something I shouldn't have. Lumian's head spun and his feet felt like they were stepping on cotton. He had always sensed that Ludwig was far from ordinary, but this encounter had sent his danger instincts into overdrive. The true nature of the innocent-seeming human skin concealing the boy beneath remained an ominous mystery. Ugh. Lumian had worn the mystery prying glasses for an extended period this time, and his discomfort was overwhelming. Despite the diminishing dizziness, he felt profoundly nauseous, with a painful ache in his stomach, a pressing need to vomit and tend to other bodily functions. Even a conspirer's constitution couldn't withstand this. Taking a deep breath, Lumian made his way to the washroom adjacent to the three exhibition halls. It was situated at the end of a long corridor adorned with statues and paintings, perfectly in line with the Trier Arts Center's ambience. Once inside the washroom, Lumian attended to his urgent needs, and after washing his face with cold water, 
he gradually regained his composure, with the discomfort dissipating. Exiting the washroom, Lumian's gaze naturally drifted toward the opposite wall, where a series of paintings were on display. One particular painting drew his attention, a macabre and enigmatic piece that gripped his senses. It was an oil painting set against a vividly layered background, with a focal point on a naked woman. Her face remained blurred, as if the painter had intentionally left it blank. On her body, distinct faces emerged, each bearing a different emotion, anger, hatred, malice, joy. Some of these faces resembled those of cats, others of dogs, and some appeared to exist solely in the realm of fantasy. What united them was their eerie, translucent yet lifelike quality. As Lumian stared at this unsettling painting, a thought dawned on him. During Gabriel's visit to the art exhibition, he had seemed perfectly normal, at least as per the accounts of the authors. But they couldn't have monitored his every move, especially during mundane activities like visiting the washroom. Avenue du Marque, Theatre de Lancien Cage a Pigeons. Jenna had just stepped out when she spotted a familiar figure standing beneath a gas street lamp on the opposite side of the road. It was a young boy, dressed in a white shirt, silver vest, black coat, and a mercury bow tie, his light yellow hair neatly combed. The child who brought me good luck last time. That formidable beyonder. Jenna exclaimed inwardly, taken aback. She instinctively crossed the street and approached the boy. With a slight bow, she greeted him with a smile, Were you waiting for me? The boy glanced at her and muttered, I wasn't waiting for you. You were waiting for me. You met me earlier than any other choice. What's the matter this time? Are you offering me good luck for the impending catastrophe and getting me to discover something? Jenna's thoughts raced as she casually asked. Didn't you say that this direction was a little dangerous last time? Why are you here this time? The boy's response was measured and earnest, that day was that day, and today is today. Just because it was a little dangerous that day doesn't mean it's dangerous today. All right. Jenna probed with a probing smile. Do you need my help to buy you an ice cream? The boy, however, responded with a long, almost adult-like sigh. It's something else, I'll pay you. Pay? Giving me good luck? Jenna had a vague idea, but she didn't inquire about the reward. She decided to cut to the chase, asking, What's the favor? The boy reached into his pocket and retrieved a gleaming golden coin, sidestepping her question. This will be your reward, a lucky gold coin. Chapter 456 The Charlatan's Instructions Perplexed, she inquired, this isn't Verldor? The boy chuckled and explained, this is a gold pound, more valuable than Louis Dor. You're not fermentous. Jenna was taken aback, but she didn't think there was a problem. The boy's appearance did differ somewhat from the locals. I'm Loanese, the boy with neatly combed, light yellow hair replied honestly. Jenna chose not to dig deeper, understanding that whether the coin was a gold pound or Louis d'Or didn't affect its practical worth. Based on their previous encounter, she trusted the boy's ability to bring good luck. She looked at him, awaiting his next words. The boy returned the lucky gold coin to his pocket, showing no intention of prepayment. Instead, he pointed at the ground and said, At ten tonight, enter underground trier from the entrance here. Proceed as far as you can, following any available path, until you reach an underground river. Find a hiding spot nearby and wait for the first person to pass by. Take all their belongings. Before completing this matter, you can't tell anyone what you want to do or where you plan to go. Go underground purely based on intuition and rely on luck to find prey. Jenna found the boy's instructions rather reminiscent of Seal's charlatan temperament. As for how to acquire the person's belongings, there seemed to be only one solution, through combat, she was to subdue the other party. Jenna knew the boy was likely a formidable beyonder aligned with her cause, and without hesitation, she agreed, got it. The boy smiled. When you obtain those items and hand them over to me, I'll pay you the lucky gold coin as a reward. How should I address you? And where should I find you when the time comes? Jenna, aware that he wasn't an ordinary boy, couldn't help but speak in a respectful tone. The boy mumbled, 
you can call me Will. Talking to me like that makes me sound like an adult. I'm just in elementary school. When the time comes, you'll naturally encounter me. Is he one of those born beyonders mentioned at the mysticism gatherings? He's indeed young, but his abilities are outstanding. Jenna made a connection and followed his instructions. She replied with a smile, all right, Will. Will waved her off and said, you may leave. But I'm planning to have lunch at the cafe diagonally behind you. Jenna muttered and changed direction to head back to Rue de Blouse's Blanches for food. However, after walking for more than ten meters, her curiosity got the best of her, and she turned to glance at the iron black gas street lamp pole. The strange boy, Will, had vanished from his spot. Jenna took a closer look and realized that he had entered the nearby cafe and was now seated at a booth by the window, where an attendant had just brought him a cup with three scoops of ice cream. He's truly just a child. Jenna mused, her curiosity satisfied as she continued on her way. In the financial district, within the Trier Arts Center, Lumian took out the brown mystery prying glasses once again after having surmised something. With no hesitation or fear, he donned the mystical item. The exhibition hall had been his main focus, with the washroom separated by a long corridor. Amidst the familiar dizziness, the oil painting in front of Lumian underwent a peculiar transformation. The faces adorning the naked woman's body turned to look at him. Simultaneously, Lumian sensed the presence of a creature on the rooftop, where the overlapping sky was, staring at him from a distance. It appeared to be trying to navigate the obstacles and approach him rapidly. As the blurry face of the woman in the oil painting gradually clarified, her true identity became apparent, brown eyes darting, brown hair cascading, a plump, smooth-skinned face, and an air of detachment. Lumian recognized her. She was none other than Miss Seraphine, the former tenant of Aubert's Du Coke d'Or, the human model, and the lover playwright Gabriel had been searching for. As Seraphine's face became clearer, Lumian's surroundings darkened, as if faces were on the verge of emerging from the painting or the void. Quickly, he removed the mystery prying glasses from his nose bridge, and all the anomalies vanished in an instant, leaving only the sensation of raised hair on his skin. As expected, the human model for this oil painting is Seraphine. Although Gabriel is an ordinary person and doesn't possess the mystery prying glasses, he once slept with Seraphine and knows her physical characteristics. That must have been how he noticed traces of his lover when he entered and exited the washroom. Could it be that Seraphine possesses multiple faces on her body, appearing both painted and alive, just like this oil painting? Wasn't Gabriel afraid back then? After discovering the oil painting with Seraphine as the model here, he encountered that normally difficult-to-see creature when he returned. The timing matches up, the water glass on his desk was more than a day old, and he visited the art exhibition two days ago. Something must have transpired late at night. After being attacked and possibly corrupted, why did he remain in the apartment until my visit? As Lomian's thoughts raced, he turned his attention to the oil painting's signature, Claude Pierre August. The painter was not widely recognized, otherwise, his artwork would not have been hung along the corridor to the washroom. Furthermore, his work was perhaps added for the Future Impressions exhibition. Likewise, he believed that since something had happened to Gabriel, Pierre might have gone missing. He had even gone to the hostel when Seraphine moved out of Aubert's Du Coke door. Regardless, I should inform Madame Magician. What if there are any clues left behind? Otherwise, they wouldn't have dealt with an ordinary person like Gabriel. Lumian had no intention of pursuing Claude Pierre August himself. This was because it would take a lot of time to gather information about the other party through various channels. And with the target's name and identity, an astromancy master like Madame Magician should be able to quickly lock onto the painter's residence. In addition, Gabriel had been attacked late at night after learning about Claude, the painter. Lumian's current information was only a fraction of his own. Lumian gazed at the oil painting, his lips curling into a smile. Will I be attacked? I'm looking forward to it. Around 9 p.m., at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches, apartment 601, Franca, recalling the Demonist sex mission, suspected the Iron and Blood Cross Order would soon make a significant move, 
and her plan was to visit Gardner Martin while digesting the pleasure potion along the way. Rather than her usual method of knocking on the door and entering, Franca decided to take a more covert approach. She intended to hide around eleven Rue de Fontaines, in the garden, or on the lawn, observing discreetly before finding Gardner Martin. Recognizing Gardner's sequence and abilities, she returned to her bedroom and retrieved a palm-sized primordial Demona statue, which she concealed in a pocket. This would enhance her ability to remain hidden and reduce the chances of Beyonder powers detecting her. I'm heading to Gardner's. Franca waved at Jenna, opened the door, and left apartment 601. Jenna acknowledged and breathed a sigh of relief. She was about to leave and was a little nervous. Franca arrived at Rue de Fontaine's via a rental carriage but chose not to have the driver stop at Building 11 as usual. Instead, she disembarked from a distance and swiftly disappeared into the shadows, stealthily making her way to Gardner Martin's residence. Her familiarity with the surroundings allowed her to find a gap in the guard's patrol, and she nimbly scaled a side wall to silently descend into the garden. Franca didn't attempt to infiltrate the building directly. Instead, she followed the shadows, circling to the edge of the front lawn. Next to a gas street lamp, she observed the grayish-white three-story villa, still illuminated. As time passed, Franca remained vigilant, focused on observing the figures appearing at the windows and their activities. Suddenly, the main door of the villa swung open, and Butler Faustino emerged, accompanied by a figure cloaked in black. The black-cloaked individual was of average height, standing at around 1.75 meters. Their entire form was concealed, making it impossible to discern their appearance or physical attributes. Who could it be? Gardner Martin's partner, or a key member of the Iron and Blood Cross Order in charge of other regions? Franca wondered. As the black-cloaked figure exited the iron fence while Butler Faustino retreated into the villa, Franca hesitated for only a moment before making a decision. She realized that unless she ventured inside Gardner Martin's residence thoroughly, she wouldn't obtain valuable information. Her earlier exploration had been open and yielded little. The cloaked individual might provide her with fresh leads leading to unexpected gains. Franca, who was invisible, touched the primordial Demona statue in her hidden pocket and grew confident. She circled around the lawn's edge and scaled the iron fence, stealthily trailing the mysterious figure in the black cloak. At 10 p.m., Jenna embarked on her journey into Underground Trier, an entrance not far from Theodore Delancey and Cage Up Pigeons. Lacking a carbide lamp, she relied on her assassin's night vision to navigate in the pitch-black environment. Jenna was determined to commit the path to memory and proceeded deeper into the underground tunnels, trusting her instincts. As she advanced, the silence around her grew ever more profound. Jenna exhaled slowly, alleviating the tension and fear in her heart. Jenna deliberately moved away from the tunnel's center, pressed herself against a rock wall, and continued cautiously. After an indeterminate amount of time, the sound of running water reached her ears. She proceeded for another seven to eight meters around a rocky outcrop, where a small river flowed slowly in the dark underground. Jenna steadied herself, spotting a mottled stone pillar to hide behind, her form merging with the dense shadows. She refrained from using invisibility, recognizing her limitations as a witch, the duration she could maintain her powers was limited, and she had no way of knowing how long it would take for the target to arrive. In the silent underground, time seemed to stretch, and Jenna's mental stress steadily built up. At last, the reverberation of footsteps reached her ears. Chapter 457 Unexpected Target After briefing Madame Magician on the situation, Lumian left and went to the second floor of Sal de Ball Breeze. His next objective was to ascertain whether the enigmatic entity that had targeted him from afar, attempting to approach rapidly while he observed Seraphine's oil painting with the mystery prying glasses, would pay him a visit during the night, much like how it had dealt with Gabriel. He lay on the bed, closed his eyes, and gradually drifted off to sleep. Lumian had full confidence in Madame Magician. As a major arcana card holder in the Tarot Club, she appeared to possess the ability to launch long-range attacks and was skilled at dealing with untouchable and enigmatic creatures. 
As his thoughts blurred and he succumbed to slumber, Lumian found himself in a hazy dream, returning to Aubert's du coke door. Dim light filtered through the glass windows on each floor of the slightly tilted building. Gabriel, attired in a white shirt, dark jacket, black pants, and strapless leather shoes, sat on the entrance steps. The playwright's visage was somewhat translucent, and an air of detachment lingered in his eyes. Upon spotting Lumian, Gabriel stood up abruptly, a conspicuous smile crossing his face. Lumian halted warily and looked at him. What are you doing here? Gabriel's smile waned as he spoke urgently, leave Trier immediately. This place is about to become extremely dangerous. Lumian frowned and inquired, what have you discovered? Gabriel cast a wary gaze around before responding, I'm not entirely sure what they're planning, but I do know it will bring destruction to all of Trier. They. Lumian pressed for more information. Are you staying at the hostel? Where is it? A hint of confusion appeared on Gabriel's face. You need to be like me to enter or gain the approval of the Pixies. I didn't know how to find it. I found myself at the door as soon as I arrived. As expected, the hostel is closely related to the Pixies. Did Gabriel rely on the corruption to alter his existence and reach the hostel like teleportation? Lumian's thoughts raced as he asked in a deep voice, Why did you choose to go to the hostel? Were you coerced into it? No, Gabriel shook his head, his voice softening. I did it of my own accord. Seraphine came to fetch me personally, and I couldn't refuse. It's what I wanted. A touch of happiness crossed his face. It was Seraphine who corrupted Gabriel and led him to the hostel. Lumian suddenly felt a pang of sorrow. Have you realized that you've become a monster? Gabriel fell silent for a few seconds before responding, I know, but I won't harm anyone. He paused a beat before continuing, my script has already achieved success. I have the reputation and income one desired most. I have no regrets in that regard. All I want now is to be with Seraphine, whether she's human or a monster. Lumian didn't scold or berate him. Instead, he looked at Gabriel and let out a long sigh. I understand your feelings and thoughts. Gabriel's face showed gratitude, and he spoke sincerely, after becoming a monster, I seem to have the ability to see a certain future. That's why I knew you would come to me. I asked Seraphine to let me stay in the room for two more days to bid you farewell. She agreed. She's not a pure monster. Lumian's heart stirred, and he spoke in a bewitching tone, Do you want me to rescue you and Seraphine from the hostel? Is it possible? Gabriel's face contorted, and his eyes revealed a mixture of yearning, as if his body and mind existed in different worlds. Lumian took a step closer and spoke earnestly, There is hope, but I need you to tell me all the details. Gabriel's expression shifted between blankness, coldness, excitement, longing, and rejection, each emotion expressed vividly. In that moment, he extended his hand, his eyes filled with intense fear. Silently, Gabriel's form shattered, and the image of Aubert's du coke door disintegrated, along with the faint mist. Lumian's eyes snapped open, and he found himself gazing at the ceiling of the second-floor bedroom in Sal de Ball Breeze. It had all been a dream, but it had felt incredibly real. Cartier de la Cathedral Commemorative Franca, carrying the primordial demoness statue, followed the black-cloaked man while remaining invisible. The man appeared to have extensive experience and skill in evading pursuit. He frequently changed direction and even doubled back on his path. If Franca hadn't relied on her invisibility and the assistance of the primordial Demona statue, she would have lost him several times. Finally, the black cloaked man came to a stop in front of an entrance to underground trier. He half turned and examined his palms under the crimson moonlight, leaving Franca perplexed. What's going on? Is he performing palm reading on himself? Remaining hidden behind a gas street lamp pole, the invisible Franca observed his actions with curiosity. After a moment, the man descended the steel staircase and disappeared into the dim entrance. Franca followed closely behind, venturing deeper into underground trier. Twenty minutes later, the black-cloaked man reached a sealed tunnel. It was unclear what he touched, 
but a stone door immediately swung open on the rock wall next to him. Franca, standing a few meters away, looked over and saw three lamps embedded in the stone wall. Three classic oil lamps, one high and two below, each with a flame burning inside. Franca had been in Trier for a long time and had a good understanding of the situation here. This scene triggered a connection in Franca's mind. Carbonari. She recognized this as one of the symbols of the Carbonari, an organization seeking to overthrow the government. Lighting three lamps was symbolic in their ranks, the one above represented the sun, while the other two below symbolized the moon and the stars. The Iron and Blood Cross Order collaborates with the Carbonari? Franca was both surprised and unsurprised. From her perspective, the Iron and Blood Cross Order aimed to seize power in Intis itself by toppling the government, but their current focus seemed to be on the underground and the entrance to Fourth Epic Trier. The black-cloaked man swiftly passed through the self-opening stone door, and Franca noticed a thin, ever-changing white fog emanating from inside. This fog looks familiar. There must be something wrong. Franca hesitated to follow when she felt a slight tremor in her hidden pocket. Franca reached out and touched it, her expression changing slightly. The classic silver mirror had trembled slightly, the one connected to the underground mirror world. Franca remained in her concealed position, watching the stone door slowly close without taking another step forward. Beside the flowing underground river, the figure moved swiftly along the water. He didn't use lanterns, carbide lamps, or other sources of light, yet he moved through the darkness with ease, navigating around potholes, rocks, and obstacles effortlessly. Jenna, hidden behind a mottled stone pillar, noticed a flickering red light in the target's eye. Taking a deep breath, she retrieved the ancient arrow of the bloodthirsty from her black coat and prepared herself for the confrontation. Her combat experience wasn't limited, but it wasn't much either. In particular, she had never faced a Beyonder alone. All she could do was use everything in her arsenal to augment herself from the onset. She had to go all out to minimize any accidents. Jenna plunged the obsidian arrow into her chest, letting it draw her blood and come to live. Before the figure could approach, she sprinkled fluorescent powder over herself and chanted a Hermes incantation at an almost inaudible volume, body concealment. With that, Jenna vanished completely, blending into the darkness, her movements masked by the sound of the underground river. Moments later, the figure with the red eye arrived in the area. Jenna watched from the shadows. Suddenly, the darkness came alive beneath the figure's feet, forming inky black chains that wrapped around the legs, waist, and torso. The figure stopped abruptly, a red light shooting from its eye. From behind, Jenna's form materialized. Only then did Jenna get a clear look at her target. He was a man, holding a grayish-white cloth bag and wearing a dark gray robe similar to that of a monk. His face was a menacing sight, constructed with iron plates, gears, springs, screws, cranks, and other mechanical contraptions. There was a vivid red gem embedded in his right eye. A monk from the Deep Valley Cloister? Jenna's heart raced. She hadn't anticipated while targeting a monk from the God of Steam and Machinery Church. She and Franca had crossed paths with similar monks in the Deep Valley Quarry before. These monks had augmented their bodies with mechanical modifications, giving them an eerie appearance. Confronted with a target whose skull had transformed into metal, Jenna abandoned her initial plan of striking behind the ears. Instead, she concentrated a dark flame in her right palm and pressed it against the mechanical monk's head amidst the howling wind. Simultaneously, a red beam shot forth, slicing through a few shackles resembling the abyss. However, it only addressed the front. The other directions were already ensnaring the mechanically enhanced monk. With a resounding impact, Jenna thrust the black flame into the target's head. The silent yet menacing black flames expanded instantly, consuming the monk's spirit body and setting his spirituality ablaze. Leveraging the high-speed agility granted by the arrow of the bloodthirsty, Jenna continuously shifted her position around the monk to evade counterattacks. Simultaneously, she sought opportunities to weaken him to the fullest extent with the demoness black flames, bolstered by dark, binding spells. In less than two minutes, the monk, unable to break free, 
collapsed to the ground, rendered unconscious and weakened. Jenna exhaled and lowered herself to the ground. She picked up the grayish-white cloth bag, untied the rope, and inspected its contents. Inside, she found an array of canned paints and oil paintbrushes. Chapter 458, Same Direction She quickly recalled the purifier's advice and the recent clues they had gathered, keep a close watch on painters and individuals with painting as a private hobby, as it was likely that some of their works possessed supernatural abilities. Could this monk be a passionate painter? Or was he simply delivering paint and brushes to an artist? It seems like a routine task but the fact that he had chosen the depths of underground trier for this errand raises suspicion. It didn't appear to be a matter of time constraints. Either there's a problem with his destination, or the painter he's looking for is problematic. Perhaps everything is problematic. A barrage of thoughts raced through Jenna's mind, leading her to suspect a connection between the mechanically enhanced monk and the hostel they were investigating. It was possible that an artist with supernatural powers was working on murals underground, requiring a substantial supply of paint and tools. Jenna decided to search the monk's robe for any clues, finding only a few coins and banknotes. She placed these items in the same grayish-white cloth bag and secured it with a knot. As she examined the intricate mechanical components that comprised half of the monk's body, she contemplated using the demonist black flames to incapacitate him once more. Her plan was to transport him back to the surface for an interrogation with the help of Seal, Franca, and Anthony. Being a witch, Jenna had mastered ritualistic magic related to spirit channeling, but she lacked practical experience and was concerned about making a mistake that might disrupt their lead. She also needed a safe prayer target, so she intended to leave this task to the experienced Lumian and Franca. As Jenna was about to put her plan into action, Multiple gears on the unconscious monk's face suddenly began to turn on their own, producing an unsettling clicking and clacking noise. The mechanical parts came to life, spinning wildly and devouring the flesh and blood on the other side of the monk's body, turning it into a gruesome mess. The scene resembled a horrific accident in a factory where an operator had fallen into a massive machine. Jenna's instincts immediately warned her of impending danger but before she could react, the mechanical parts, along with her own flesh and blood, lunged towards her. Amidst the coexisting sounds of cracking and creaking, she transformed into a mirror, shattering inch by inch. Jenna managed to reappear approximately ten meters away from the underground river. Without looking back, she swiftly grabbed the grayish-white cloth bag and the arrow of the bloodthirsty embedded in her chest. She darted around the rock wall, making a hasty escape to the surface. Behind her, the sounds of metal grinding and colliding persisted, but they couldn't catch up to her. Gradually, the commotion began to subside. Finally, Jenna heard the crisp sound of metal parts falling to the ground, and she couldn't help but let out a relieved sigh as she slowed her pace. Jenna ran until she reached a named location in Underground Trier where she finally slowed down and carefully removed the arrow of the bloodthirsty from her chest. She could feel her strength waning due to the loss of blood, but she was grateful for her earlier caution in not removing the obsidian arrow from her chest when the monk had fainted. She had chosen to complete the search with it embedded in her. If not for that, she might have been caught by the menacing mechanical body before having the opportunity to use the mystical item once more. As Jenna assessed her surroundings and sought out the underground avenue du Marquet, she reflected on her harrowing experience. It felt as though the chilling tales Franca and Seal had shared, along with their horrifying abilities, had become a reality. The parts of the monk's body that had undergone mechanical enhancements had assumed an eerie lifelike state. And the revived machinery was devouring human flesh and blood. This is the true nature of the mystical world, where beyond her powers are accompanied by unimaginable perils. Jenna turned onto the underground avenue du Marquet and made her way towards the stairs that would lead her back to the surface. Simultaneously, she couldn't shake the suspicion that the enigmatic monk in the sinister secret cave she and Franca had stumbled upon in the deep valley quarry were somehow linked to the impending catastrophe. After the stone door closed, and the dark tunnel fell silent, Franca emerged from her hiding place and remained invisible as she returned to the surface. She replayed the scene she had just witnessed, 
trying to pinpoint the source of the familiar feeling emanating from the ever-shifting thin white fog. Just as she was on the verge of resorting to magic mirror divination or dream divination to find answers, a memory resurfaced. She recalled the moment she and Jenna had eliminated the Deep Valley Cloister's warlock-dressed man underground. A similar fog had appeared in the mirror during their spirit channeling. The other party's exploded corpse transformed into a blood mist, revealing the corresponding characteristics, but the colors were different. 007 had informed us that by the time the purifiers arrived in Deep Valley Town, their target had already shifted. The items on the altar were gone, leaving behind only cryptic words on certain papers. Those words were Albert Goncourt, Underground, Riot, and Time. Albert Goncourt is one of the leaders of the Carbonari. And this aligns with the three oil lamps I had seen moments ago. Could it be that the Iron and Blood Cross Order is collaborating with the Carbonari to incite a riot, possibly involving monks from the Deep Valley Cloister? Hiss, could it be that the item Gardener Martin used to smuggle Rat Cristo into Trier was requested by the Carbonari? Is it located not far behind that stone door? Is that why my ancient silver mirror reacted? Franca gradually connected the dots. She realized the urgency of reporting this matter. Though it wasn't directly related to their primary mission of finding the hostel, it seemed far from a trivial issue. If it escalated, it could lead to another catastrophe, and Franca felt compelled to do her best to prevent it. In the next moment, Franca pondered her options. Should I report to the Tarot Club, the Demonist Sect, or inform the authorities through 007? She quickly made up her mind. Only children choose to do multiple choice questions. Adults select them all. The only thing to be concerned about was that the reports weren't sent to the wrong parties. Lumian awoke from his dream, his mind filled with questions as he slowly sat up and surveyed his surroundings. There were no signs of Madame Magician pursuing Gabriel at the hostel. Madame Magician didn't realize that Gabriel had used a dream to warn me to escape Trier immediately? That's impossible. This lady possessed the ability to enter and exit my dreams at Will and Cordu, and she is known to be the bane of these special monsters. Even Bouvard's lifeless body, which should have been untouchable, hadn't been spared when she dragged it away. Lumian paced back and forth in the room, pondering the puzzling situation. He couldn't believe that Madame Magician wasn't paying attention. She had the means to observe from a distance, so there was no urgency in rushing to sal the ball breeze. The insight he gained from Conspirer's influence left Lumian with a nagging sense that the dream was not what it seemed. To deceive Madame Magician while communicating with him indicated that there was something extraordinary about Gabriel or the hostel itself. As Lumian was only a sequence six and lacked extensive knowledge of mysticism, he refrained from speculating and instead sat at his desk, taking up a pen and paper to write a letter. Knowing the doll messenger's preferences, he decided to send the letter only after returning to Aubert's du Coq door, patiently awaiting a response. Before long, Madame Magician's reply arrived. I didn't notice Gabriel influencing your dream. Initial considerations are, you have a close connection to the hostel. There's a close connection between me and the hostel? Lumian's forehead twitched as he read the message, feeling as if a bucket of ice-cold water had been poured over his head. How is that possible? When did I establish such a bond with the hostel? Could it be that Gabriel used this connection to conceal himself from Madame Magician's scrutiny and directly influence my dream? Lumian found Madame Magician's hypothesis absurd, but he couldn't help but analyze the possibilities. As Lumian pondered the situation, a sudden realization struck him like a bolt of lightning. My Pooh Meyer. Susanna Mattis Lover, the ostracized key member of the Bliss Society, the former manager of Theatre Delancey and Kaja Pigeons, who had claimed to be returning to the market district to do something. Could it be that Maipu Meyer had secretly done something in the market district that led to my unexplained close connection with the hostel? He wants to prove himself. I'm definitely one of the targets. Was it his plan for me to establish a close connection with the hostel and detonate it at a critical moment? How did he do it? I had a close connection to the hostel without realizing it. Lumian subconsciously glanced at his left chest and suspected that Termoboros, the traitor, 
might have played a role in this matter. Otherwise, he wouldn't have failed to notice anything amiss. Amidst his surprise, Lumian didn't panic. Instead, he felt a sense of joy. I wonder if I can use my close connection to the hostel to find that place. When the time comes, I might have the opportunity to meet the Sansons and have the support of numerous major Arcana card holders. Just as Lumian was about to write and inquire about Madame Magician, he heard soft footsteps approaching his room. Knock, knock, knock. There was a gentle knock on the door of room 207. Lumian opened the door and was surprised to find Franca and Jenna standing there. One of them wore a garish blouse, and the other was dressed as a female mercenary. Their expressions were serious. Franca felt the need to communicate with Lumian before writing a report. We've discovered something significant. You found something important too? Lumian was taken aback, pointing at the ceiling. Call Anthony over as well. Nearly fifteen minutes later, Franca and Jenna shared their experiences in room 207 of Aubert's Du Cope door, carefully omitting details about the Demonist sect and will. As Lumian listened, his brow furrowed. Some of the Deep Valley Cloister monks are suspected to be linked to the hostile and the impending catastrophe? That was an important cloister of the God of Steam and Machinery Church. Lumian couldn't help but rub his temples, recollecting that something unusual had also occurred at the Eternal Blazing Sun Church's Sacred Heart Cloister. Are the two churches no longer as reliable? Could Trier still be saved? Could there be a future? Chapter 459 Price of Bestowment A few seconds later, Lumian flashed a self-deprecating smile. At the very least, those monks at the Deep Valley Cloister are still discreet when they're up to no good. It means they still have reservations, which suggests that the entirety of the God of Steam and Machinery Church isn't problematic. A significant number of clergymen, or maybe even the majority, are normal. I think so too, Anthony Reed agreed, raising his hand and drawing a triangle on his chest. Lumian continued, at this point, this is no longer something a small team like ours can handle. It's best to leave the Deep Valley Cloister's problem to the purifiers and the machinery hive mind. What he didn't say was that the Tarot Club would keep a close watch. After all, no one knew how many hidden dangers were waiting to emerge within the two churches. What if someone triggered them prematurely, delaying the investigation of the Deep Valley Cloister? All right, Franca concurred, it was her original plan to begin with. With the plan confirmed, Franca and Jenna left Aubert's Du Coke door and returned to Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Lumian drew back the curtains, gazing at the crimson moon in the sky. Casually, he said to Anthony Reed, who was about to leave, your best option now is to head to Suet's steam locomotive station as soon as you wake up tomorrow and purchase a ticket to leave Trier. The sooner the departing train, the better. Anthony, dressed in military green camouflage, halted in his tracks, slowly turning around, his gaze locked on Lumian's retreating figure. Oh? Lumian poured himself a glass of light beer, which served as potable water, and took a sip. He continued to peer out the window and said, You've been with us recently, and you've learned a lot. You should be able to discern the looming issue in Trier. The impending catastrophe will be dire. If you don't depart quickly, you might never get the chance. As for seeking revenge, for finding Philip, who faked his death, we can wait until the catastrophe is over. There's no rule stating you can't return after leaving Trier. Anthony Reed fell into silence for a few seconds before slowly joining Lumian at his side. He too gazed at the night sky and asked, Why aren't you leaving? Lumian replied with a smirk, Aren't you a spectator? Can't you see we're on a mission? How can we just leave Trier like that? Anthony turned his head to fix his stare on Lumian's face and eyes, remaining silent for a long while. Lumian held the light beer in his hand, his gaze still fixed outside the window. His eyes were vacant, and his focus seemed clouded. After a while, he scoffed. Besides, I have the ability to survive such a disaster. I can protect Franca and Jenna, but only the two of them. Do you think you can compare to beautiful women who have a deeper relationship with me? 
his protection referred to teleporting Franca and Jenna to the Fool's Cathedral at the Lavini docks. Anthony didn't respond and looked at the dark sky outside once more. Slowly, he retrieved a box of cigarettes from his shirt, took one out, placed it between his lips, and lit it with a match. Taking a few deep breaths and exhaling white smoke, the psychiatrist muttered to himself, I was born and raised on the West mid seashore coast. It's an area with many industrial cities, where the god of steam and machinery has more believers than the eternal blazing sun. The wind in mid seashore is fierce. Summers aren't very hot, but they're humid. Winters bring snow, and everything is covered in white. The surroundings are either thick forests or pockmarked with coal and iron or mines. When I was fortunate enough to become a Beyonder, my greatest dream was to retire safely from the army with some savings. I'd buy land near my hometown, close to the forest. I'd hire a few people to help me with farming. In my free time, I'd secretly hunt in the forest, breathe the sea air, or go fishing. Heh <laughs> heh, you might not know this, but the fish in mid seashore are inedible due to heavy industrial pollution. Locals only eat it if they have no other choice. Anthony Reed's voice deepened. If I were to return to the West mid seashore coast and my hometown now, I might never be able to enjoy such a life. It's not about money, I need a sense of relaxation. I still have nightmares about our camp being ambushed, with corpses everywhere. Every time, I can feel my heart racing. I can imagine that if I leave tomorrow and see the news and photos of the Trier catastrophe in the newspapers, I'll have similar nightmares. I'll dream of Trier being incinerated by flames, with corpses strewn everywhere. That time, I fled out of fear. This time, I don't want to do that again. Anthony Reed took another drag on his cigarette. Without waiting for Lomian's mockery, he added, I'm well aware of my limitations, and all of this doesn't directly concern me. However, I've been in Trier for several years. I know many informants, neighbors, and children who will trade information for sweets or cop it. I don't want to hear about their deaths in a few days and see their pain faces when I close my eyes. I'll do my best to cooperate with you and do what I can. Only when there's no other choice will I consider retreating. You don't need to understand. This might be the paranoid decision of a patient with severe psychological problems. Lumian chuckled and commented, You make it sound as if nobody else has psychological problems. Before completing my treatment, my psychological problems were far worse than yours. A smile appeared on Anthony Reed's face. So, you chose to stay too, didn't you? He turned around and left room 207, puffing on his short cigarette. Lumian relished the night view of Trier, the enduring cacophony of Rue Anarchy serving as a backdrop to his contemplation. He emptied his glass of light beer. Then, he took his seat, drew the curtains, and commenced writing to Madame Magician. New leads. There are now three investigation directions, firstly, the Deep Valley Cloister and the Sacred Heart Cloister. Secondly, I can use the strong connection between myself and the hostel to infiltrate the underground route that Jenna followed when she encountered the monk by the river. By following my instincts, I can attempt to reach the hostel directly. Thirdly, an assault on Gardner Martin. Since the Iron and Blood Cross Order collaborates with the Carbonari, which is linked to the Deep Valley Cloister incident, they might be involved and have valuable information. After dispatching the letter, Lumian paced his room, grappling with a mixture of worry, frustration, and anticipation. Before long, Magician replied, We'll take responsibility for the first direction. I refrain from mentioning the second direction because it poses a significant risk to you. Furthermore, Gabriel's warning has likely been detected, so the hostel will be on high alert against such intrusions. We can cautiously explore the third direction, but you must be well prepared before confronting Gardner Martin. Silently, crimson flames erupted, setting the paper in Lumian's hand ablaze. He planned to get some rest to recover from mental fatigue. At dawn, he would convene with Franca, Jenna, and Anthony to discuss their plan of action. Apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Franca hadn't changed into her cotton pajamas, she was still dressed in her daytime attire. Observing her pacing the room, Jenna asked, her brow furrowed in confusion, what's bothering you? 
Frank aside and replied, I intend to seek out Gardner now. Although Seal didn't mention it just now, I can sense that he will propose dealing with Gardner in the next two days. This is a clear breakthrough. Sigh, I must seize the opportunity to digest more pleasure. Jenna regarded Franca's profile, pursing her lips before changing the topic. Don't you have many lovers? Even without Gardner Martin, there are others. Franca couldn't help but clear her throat and smile wryly. Long gone, long gone. Gardner and his lovers are my current interests. Jenna chuckled and playfully teased, Without Gardner Martin, you can turn to seal. No, no. Franca waved her hand vigorously. I can't get past myself. With those words, she headed toward the door. I'm going to Rue de Fontaine's. Jenna's smile faded as she offered a solemn reminder, don't display any unusual behavior later. I understand, Franca replied, her expression turning serious. I won't let Gardner feel like I'm giving him hospice. With that, she opened the door and exited. Jenna let out a soft sigh as she watched Franca vanish behind the closed door. Then, her gaze turned to the grayish-white cloth bag on the coffee table, and she muttered to herself, I wonder when I'll encounter Will to deliver this bag. In the middle of the night, Jenna awoke suddenly from a vivid dream. In her dream, she found herself in an underground quarry cave, with Will standing before her. Although it was only a dream, Jenna had an uncanny sense of familiarity with the location and knew how to reach it in reality. Understanding the significance of her dream, Jenna nodded slowly and changed into her female mercenary attire. Carrying the grayish-white cloth bag, she left apartment 601 and ventured underground through the entrance on Rue de Blouse's blanches. Following the revelations of her dream and guided by her spirituality, she descended, turned, and squeezed through gaps at times. Finally, she arrived at the quarry cave she had seen in her dream. In the center of the mine, Will, dressed as he had been during the day, held an orange jack-o'-lantern. He didn't appear particularly pleased, resembling a student caught playing hooky by parents and teachers. Is this what you want? Jenna handed him the grayish-white cloth bag filled with various paints and brushes. Will accepted it but didn't open the bag. Instead, he retrieved an item known as the lucky gold coin inside. This is your reward. This is both your luck and misfortune. It signifies that you will encounter many things and bear significant responsibility. You may not fully grasp it now, but one day, you will. Ever since the heretics brought catastrophe to the market district, there's been no turning back for me. Only by forging ahead in this perilous world of mysticism can I protect those I care about. Jenna silently mused, taking the low and gold pound. She inspected it and inquired, how should I use it? Simply keep it with you, Will advised, waving his hand before vanishing into the depths of the quarry cave, clutching his jack-o'-lantern. Jenna stowed the lucky gold coin and made her way back to the surface. To her astonishment, she found that she couldn't recall the route she had taken. While she had arrived guided by her spirituality, she was now fully awake and devoid of the same guidance. Jenna had no choice but to navigate her way independently, following a general principle of ascending. After walking for some time, the ground suddenly shook violently, as if an explosion had occurred in the distance. An earthquake or some other anomaly. Jenna furrowed her brow and quickened her pace to find a path leading upward. As she turned a corner around a rock wall, her feet abruptly gave way. The ground had already caved in, and now, it had completely collapsed. Amidst the deafening sounds of collapse, Jenna couldn't react in time and tumbled deeper as the ground disintegrated. She swiftly adjusted her body and activated her assassin abilities, allowing her to descend gracefully like a feather. Chapter 460 Chain Reaction Clad in a white priest's robe and a clergyman's bonnet, Hor McHyden gazed at the open mine entrance, his benevolent and gentle face veiled in shadows. After the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery lost all its diocese in the Lowen Kingdom, the former Archbishop of Backlond, a member of the Divine Council, returned to the headquarters in Intis. Over the past few years, he had traveled to various places like a firefighter, handling various serious beyonder incidents. 
he understood better than most clergymen of the God of Steam and Machinery Church that, despite the outward appearance of peace, the world was riddled with festering wounds. Problems abounded, and hidden dangers lurked in the darkness. The Orthodox churches and government organizations could only strive to maintain stability. Horamit collected his thoughts and sighed silently. He turned to the machinery hive mind deacon beside him and declared, Let's take action. God will protect us. By steam. As he spoke, he drew a triangular sacred emblem on his chest. The burly machinery hive mind deacon issued the command for purification, and the members of the hive mind sprang into action. Some raised iron black barrel shaped objects, while others shouldered weapons resembling steam firearms, devoid of backpacks or golden ammunition belts. Still, others produced leather scrolls, charms crafted from various metals, and some pointed rings, canes, and other objects forward. Rumble. The miniature sun-like golden fireball was the first to blast out of a cannon barrel, landing at the heart of the quarry cave. Behind it followed a cascade of colorful cannonballs and bullets of varying shapes. The light and dispersed waves purged the entire deep valley quarry repeatedly, maintaining the cave's structural integrity, resulting in only a slight collapse. After a few rounds of purification, the concealed cave within the quarry was breached, unveiling its interior. Hormick's eyes gleamed with an inhuman, dark red light. He could clearly discern that the white mist within the secret cave had nearly dissipated entirely. Human arms and legs were embedded in the rock walls on either side. The archbishop advanced, leading two squads of machinery hive mind members through the quarry and into the concealed cave. Before entering, he cast a glance back at the nearby Deep Valley Cloister, closely monitored by Trier's archbishop with sealed artifacts. Hormick studied the human arms and legs attached to gears, crankshafts, and other mechanical components, resembling experimental subjects. Under the deacon's orders, the machinery hive mind members initiated another round of purification. They persisted until the arms, legs, and machinery had turned to ashes or fragments, allowing them to proceed further into the secret cave and descend the tunnel. After several iterations, Horamek and the machinery hive mind members, their pale white hair concealed by clergymen bonnets, reached a vast, laboratory-like chamber. Here, human arms intertwined with machinery, following ceiling tracks, perpetually gripping cabinets, sinks, long tables, and iron boxes, moving them toward the blazing fire at the deepest part of the hall. A few human corpses were piled in the chamber, and a humanoid figure made entirely of machinery stood among them. This mechanical being stood at a towering height of over three meters. One of his cybernetic eyes resembled an emerald, while the other resembled a ruby, supported by numerous components. His temples were encased in a transparent special material, revealing the squirming grayish-white brain within. The mechanical giant cast a glance at Horamek and the others, who were scattered at the entrance of the chamber, and emitted a metallic chuckle. Surprised, are you? I don't require steam to power myself or a human body to control me. I can perform any task just like a normal person, including combat. Unfortunately, my sequence isn't high enough to replace the human brain. Seeing this, you have no reason to doubt, right? We are the chosen children of God. We follow the true teachings of God, while your spirits and flesh have been tainted by the pleasures and indulgence of the moral world, causing you to abandon the throne of God. Horamek surveyed the surroundings and noticed that the machinery hive mind members present remained extraordinarily vigilant and resolute. He nodded in approval. Turning his attention to the mechanical giant, his benevolent expression remained undisturbed. You used a spirituality gem, didn't you? Using humans to refine spirituality gems is even more ruthless and wasteful than employing steam to drive them. Claude, I thought you were momentarily lost and would gradually return to your senses within the Deep Valley Cloister. I didn't anticipate that you would become a heretic. Heretic? The mechanical giant laughed. You are the heretics. When was the last time any of you received a revelation? All the time, Hormick responded with composure. Claude, tell me, where is the hostel? Are you in league with those evil gods to set your sights on fourth epic trier? In his mechanical giant form, 
Claude's eyes emitted red and green lights as he spoke with solemnity, you have strayed from the teachings of God. You no longer possess the spirit of sacrifice. The future of this world and the chance for a deity to ascend to the pinnacle lies within fourth epic trier. The sooner we unlock it, the greater our hope. Without waiting for Horamik's reply, the mechanical giant declared coldly, I will show you who the heretics are and who the true followers of God are. As soon as Claude finished speaking, the light in his cybernetic eyes flared, and the entire chamber trembled. The sounds of machinery in operation resonated with an enigmatic aura. In an instant, the machinery hive mind members, who had been on the verge of unleashing their firepower, witnessed projected paintings depicting the evolution of humans emerging from obscurity, advancing step by step, and building civilizations at various stages. These paintings were ethereal, weighty, delicate, and magnificent. Horamek and his companions seemed to transform into the people within the paintings, experiencing the gravity and splendor of civilization. At that moment, a face appeared outside the painting. This figure wore a towering crown, with his nostrils decayed to the point where only two black holes remained. His eyes were filled with countless overlapping star charts, and they stared greedily at Horamek and the others, as well as their civilization. Silently, more faces pressed against the surface of the painting. Some had their heads bisected by a ruler, while others were adorned with yellow paper covered in strange symbols. Some were covered in ears of wheat and rice, while others barely took on human forms, their bodies adorned with various symbols. These faces were larger than Horamek and his companions combined. They stared fixedly at the scene through the painting. The machinery hive mind members who beheld these faces experienced a profound fear from the depths of their hearts, as though their entire civilization would be obliterated. Just as they were on the verge of losing control, the faces vanished mysteriously, just as they had appeared. The scene before Horamek's eyes reverted to its normal state. The mechanical giant Claude and the frenziedly operating chamber re-entered his field of vision. The archbishop remained unruffled, though his voice resonated with anger. Heretics. As his voice reverberated, he flexed his left wrist with his right hand, unveiling a black, cold, and weighty metal tube. The sound of gears clicking filled the chamber, illuminating it as brightly as daylight. The machinery hive mind members launched their attacks in succession. Rumble. The Deep Valley Quarry experienced a distinct tremor, as though a brief, violent earthquake had struck. An underground trier, just outside the stone door through which the carbonari had disappeared, crimson fireballs hovered in the air, casting a warm glow in the dark tunnel. Blazing Danets, dressed in a linen shirt, a brown jacket, dark pants, and black leather boots, had one hand in his pocket as he fixed his gaze on the nearby stone door. His burnt yellow hair and eyebrows framed his face, and he casually held a weed in his mouth, surveying the surroundings with his dark blue yet bright eyes. Nearly twenty men, all dressed as sailors, silently fanned out in the vicinity. Some twirled daggers, others wiped the barrels of their revolvers, and a few stretched their necks in anticipation. A grinning, brown-haired sailor finally broke the silence and questioned blazing Danitz, Captain, why are we aiding the Intus government in pursuing the Carbonari? And why are we doing it for free? Danitz glanced at him, spat out the weed from his mouth, and muttered under his breath, Damn fools, do you want to see Trier in ruins? Are you lads not still in Tision? As he spoke, he swung his fist at the stone door. Doesn't this group of assholes not know that their captain owns numerous properties in Trier? Upon the surface of Danit's clenched fist, blazing white flames gathered as he thrust forward. Eventually, they coalesced into a fireball emitting a destructive aura. Boom! The ground shook, and the stone door shattered. Jenna descended gracefully in the seemingly endless darkness, occasionally brushing against gravel but escaping physical harm. After what felt like an eternity of descent, her feet finally touched solid ground. Her beautiful blue eyes reflected a building. It was a slightly crooked beige house. The lower three floors bore the architectural marks of Roselle's era, featuring pillar walls, arches, and large windows. The top two floors, in stark contrast, seemed crudely appended as an afterthought. This is. Jenna was visibly taken aback. 
the building before her was one she recognized all too well. It was Aubert's Ducope door. At that moment, light streamed from numerous rooms within Aubert's Ducope door. Jenna spotted a man and a woman, standing on the third floor balcony, wrapped in each other's embrace. The man sported black framed glasses, his neatly combed brown hair adding to his refined appearance. As for the woman, she wore a lake blue dress, her plump face and ethereal brown eyes creating a curious juxtaposition. Thud, thud. Jenna's heart raced. She had never actually met the woman, but she was familiar with the man. It was the missing playwright, Gabriel. Chapter 461, Strange World He was taken aback for a moment before swiftly retreating from the window with Seraphine cradled in his arms. Only then did Jenna, who appeared to be lost in a daydream, snap back to reality. Instinctively, she took two steps back and melted into the shadows cast by the building. As her thoughts raced, chaos reigned in her mind. Is that Gabriel? I'm seeing him again. Didn't he morph into a monster and head to the hostel? Is this the hostel? Aubert's du Coke door is the hostel? No, the real Aubert's du Coke door definitely isn't a hostel. Otherwise, SEAL and the secret organization with tarot cards as their code names would have discovered it long ago. Is this a mirror image of Aubert's du Coke door, or is it the sketch of someone somewhere? Jenna quickly deduced, relying on the information at hand. Yet, upon further reflection, she sensed that something was off. Aubert's du Coke door used a naming system like Room 207 and 305. According to Bouvard's prophecy, Voice and Sanson was in Room 7, and Puales de Roquefort was in Room 12. They didn't match up. There must be something awry. Jenna averted her gaze from the counterfeit Aubert's du Coke door and surveyed her surroundings. She noticed that this place was identical to Rue Anarchy. The buildings lined up perfectly, some tall, some short, some askew, and some precariously balanced, but all standing firm. On the street, vendors peddled meatloaf, whiskey sours, and other wares. Pedestrians streamed in and out, creating a bustling scene. If she hadn't spotted Gabriel and had been plummeting this entire time, Jenna would have believed she'd returned to the surface and rue anarchy. As Jenna carefully observed the pedestrians and vendors, it became clear that something was off. Their vacant expressions and infrequent changes gave them an eerie, mechanical quality. Many familiar faces seemed to vanish at the end of the street, only to reappear, circling around from somewhere and returning to the entrance of Rue Anarchy in a repetitive cycle. It's indeed fake. Like a massive stage production. Most people, like the surrounding buildings, serve as a backdrop, but it's just a backdrop. Jenna analyzed the scene, drawing parallels with theatrical performances she knew well, trying to make sense of what she was witnessing. Her attention then shifted to the counterfeit Aubert's Du Coke door in room 207. With the curtains drawn, it was impossible to determine if a mirror image of Lumian was inside. After a few moments of contemplation, Jenna decided not to risk infiltrating the fake Aubert's Du Coke door. She opted to explore the area carefully, gaining a rough understanding of the overall situation to see if there was a way out. Following the shadows along the street, she cautiously made her way toward Rue de Blouse's Blanches. The layout and situation here mirrored Le Marquet du Cartier du Gentleman. Jenna barely needed to distinguish the path before returning to Rue de Blouse's Blanches. With every step, her sense of unease grew. She even began to question if her usual neighborhood was real. Jenna couldn't help but look up at the sky from the shadows. Blue sky, white clouds, the westering sun, and billowing smoke. It all felt real, yet helped Jenna confirm that this wasn't the genuine market district. She had descended into the underground in the middle of the night to search for Will. Could she have been missing for twelve hours? From across three Rue de Blouse's blanches, Jenna surveyed apartment 601. Beside the glass window in the living room, she saw Franca, dressed in a blouse and holding a bottle of dark red wine in her hand. Her flaxen hair was tied in a ponytail. Behind Franca, Jenna, dressed in a light blue dress, busied herself with tidying up, occasionally disappearing from the window's view. 
Jenna wasn't shocked, but her heart sank. She and Franca were undeniably present. Is this really the reflection of the market district? Jenna closely observed Franca and confirmed that Franca still used her right hand, ruling out the possibility of her being a mirror person. Likewise, in apartment 601, both Franca and Jenna's vacant expressions persisted as they continued their lives following predetermined paths without any deviations. While remaining hidden in the shadows, Jenna pondered the location of the exit. Lacking much experience, she sought inspiration from Lumian's accounts and the place she had witnessed. Should I head to the border and investigate the edge of this fake world? Since this place faithfully replicates the market district, well, at least Rue Anarchy and Rue de Blouse's blanches, it resembles a reflection. Could I find the exit by locating distinct places? The church has always told us that we can seek refuge in the cathedral in times of danger or accidents. I wonder what at least St. Robert looks like here. Does it seek God's protection or adhere to the Black Sun? If it's truly the Black Sun, it's an entirely different realm. Jenna decided to stealthily make her way to Avenue du Marquet and observe the state of the eternal blazing sun church's Eglise St. Robert in this strange world. She made sure not to expose herself to passersby, residents on both sides, or newsboys peddling their wares. Through the various shadows, she carefully and quietly turned onto Avenue du Marquet. After advancing a distance, Jenna's eyes suddenly froze. She noticed something different. There was no sign of Sal de Ball Breeze on Avenue du Marquet. Where the khaki colored building and the skull statue should have been, there was only impenetrable darkness. Even the sunlight from the sky couldn't pierce it. In this dark black hole like scene, bright red lines alternated between slowly materializing and being consumed by the surroundings. Their ultimate destination remained a mystery. What's most peculiar about this place is Sal de Ball Breeze. Seal mentioned that there's something ancient and sinister beneath Sal de Ball Breeze. Jenna stared into the darkness, sensing that this might be the heart of the problem. Muttering to herself, Jenna contemplated, will I be able to leave this strange world by walking into that darkness? But I have a hunch that not only does it not lead to safety, but it also represents danger. I can't enter rashly. As these thoughts raced through Jenna's mind, she was suddenly jolted by a commotion. Swiftly, she cast her gaze towards the other end of Avenue du Marquet, where she spotted several indistinct figures hovering in the air, emitting a faint glow as they meticulously scrutinized every shadow and conceivable hiding spot for humans. They clutched a stack of papers, which they compared to the pedestrians on the road. Jenna's heart tightened as a thought crossed her mind. Did the masters or guards of this world discover the collapsing tunnel above and suspect that outsiders had entered? prompting them to launch a thorough search? Uncertain about the abilities of these blurry figures emitting a faint light, Jenna didn't dare risk assuming they couldn't spot her lurking in the shadows. Her only option was to swiftly retrace her steps and return to Rue de Blouse's Blanches, planning to take a detour through an area that had already been inspected. Yet, even on the other side of Rue de Blouse's Blanches, faintly lit figures were conducting inspections. Jenna's heart raced, and amidst her unease, she had a sudden idea. She slipped into a nearby building, scattered dust in an inconspicuous corner, and recited an incantation to become invisible. With this newfound invisibility, she dashed along the street's shadows and infiltrated apartment 601 before the floating figures could search three Rue de Blouse's blanches. After patiently waiting for several moments, Jenna discreetly followed the imposter Jenna into the washroom. Seizing the moment while the imposter was occupied with washing a piece of cloth, Jenna, still in her invisibility state, drew a dagger and executed an assassin's mighty blow. Her form materialized as her dagger found its mark in the imposter Jenna's back. The fake Jenna's eyes bulged in shock, but Jenna swiftly covered her mouth and nose to stifle any outcry. After a brief struggle, the imposter met her end. Rather than withdrawing her dagger, Jenna chose to change into the fake Jenna's clothes. Her extensive experience with worn-out clothes helped her conceal the hole at the back. She then concealed the imposter's body in the cupboard beneath the sink to prevent any blood from flowing. With this done, Jenna wrangled up the cloth and mimicked the actions she had observed, maintaining the vacant expression. 
Soon, a faint figure floated outside apartment 601's window. Jenna didn't look up, continuing to tidy the coffee table, which had already been devoid of miscellaneous items. She could sense two substantial gazes on her, accompanied by the sound of paper being flipped. After an agonizing seven to eight seconds, the faint figures moved on to search the next apartment. Jenna let out a relieved breath and proceeded to the washroom with a measured pace. After what had just transpired, she felt an urgency to seek help. She couldn't afford to wait any longer. Even the suspected exit seemed too dangerous to approach, and numerous figures emitting a faint light were patrolling the area. While these figures didn't appear overly formidable, Jenna knew that engaging them would undoubtedly draw the attention of the administrators of this world. If this place was indeed the hostel, the previous residents, granted boons by evil gods, would pose a significant threat. This included Madame Knight Puales, who alternated between a demigod and a sequence five, or the true demigod, circle inhabitant Voisin Sanson. Jenna hadn't reached out to the outside world for help from the beginning because she lacked the means to send a message without leaving this place. Now, she was left with no other choice but to attempt something. I wonder if the telegraph office here can be of any use. It doesn't seem promising. Ah. Uh. Perhaps I should offer a prayer to a deity and recite his honorific name in Hermes. I hope he can hear my plea. Jenna's heart raced as she seized the opportunity to clean the cloth in the washroom. She outstretched her arms and began reciting the honorific name of the eternal blazing sun. The mighty eternal blazing sun, inextinguishable light, embodiment of order, god of deeds. As the soft Hermes words reverberated, Jenna's surroundings remained unchanged. She couldn't help but regret not having made up her mind after becoming a witch and putting her faith in Mr. Fool. That way, she might have obtained the Fool's honorific name from Lumian. But now, it was too late to consider that option. Phew. Jenna let out a sigh and retrieved the lucky gold coin from a hidden pocket in her light blue dress. She felt that her best option was to rely on luck for now. She wanted to see if luck alone could help her elicit a response without using a complete honorific name. Holding the lucky gold coin, Jenna continued her prayer in Hermes, Great Mr. Fool, please help me leave this place. Please protect Trier. In the Market District, Aubert's Du Coke Door, Room 207. Lumian suddenly awoke, sensing a faint warmth in his left chest. Chapter 462 Critical Interference He quickly unbuttoned his shirt and glanced at his left chest, where he saw the bluish-black symbol that represented Mr. Fool's seal. It was a fusion of a portion of the pupil SI and a portion of the contorted lines. What happened? Mr. Fool's seal has been activated. Did Termoboro's attempt to escape? Lumian's thoughts raced. However, as he pondered, he began to sense that something was amiss. Sunlight filtered through the drawn curtains, casting a semi-darkness over room 207. At first glance, there was nothing unusual, as if someone had overslept until the sun was high in the sky. But Lumian was different. He reset his body and mental state every morning, waking up naturally at 6 a.m. It was already autumn, and Trier didn't see the first light until 7 a.m. Lumian recalled an earthquake that had occurred not long ago, and he suspected that the official Beyonders might have taken action. However, after carefully listening to his surroundings and confirming the safety of the market district, he had gone back to sleep. It was still late at night. Either Termoboros has escaped, and I'm no longer affected by the Circle inhabitants' power, or there's been an anomaly in the market district. Lumian shrank into a gentle crouch, leaning against the desk beside the bed. He cautiously raised a corner of the curtain. What he saw was a familiar daily scene, but soon, Lumian noticed blurry figures floating in the air, emitting a faint, eerie glow. These figures had different faces, but they all shared an unsettling stiffness, emptiness, coldness, and detachment. They bore a certain resemblance to the corrupted Bouvard's corpse and Gabriel, who had transformed into a monster. It was as if they could disappear into the crevices of space at any moment gazing coldly and dispassionately at reality. The monsters of the hostile pathway have invaded Trier? 
but were a trier's protective powers. This doesn't feel very strong, it's more like a product of corruption. He observed carefully and noticed that the street vendors and pedestrians also appeared somewhat empty, as if they too had been affected. Combined with the anomaly in time and the westering sun, Lumian quickly surmised the situation. I'm not in the real market district. I've been drawn into a strange world suspected to be the hostile. This is the reason why Mr. Fool's seal was activated. Lumian released his right hand's grip, allowing the curtains to gently fall back against the wall, sealing off the interior from the exterior once more. With a sense of purpose, he got out of bed and checked his belongings to ensure they were all intact. Without wasting any time, Lumian set up the altar and erected a wall of spirituality, readying himself to perform ritualistic magic to seek Mr. Fool's assistance. One by one, he used his spirituality to light the three candles and incinerate the herbal powder and essential oil. Stepping back twice, he began to solemnly recite the Fool's honorific name. The Fool that doesn't belong to this era, the mysterious ruler above the gray fog, the king of yellow and black who wields good luck. I implore you. As he spoke, a thin gray fog suddenly emanated from the wall of spirituality. The candle flames took on a bluish-black hue, casting a sinister and dark atmosphere over the entire altar. Lumian's thoughts slowed down once more, and an uncomfortable sensation coursed through his flesh. It was as if an army of countless worms were wriggling beneath his skin. Unlike previous interactions, he suddenly felt a strong sense of imminent danger. It was as though the gray fog harbored blatant and unusually overt malice directed at him. This malevolence would briefly fade, only to surge back. It didn't fully dissipate, nor did it manifest into tangible reality. The cycle of vanishing and resurfacing was akin to a monstrous entity in the water extending its tentacles to the shore, only to be pulled back into the deep sea by an unseen force. Lumian struggled to complete the ritual, waiting in vain for the angel's protection or any revelations to come. The influence of the gray fog intensified, leaving him with no choice but to prematurely end the ritual and extinguish the candle flames. As the wall of spirituality disintegrated, Lumian's thoughts finally returned to their normal pace. Sometimes malice, sometimes no issues. Is the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings interfering with Mr. Fool's response? He usually can't do it. Has he gathered enough strength to take a risk at a critical moment? This implies that the situation has reached a critical turning point. In Cartier Erast, outside the sacred heart cloister with its numerous golden steeples, the major arcana card holders, magician, clad in a white knotted shirt and a beige dress, and the elegant and pristine justice, stared at the magnificent building. A golden retriever accompanied them, doing the same as well. Rumble. The ground quaked, as if a brief earthquake had struck Trier. Magician smiled and said, It's beginning. They understood that this commotion was likely stemming from the deep valley cloister and the quarry. Their aim was to initiate a series of changes and set off a chain reaction, with the hope that Lady Moon, hidden within the Sacred Heart Cloister, would step out on her own and trigger their plan ahead of schedule. By doing so, they could avoid forcefully entering the Sacred Heart Cloister and provoking the Eternal Blazing Sun Church. Their target was Lady Moon, the evil gods bestowed who nurtured a deity. Assuming there were very few angel-level heretics blessed within the barrier, Lady Moon represented the Great Mother and the most potent power among all of Trier's heretics. It was highly likely that she was at the center of the problem. By controlling her, they could disregard the intricate web woven by fate and grasp the heart of the issue, possibly resolving it on the spot. If Lady Moon didn't emerge, Magician intended to capitalize on the chaos in Trier, attempting to conceal the grand complex of buildings blessed by the eternal blazing sun, and forcibly locate her target. Justice nodded gently. In fact, I've always had a sense that something is amiss with Lady Moon. The problem may not be what we've suspected and might have lured us here. However, regardless of the situation, we have many dependable companions. Even if something occurs elsewhere, I believe they can handle it. Magician concurred tersely. The two of us can't do everything. Believing in our companions is both hopeful and necessary. At that moment, she suddenly turned her head and looked into the distance. 
Justice asked calmly, what's the matter? Magician frowned and replied, the seal experienced a fluctuation. Mr. Fool has also sent a revelation, but I'm not certain if it's authentic. After tidying up the altar, Lumian was just about to settle down and consider the current situation and ways to contact the outside world when he heard two sets of footsteps approaching from upstairs. Are they heading for room 207? Had the dissolution of the wall of spirituality alerted someone here? Lumian surveyed the area, his fingers finding the gaps in the newspaper-covered wall as he climbed up to the ceiling. Like a colossal spider, he relied on a dancer's flexibility and a hunter's physique to silently cling closely to the wall, waiting for the two people in the corridor to approach. If they didn't spot anything unusual, he would consider it a successful deception and let them pass. If they sensed anything was amiss, he would strike without hesitation. At that moment, Lumian felt a deep sense of gratitude for Aubert's Du Coke Doris aged appearance. It was filled with damage and signs of repair. This was why he could grasp certain protrusions, secure his grip in certain crevices, and anchor his body safely to the ceiling. In just over ten seconds, the door to room 207 creaked open. Lumian's eyes focused on Gabriel's hairline and forehead, as well as the black-framed glasses perched on the bridge of his nose. Behind the playwright stood Seraphine, a model clad in a lake blue dress, exuding an aura of detachment. It's indeed the hostel. Although Lumian couldn't fathom why he had inexplicably ended up at the hostel, he still felt a surge of excitement despite his taut nerves. From this point onward, as long as he could deceive Seraphine and the others, establish a connection with the outside world, and seek help, there was hope for resolving the problem. Gabriel took two steps inside and halted. He scanned the room and said to Seraphine, No issues here. Seraphine tersely acknowledged his words and proceeded to inspect the other rooms. Gabriel followed the model closely, making sure to close the door of room 207 behind him. After they ascended from the second floor, Lumian released his grip on the ceiling and gently landed on the floor. He pulled up a chair, turned it around, and sat down, leaning back as he kept his gaze locked on the door. After a few minutes, footsteps approached from the third floor. Lumian remained motionless, unsurprised as he watched the wooden door gently open. Gabriel's figure appeared. Why did you come in, the playwright? Now a monster with a slightly vacant expression, asked with a note of rational concern. Lumian chuckled. I'd like to know that too. Gabriel entered the room quietly, shutting the door behind him. He was dressed in a white shirt, a dark jacket, black pants, and strapless leather shoes, his face showing signs of pain. Leave this place as soon as possible. I'm losing control. I don't know when I'll betray you. By the way, Jenna has also entered. I don't know where she's hiding. Jenna is here too. Lumian raised his eyebrows and asked the most critical question, how do I leave? Gabriel began to respond, but the door to room 207 creaked open once more. Only then did Lumian sense the intrusion and turn his gaze towards the door. Seraphine stood there, with her plump face, naturally disheveled brown hair, and brown eyes exuding a unique ethereal aura. Lumian didn't panic. He put on a calm demeanor and said, You seem to know Gabriel so well. Despite his outward composure, every muscle in his body tensed. He's not good at hiding his thoughts, Seraphine replied in an empty voice. Communicable. Lumian suppressed his urge to use the spell of Haramph inside. I thought you had already become a pure monster. Seraphine's lips formed a self deprecating smile. The difference between me and them is that before I turned into a pure monster, I realized there was still someone who truly loved me. Gabriel smiled. Lumian sighed and inquired, Is this the hostel? Yes, Gabriel confirmed before anyone else could. Lumian glanced at the dimly lit corridor. But the room here isn't room 7, room 12. It's still room 207, 309. Seraphine gazed at Lumian her expression becoming increasingly ethereal, and her voice even more illusory. Here, they call me, Room 12. Chapter 463, Non-Corresponding Details He had considered various possibilities, 
but he hadn't guessed what Room 12 signified. Room 12 was where Madame Knight Puales de Roquefort, her husband, butler, lady's maid, and the children resided. Almost simultaneously, Lumian recalled the oil painting he had seen at Trier's Art Center. The woman in the painting, modeled after Seraphine, was naked, her skin adorned with faces. Were those faces the symbols of the room's occupants, or were they the manifestations of the hostel itself? Lumian's pupils dilated as he fixed his gaze on Seraphine, prepared to activate the black mark on his body at any moment and use the spell of harumph to block the exit of Room 12's occupants. He was still haunted by the memories of Madame Puales. Seraphine tugged at her lake blue dress, her plump face contorting with obvious pain. I can't influence how long the residents inside can sense the outside world. In other words, Madame Puales hasn't discovered me yet. Lumian heaved a sigh of relief, but he didn't dare to be careless. What if Seraphine's interference quickly failed? At that moment, Seraphine pulled down the collar of her dress, revealing a portion of her skin. Lumian could clearly see the oil painting like faces there. They were half hidden and half exposed, looking exceptionally terrifying. This confirmed Lumian's guess and piqued his curiosity. Why use a corrupted human model as a room in the hostel? Why allow Madame Puales, Voisin Sanson, and other powerful evil god bestowed individuals to stay there? Couldn't they just move into this replica, the fake Aubert's du Coke door? Was this to interfere with divination, prophecy, and other mysticism methods employed during a search? Why does it feel like a ritual? It's like a specific setup and requirement. As an alms monk with ample knowledge of ritualistic magic, Lumian sensed something sinister about this matter. Seeing that Seraphine hadn't left, he seized the opportunity to inquire, how many rooms does the hostel have? From room 2 to room 13, Seraphine replied in her ethereal voice. No room 1? Lumian asked immediately. Gabriel answered for his lover. There's supposed to be one, but we've never seen it. Room 1 has never moved into the hostel. Mysterious room 1. It's confirmed at the moment that there are 12 rooms but there might be more than one evil god bestowed living in each room. Lumian realized that time was of the essence and quickly changed his line of questioning. How can I escape from here? With the permission of the pixies or through the black hole on Avenue du Marque, but it's very dangerous. It might lead you to places you shouldn't be, Seraphine replied, her eyes shifting between emptiness and pain. Avenue du Marque's black hole. Lumian inquired further. How many pixies are there, and where can I find them? Three, Gabriel responded. They don't reside in this world and only visit occasionally. They typically allow the servants to maintain order here, they are the flying and glowing figures you see outside. Three pixies. According to the purifier's information, the sequence of a pixie likely hasn't reached godhood. I can tentatively consider them equivalent to sequence five but their unique states mean that unless they actively enter reality, some saints might not even be able to attack them. I do have the potential to deal with the pixies when encountering them, especially if I could capture one to facilitate my escape. Lumian's thoughts raced as he asked further, do the pixies have a regular pattern of entering and exiting? No. Seraphine replied, her demeanor gradually fading as she shook her head slowly. Lumian switched to another line of questioning, do you know where Jenna is hiding? I don't know, Gabriel replied quickly. The Pixie's servants haven't located her either. They're uncertain if anyone has truly entered this place. The Pixies must have ordered an investigation based on the changes in the outside world out of caution. Before Lumian could ask another question, Seraphine's face twisted once again. She turned and left room 207, heading upstairs. It was evident that her ability to influence the resident's perception of the outside world was quickly fading. Gabriel's condition worsened as he slowly made his way to the corridor outside. Is there a boundary here? Lumian inquired one last time. Gabriel nodded, his eyes growing increasingly vacant. Only Avenue du Marque and the area around it are real. It's surrounded by a dark, deep void with a formless barrier. Barrier. 
Lumian repeated this word in his heart, his expression unchanged as he watched Gabriel close the door for him and listened to his footsteps returning to the third floor. The word barrier brought to mind something Madame Magician had mentioned before. She had spoken of a barrier outside their world, preventing the invasion of alien evil gods. Although Gabriel's description of the barrier might not be the same as Madame Magician's, Lumian couldn't ignore the possibility that these barriers were connected, especially given the evil god believer's grand plans. Turning away from the door, Lumian realized that time was of the essence. Seraphine and Gabriel's corruption would only worsen, rendering them increasingly out of control. Once fully mutated, they would no longer help Lumian and Jenna hide the truth, likely reporting it to the Pixies. There are two pressing issues at hand. First, how to contact the outside world or escape this place. Second, finding Jenna. Lumian focused and employed his conspirer thinking abilities. Regarding the first question, especially how to contact the outside world, he quickly brainstormed several potential solutions. One, fully activate the Blood Emperor's aura in his right hand to see if it could break through the barriers of this abnormal world, attracting the attention of the demigods in Trier. 2. Set up a boon-seeking ritual to bypass the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings' as interference and transmit information to Mr. Fool. 3. Test the spirit and flesh connection between himself and Mr. K's finger. 4. Attempt to summon Madame Magician's messenger. 5. Attempt to summon Madame Hela's messenger. 6. Recite the incantation used to enter the curly-haired baboon's research society's gathering the nation of the Evernight Palace, to see if it could be of use in this situation without any prior request. 7. Find the fake Franca in this world and check if she possesses the ancient silver mirror they had obtained from underground to potentially use it to escape. 8. Create a commotion to attract one or two pixies and capture them. 9. Before diving into any of his numerous plans, Lumian knew that locating Jenna was a top priority as any of his actions could potentially alert the Pixies and draw their attention. How should I find Jenna? He tried to put himself in Jenna's shoes, considering how she, an experienced witch, would handle being in this strange world, suspected to be the hostel's location. Jenna must have also seen Gabriel, and she wouldn't take the risk of entering the fake Aubert's do coke door immediately. She can become invisible and hide in the shadows. She usually has the patience to observe. It's not difficult for her to notice the peculiarities of pedestrians and vendors. Under these circumstances, what should I do if I were her? Yes, I'd search for the boundaries of this place. I'd see if cathedrals and other deity-protected buildings have been replicated. If they have, I'd investigate what's inside and whom they believe in. I'd identify the differences between this place and the real market district to find any clues for my escape and my first task will be to confirm if there's a fake me. The Pixie's servants were conducting a search. Lumian's thoughts gradually cleared. He returned to the desk, drew the curtains slightly, and peered outside. Lumian waited until the ethereal Pixie servants, blurry figures emitting a faint glow and wearing blank expressions, had finished their investigation and disappeared before he took out the silver lie earring and placed it on his left ear. Swiftly, he transformed into Madame Fells and descended to the first floor, as though inspecting every room. Then, he became a vendor who didn't sell his wares nearby, passing by Madame Fells and leaving Aubert's Du Coke door. This was his home territory. Even though it was a replica or a reflection, it didn't stop him from already knowing the environmental details and the common figures that often appeared in this area. Lumian didn't hurry to Rue de Blouse's blanches. Instead, he circled Rue du Rossignol and entered his secure hideout. As soon as he opened the door, his brow furrowed slightly. There was only one trap at the door among the many he had set up, the simplest one. Lumian's gaze then swept across the room, but he didn't see the ritualistic furs or the used cowhide and dog skin that were placed here in the real world. It's not a strict correspondence. He muttered to himself. The more he thought about it, the more he realized that this place resembled the real market district on the surface. In particular, in a room protected by traps, various details didn't correspond. It's like an external observation and the recreation of key rooms. 
It's like. It's like. Lumian's pupils dilated as he had an epiphany. It's like painting. Fake three Rue de Blouse's Blanches, Apartment 601. Jenna clutched the lucky coin and offered a brief prayer to Mr. Fool. A thin gray fog materialized before her eyes but then dissipated. It's actually working, Jenna stammered. That lucky gold coin proved to be truly lucky enough. Jenna didn't receive any revelations, so she had no choice but to persevere and maintain her guise as her counterfeit self. She diligently tidied up the room and wiped the coffee table. Time in this world appeared to pass slowly, with the sun in the sky staying fixed in its position, unmoving. Suddenly, Jenna heard the door open and instinctively turned her gaze in that direction. The fake Franca continued with her task, showing no reaction. Jenna's eyes locked onto Lumian's golden black hair. She immediately averted her gaze and assumed an expression of emptiness, not certain if Seal was the real deal. In the next instant, she heard a familiar, taunting voice. As expected, you're here. That's all you can think of. Chapter 464, A World in a Painting Damn it! Can't you speak properly? Jenna cursed, waving the cloth in her hand. Lumian closed the door behind him and smiled. You're quite energetic. You're not crying from fear. Jenna cautiously looked out the window, confirming that the faintly glowing figures had long disappeared. Suppressing her urge to argue with Lumian, she wasted no time and asked, how did you get in here too? As she spoke, she reminded herself, as an adult woman with rich life experiences and many setbacks, I shouldn't argue with such an immature minor at such a critical moment. Lumian's gaze moved over to Franca, who was sipping red wine by the window. He settled onto the divan and leaned back comfortably. First, tell me how you got in. To be honest, he didn't know why he had suddenly arrived in this strange place resembling hostile. Jenna remained standing by the coffee table, ready to assume a dummy appearance at any moment. She then recounted how she had received a dream revelation, came underground to deliver the mission item, and acquired a lucky gold coin. Lumian listened attentively without interruption. Finally, he chuckled. Now, I can answer your question. I was sent here by Mr. Fool to save you. He roughly understood why he had appeared in room 207 of the fake Aubert's do coke door after waking up. Did Mr. Fool really send you? I don't even know his, his full honorific name. Did my prayer succeed with just the lucky gold coin? Jenna had her suspicions, but she still found it unbelievable. Of course it's true, Lumian replied sincerely. What puzzled him was something else. Why did Mr. Fool send him and not Madame Magician? If it were Madame Magician who had been pulled into the hostel, the problem would have been easily resolved. This could be explained by the seal of the Fool on him, but Madame Magician was a major arcana card holder, a key member of the tarot club who could participate in a meeting before a god. Furthermore, she definitely possessed similar marks in the three pathways of the divine controlled by the fool. She could likely be assigned remotely. I'm afraid there's another reason I don't understand. Lumian pondered for a moment and focused on Jenna's description of the world, then asked for confirmation, from the outside, the only difference between this place and reality is Sal de Ball Breeze? Previously, Seraphine and Gabriel had only mentioned that there was a black hole on Avenue du Marquet through which there was a chance of leaving, but it was also very dangerous. They hadn't specified its location. Although Lumian had a vague guess, he couldn't be sure until Jenna revealed her discovery. I've only explored a few nearby streets and less than one-fifth of Avenue du Marquet, Jenna replied cautiously to prevent Seal from making a misjudgment. She then continued, and inside, there are many differences. For example, here, the layout of the room, large pieces of furniture, and reality are the same. The other details are somewhat different. I suspect, I suspect. Lumian looked at Jenna and spoke before she could. A world in a painting. Yes, a world in a painting. Jenna's hazy thoughts finally became clear. 
Combined with the painter sequence and the paints and brushes she had found from the mutated monk, she believed that it was an oil painting that only copied some of the streets in the market district and possessed supernatural powers. It was called Hostel. Jenna was both concerned and intrigued. Drawing a painting seemed to create a world. Lumian teased, I'm glad you could also come to such a realization. It's no easy task. This painting world isn't considered advanced. The oil painting created by an angel of the painter pathway might truly be a world with living beings inside. Unlike the current one, there were many aspects with fakeness. What was the purpose of such a relatively low-level painting? Without waiting for Jenna's response, Lumian instructed her, check Franca's hidden pocket and see if there's a classic silver mirror. Why don't you search for it yourself? You know what that mirror looks like better than I do. Jenna suddenly chuckled. Don't tell me you're shy. Lumian said nonchalantly, if you're not here, I'll search for it on my own. But since I can instruct you, why should I tire myself out? Jenna gritted her teeth and wasted no time. She walked to the window and rummaged through the fake Franca's various pockets. She quickly came to a conclusion. There are no ancient mirrors. Many of the hidden pockets weren't depicted. Lumian nodded slowly and inwardly crossed out Plan 7. He turned to Jenna and said, Try magic mirror divination and see if it works. Jenna, experienced, knew that Lumian wanted to use this opportunity to confirm if the world in the painting was connected to the spirit world and determine if his teleportation could succeed or help them leave. Therefore, she took out a makeup mirror from her hidden pocket and prayed to one of the safer targets Franca had provided. Before long, the preparations for magic mirror divination were completed. The palm-sized mirror turned gray, but there was no aqueous light. It failed, but there's still something supernatural about it, Jenna said, puzzled. With a subtle nod, Lumian replied, it's likely that there's a fake spirit world here. If you activate spirit vision, you might be able to see a few remnant souls, but this isn't connected to the real spirit world, so you can't find the entity you're trying to inquire about. In other words, he could teleport within the world within the painting, but he couldn't leave it. Lumian reached into his pocket, retrieved Mr. K's finger, and flicked it in front of his eyes. There was no reaction, nor was there any change. What's this? Jenna was taken aback. Seal actually carried a blood-stained human finger with him. It's a mystical item. It can't contact the outside world, Lumian explained patronizingly. Simultaneously, he sighed inwardly. Mr. K's finger seemed impressive, but it could never be used to its full effect. Most of the time, Lumian had no use for it. When he needed it, the environment was often special, preventing him from using its connection to the true form to summon Mr. K. Jenna didn't press further. She pursed her lips and said, So, what should we do next? She couldn't think of any other way to leave this place. She could only consider starting with the black hole and Sal de Ball Breeze, the edge of the painting world, and the situation with the two fake cathedrals. Lumian chuckled. No need to rush. I still have eight plans left. But before we try them, we need to make a trip to Avenue du Marque and observe the black hole at Sal de Ball Breeze up close. Are you planning to leave from there? Jenna asked with a frown. It seemed perilous. Lumian stood up and walked towards apartment 601's door. It is my last resort, but it's also a necessary preparation. I don't want to try the other methods and fail, only to be discovered by the pixies and blocked by the tenants of the hostel. When that happens, I won't even be able to approach Sal de Ball Breeze even if I want to risk it. Jenna looked out of the window again, only to see that the sun was setting in the west, and the pixie's servants had yet to return. Only then did she quickly follow Lumian down the stairs. On the way, she inquired, why did those heretics create such a painting world to hide the hostel's residents? Lumian pondered for a moment and replied thoughtfully, I believe this is a secondary purpose. Overall, it seems more like a ritual. Think about it. This place resembles a phony market district. The Sal de Ball Breeze should be the only place left without any correspondence. And I've already told you that beneath the Sal de Ball Breeze are old bones from the fourth epoch. 
It's connected to the secret of Eglise St. Robert's old cemetery. It's definitely not a coincidence that the world and the painting left it blank. I also think that's the key to the problem. Jenna instinctively wanted to prove that she wasn't stupid by having a similar guess. As Lumine descended, he pondered and said, when the abnormality truly occurs, will such a painting world temporarily replace some streets in the real market district? Will only Sal de Ball Breeze remain intact? Who and what is this to confuse? In mysticism, this represents the application of the law of similarity. When the similarity reaches a certain level, acts on the counterfeits can be reflected in reality. Could they be using this method to unravel Sal de Ball Breeze's underground secrets and uncover the old bones of the fourth epoch? No, it's probably not just for the old bones. Are they trying to open the entrance to fourth epic trier? But it's not that simple. The entire ceiling system hasn't been destroyed or weakened. Lumian gradually formed an idea, sensing that he was getting closer to the key plan of this disaster. If he could ultimately grasp the truth, it would be an excellent performance for a conspirer's observational abilities. Jenna nodded slightly, agreeing with Lumian's guess. As they conversed about the fake three Rue de Blouse's blanches, their gazes suddenly froze. On the road diagonally opposite, a woman in a loose strapped white dress was staring at them. The woman had a beautiful face, her slightly curly black hair cascading messily over her shoulders. Her blue eyes were rather vacant, and her entire person appeared detached yet real. Lumian and Jenna had encountered similar auras and feelings in another person. It was the human model, Seraphine, room 12 of the hostel. Is this another room in the hostel, another human model? Why is she here? It's as if she's waiting for Jenna and me. Lumian tensed up and instinctively reached out with his right hand to grab Jenna's shoulder. Simultaneously, the beautiful woman's voice drifted with a smile. Fate predestined us to meet. Convergence always happens inadvertently. Chapter 465, Circle Convergence Predetermined fate Could it be Room 7, Voisin Sanson, and his family? As these thoughts raced through Lomian's mind, he activated the black mark on his right shoulder without hesitation. Spirit World Traversal He and Jenna vanished, heading for the entrance of Aubert's Du Coq door. Lumian had never set foot on Avenue du Marquet in the painting world, so he didn't have the coordinates for the spirit world there. The spirit world and the painting realm still comprised dense layers of colors and countless transparent, strange figures. However, the seven bright and pure lights at the top appeared rather blurry, as if separated by many panes of mullioned glass. Guided by his spirituality, Lumian pinpointed the corresponding coordinates at Aubert's Du Coq Doris entrance and teleported there. They swiftly departed the spirit world and found themselves on the street. But what Lumian saw before them was the building at Three Rue de Blouse's Blanches, the very spot where they had just been. They hadn't left the street onto Rue Anarchy, they had merely shifted seven to eight meters from one side of the road to the other. Circle Inhabitant Jenna and I are already ensnared in the circle. Lumian turned his head and wasn't surprised to see the beautiful woman suspected to be Hostel's Room 7, standing only a few meters away on the same side of the street as them. Voice and Sanson? Lumian asked in a deep voice. He temporarily abandoned the idea of teleportation, as their previous attempt had proven ineffective in escaping Rue de Blouse's blanches. As Lumian spoke, Jenna discreetly retrieved a mirror preparing to utilize black magic to maneuver around and launch an attack. She sensed that, at such a tense and crucial moment, Seal's inquiry, instead of initiating a series of attacks, might be an attempt to divert the enemy's attention and create an opportunity for her to deliver a fatal blow. Although Lumian had mentioned that Voisin Sanson was a sequence four circle inhabitant of the inevitability pathway, a saint bestowed with a boon, a true demigod, she believed that they had to make an attempt, despite the odds. So what if he had undergone a qualitative transformation in various aspects compared to low to mid-sequence beyonders that even a small team combined wouldn't be a match for him? Upon hearing Lumian's question, the beautiful woman in a white dress revealed a fleeting and distant smile. Seems like you're well informed. 
Before she could finish her sentence, Lumian took a step forward and harumphed. Two beams of white light shot out from his nostrils and landed on the woman suspected to be Room 7. Although the spell of Harumph's power had increased following his advancement to Sequence 6, he didn't believe it would truly work on a saint. At best, it might make her sway slightly. Lumian opted for this approach instead of donning the flawed boxing gloves to target the various negative effects of a contractee. As a conspirer, he keenly noticed a crucial detail. He and Jenna were trapped in the circle, but Voice and Sanson hadn't left Room 7. He remained within the beautiful woman's body. This clearly hindered his performance. Therefore, he either had arrogance as a negative side effect of his contract ability, or he couldn't leave the hostel's room for some reason. Combined with his earlier hypothesis that the world and the painting and the situation in the hostel were part of a ritual, Lumian was more inclined to believe the latter possibility. In that case, even if my spell of harumph can't affect you, can it affect your room? The human models, corrupted by the painter pathway and adorned with special patterns, were equivalent to mid-sequence monsters. As two beams of white light descended, the beautiful woman in the white dress fainted. Almost simultaneously, Lumian and Jenna's vision blurred, and they felt slightly dizzy. When they regained their senses, they found themselves back at the exit of three Rue de Blouse's blanches, facing the beautiful woman in a white halter dress diagonally across from them. The woman's lips curled up, but she didn't repeat her previous statement. Circle inhabitant. Lumian realized that he and Jenna were truly trapped in a loop, and the successful attack on Room 7 triggered the loop's restart. Moreover, he confirmed that Voice and Sanson and his family couldn't leave Room 7 until something concluded. They could only exert influence on the outside world through obstacles. Otherwise, they would have opened the door and confronted Lumian with all their might. They sought to control the target with an angel sealed in his body as efficiently as possible. Even if Voice and Sanson had the negative side effect of arrogance, it was improbable for all three of his children to be the same. Without hesitation, Lumian sank his consciousness into his right palm, revealing a few bright red scars. An extraordinarily frenzied, violent, and high and mighty aura surged into the sky, as if it sought to dominate the land. Alista Tudor Lumian activated the Blood Emperor's mark. While this had no real impact in the physical world, it caused those around him to feel a slight fear, making them tremble. However, the response from the painting world exceeded Lumian's expectations. The sky suddenly turned dark red, and the westering sun appeared tinted with an iron hue as it swayed left and right. Rue de Blouse's blanches and the entire world trembled as if struck by an earthquake. The vendors and pedestrians on the street, as well as the residents and animals on both sides, blurred and distorted. The beautiful woman in room 7 of the hostel was taken aback. She instinctively trembled and wanted to hug herself tightly. An invisible force shrouding half of Rue de Blouse's blanches materialized, resembling transparent glass. Suddenly, it shattered, revealing multiple cracks. Seeing this, Lumian grabbed Jenna's shoulder and activated the black mark on his right shoulder once more. This time, they swiftly passed through the local spirit world and arrived at Aubert's Du Coke Doris entrance. They didn't return to the circle. The painting world existed between reality and fiction, and it was very sensitive to the aura of high-level figures, materializing the impact. As Lumian's thoughts raced, a distant rumble reached his ears. It emanated from Avenue du Marquet. Lumian and Jenna exchanged glances as a term came to their minds, Sal de Ball Breeze. Has something happened to the black hole corresponding to Sal de Ball Breeze? Was it a subsequent change brought about by the Blood Emperor Alista Tudor's aura, or has the ritual officially begun, heralding the impending catastrophe? Lumian's thoughts raced as he raced towards Avenue du Marquet. Jenna's response was as swift as his making the same decision. Deep underground, in a hidden cave undetectable to the outside world. The rock walls here had been meticulously modified, featuring two vertical beams and multiple horizontal beams, each marked with longitudinal gaps. To anyone familiar with Trier's map, these formations would correspond strictly to a section of Avenue du Marquet. Each rock wall was the equivalent of a side street, and each vertical gap represented an alley. 
Adorning each rock wall were lifelike oil paintings, portraying buildings of various architectural styles, dark iron street lamps, pedestrians dressed as clerks, vendors selling an array of goods, and scenes from windows, all depicted with vivid and natural colors. These scenes were almost identical to those on the corresponding streets. On the eastern rock wall of Avenue du Marquet, three men in white shirts with unbuttoned vests were using mural tools to craft a complex, bright red door at the spot corresponding to Sal de Ball Breeze. Their bodies were coated in paint, and their eyes displayed a peculiar detachment, as though they were gazing at a distant realm rather than a rock wall. Each time they completed the bright red door on the rock wall, it mysteriously vanished after a fifth was completed. The three painters had no choice but to repeat their efforts in vain. Suddenly, the mine trembled gently, and minuscule cracks that were almost imperceptible to the naked eye appeared on the rock wall adorned with various scenes. The female painter in a blue beret and the male painter in red pants looked up at the depiction of Avenue du Marquet on the rock wall. In the next moment, they pressed their hands against the rock wall and vanished. Two figures emerged within the massive oil painting. One was a woman donning a blue beret, and the other a man in red pants. They both wore white shirts and open beige vests. The third painter, a man in his twenties, remained on the outside. He was clad in black pants with tassels, his brown hair disheveled, and a bit of stubble adorning his mouth. The distant expression in his flaxen-colored eyes faded as he cautiously surveyed his surroundings. Observing that the mine's tremors were limited to this area and that the anomaly in the painting hadn't extended, the young painter let out a sigh of relief. He redirected his gaze to the empty salle de ball breeze, seemingly contemplating whether to change his approach or wait for the right moment to try again. At that precise moment, a skeletal palm suddenly extended from the rock wall and the ground. It had a yellowish hue and a withered texture, with its surface covered in iron-colored rust, giving it an ancient appearance. As soon as the skeletal palm appeared, it seized the young painter's ankle, aiming to drag him deep into the earth. Late at night, 11 Rue de Fontaines, Cartier de la Cathedral Commemorative. Franca's dream had been an odd one, with various bizarre scenes woven together into a nonsensical narrative. Suddenly, she jolted awake and instinctively looked to her side. Although the room was shrouded in darkness due to the heavy curtains blocking the crimson moonlight, it didn't hinder her from noticing that the spot under the velvet blanket beside her was empty, Gardner Martin was nowhere to be found. Franca's pupils widened with a mixture of surprise and suspicion. It wasn't that she was shocked by Gardner Martin's disappearance. There was nothing he could do that would truly surprise her. What caught her off guard was her failure to detect his departure. Demonesses possessed formidable spiritual senses. It was impossible for someone sleeping beside them to slip out of bed and leave without their knowledge. Franca had only snapped out of her reverie when she felt the drop in temperature on the other side of the bed. Franca swiftly got out of bed, dressed, and opened the bedroom door. The corridor lay in darkness, and an eerie silence hung in the air. Chapter 466, Encounter Franca blended into the shadows and moved silently through the shadows, her eyes fixed on the crimson-lit corridor. She even began to suspect that Seal had failed to find her and had enlisted the help of Madame Magician to teleport Gardner Martin away. How else could he have vanished without her noticing? The third floor of the grayish-white villa remained still. Franca listened closely, feeling like she was the only one left in the building. The butler, valet, maid, gardener, and chef seemed to have disappeared into thin air. She cautiously approached the valet's room, extending her right palm and silently turning the handle. Through her dark vision, Franca spotted two people lying on the bed, wrapped in each other's embrace and covered by a thin blanket. Almost simultaneously, Franca's pupils dilated. The two of them were headless, their necks nestled against each other, their wounds stained with blood. Initially taken aback, Franca recalled Seal's description of the Iron and Blood Cross Order's supervisor Olson. She suspected that Gardner's valet and his lover had experienced a similar situation. Their heads had seemingly come to life and left their bodies. Without further scrutiny, she quietly closed the door and blended into the dense shadows of the staircase. 
Franco wanted to see if anyone else in the building had suffered a similar fate. Upon descending to the first floor hall, her eyes froze. The armor and weapons that had been there were gone. What a drastic change. Fuck, how did I not notice it at all? Franca, who had been confident in her abilities, experience, and reactions, couldn't help but waver. In the next moment, the washroom door on the first floor swung open, and a lady's maid in an old nightgown emerged. The lady's maid shook off the liquid in her hand and slowly made her way back to the servants' quarters, her head empty and her neck stained red. Hidden in the shadows, Franca cast her gaze out the window. The two patrolling guards had also lost their heads, and the shadow reflected in the glass was like a magnified beer bottle. Franca, having roughly confirmed the situation at 11 Rue de Fontaine's, didn't hesitate and quickly sneaked out of the villa. She planned to report this to Madame Judgment immediately and use the primordial Demonis figurine to inform Brown Sauron and Demonis of Black Clarice about the anomaly here. The latter necessitated a ritual. Franca was concerned that attempting it in this abnormal building would trigger unnecessary changes and bring unpredictable danger, so she decided to escape the abnormal environment before taking the corresponding measures. In the darkness of the night, the demoness of pleasure lurked in the shadows of an empty house. She exited the building from the side and circled the lawn ahead. Beneath Trier, blazing Danitz forcefully opened the stone door. Behind them, they found a small mine, with three classical oil lamps embedded in the stone wall, one high, and two low. In the center of the mine, a staircase descended into darkness. The bottom was hidden in shadow, appearing to have no end. Danitz retracted his fist and turned his body, signaling the nearly twenty sailors following him to enter the mine and cooperate. Among them were hunters responsible for observing the environment and detecting hidden traps and subtle traces seers used coin tosses or crystal pendants to determine the direction and danger of pursuit. A mid-sequence sailor was ready to assist his teammates and handle any mishaps. With this coordination, Danit's team swiftly made their way through the stairs and tunnel, and their vision suddenly brightened. They found themselves in a caved-in quarry cave, scattered with straw mats, rags, pottery jars, and other items. Danitz scanned the area and chuckled. It's been turned into a weapons cache. Not long ago, dozens of rebels lived here. His gaze shifted to the end of the quarry cave, where a wide tunnel led to an unknown destination. A sailor standing beside Danitz clicked his tongue and remarked, there should be many similar military hideouts nearby. Are the main rebel forces led by the Carbonari all here? I'm not blind. I can see. Blazing Danitz cursed. The question now is, where did they go? Is the chaos about to begin? In the market district, at Aubert's Du Coke door, room 305, Anthony Reed was awakened by the previous earthquake. Ever since his escape that night, he had become sensitive to various movements, although not as fearful as when he heard gunshots. Given the dangerous signals provided by the intelligence they had discussed earlier, he couldn't fall asleep quickly. Anthony Reed got out of bed and poured a glass of light beer to ease his anxiety. After using placate on himself, he intended to force himself to sleep a little longer. At that moment, he heard pounding at the motel's entrance. Who returns so late at night? It feels a little urgent. Anthony Reed listened intently, sensing that something was brewing in secret. Before long, footsteps approached his door, and Anthony Reed immediately opened it to peer into the dimly lit corridor. He spotted an impatient man in a grayish blue worker's uniform and cap. This was an informant he had developed at the docks. What happened? Anthony Reed asked in a calm and gentle voice. Having been placated, the informant's anxiety dissipated and he cautiously glanced around before lowering his voice. There will be a huge strike at the docks tomorrow. Rumor has it that weapons will be issued. Issued weapons. Anthony Reed's mind instantly filled with images of barricades, incendiary bombs, smoke grenades, rifles, and two-wheeled carts symbolizing Trier's chaos. In Trier, due to the strong resistance of the citizens and their adeptness at protests and battles, such occurrences weren't too unusual, happening every two or three years, sometimes even two or three times a year. The only difference was in their scale. 
However, considering the critical situation before a terrifying catastrophe, a massive strike suddenly distributing weapons led Anthony Reed to consider the possibility that it had been premeditated and was part of the impending catastrophe. The information broker produced a Louis door and instructed the informant, your intel is very important. Find an excuse not to go to the docks tomorrow and hide at home. Instinctively, the informant bit into the gleaming Louis door, bid Anthony read a cheerful farewell, and departed from Aubert's Du Coke door. Anthony wasted no time and swiftly descended to the second floor, arriving at Lumian's room. He knocked lightly on the wooden door of room 207, but as the sound reverberated, there was no movement inside. It was so silent, as if no one had lived there for a long time. Anthony Reed stopped and furrowed his brow. In the painting world, the westering sun cast its illumination on Rue Anarchy, keeping the sky bright. Lumian and Jenna hurried past the broken gas street lamps, sprinting toward Avenue du Marquet. They were uncertain when Room 7, where Voice and Sanson's family resided, would discover their teleportation destination. Their goal was to reach the black hole representing Sal de Ball Breeze before the other party could lock onto them again. This way, even if their other plans failed or couldn't be completed in time, they still had a final option, to enter the black hole and try their luck to see where they would appear. Thud. 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 Lumian led Jenna forward, and Avenue du Marquet came into view. He grabbed Jenna's shoulder and spewed crimson flames from his body, enveloping them both in a huge fireball. The fireball sped forward with incredible velocity. Lumian forcefully led Jenna across a distance of seven to eight meters towards the intersection of Rue Anarchy and Avenue du Marquet. During this process, Jenna, unlike Lumian, wasn't immune to the flames. Her hair and skin singed, but she didn't struggle violently. Instead, she shrank her body and created frost to resist the crimson flames, easing the pain. In the blink of an eye, they reached the edge of Avenue du Marquet. From there, they had a clear view of Sal de Ball Breeze in the distance and the pitch black darkness. This allowed Lumian to identify his destination without needing coordinates. What he saw was where they'd arrive. The black mark on his right shoulder emitted a dim light once more. Spirit World Traversal In an instant, Lumian and Jenna appeared beside the darkness. At that moment, a crystal like wall materialized before them. It extended upward, enclosing the entire Sal de Ball breeze like a transparent lid. Lumian and Jenna subconsciously gazed up and saw two figures in the air. One was a young woman wearing a blue beret, a tied-up white shirt, and dark pants. Her beige vest was open, and her body was covered in paint. Her orange hair was short, and her yellow eyes were deep and ethereal, as if hiding a world. The other man, in his thirties, wore similar attire but with red pants for his lower body. He had gentle facial features, light eyebrows, and distant, ethereal blue eyes. He still held a thick paintbrush in his hand, with a palette of mostly used paint. Behind them, a pair of translucent dragonfly-like wings flapped gently, helping them hover in the air. Painters? Those pixies? Lumian and Jenna instantly speculated. The man looked at Lumian with surprise and spoke in a voice that seemed to come from afar, Welcome back to the hostel, Room 1. Room 1. Lumian's eyes froze. Room 1? Jenna couldn't help but turn to her companion in shock. Chapter 467 Old Bones Upon hearing the term Room 1, Lumian was genuinely surprised, even with his wealth of experiences. Seraphine and Gabriel had previously mentioned that the hostel had a total of 13 rooms, but room 1 had never been mentioned. It was as if it had never entered the hostel. Lumian had always found this to be a mysterious omission, suspecting that there were critical points hidden in this fact. To his amazement, the painter-dressed man, likely a pixie, now addressed him as room 1. This was beyond belief. Lumian was certain that the symbols on him were related to Mr. Fool and the entity known as Inevitability. They had nothing to do with the painter. While Termoboros, an evil god's angel, resided within him, it was fundamentally different from the hostile rooms like Seraphine's. 
they had different sources of power and were different forms of abode. At that moment, Lumian didn't waste time analyzing why the suspected pixie called him Room 1 or whether there was important information hidden in it. He knew one thing, unless he could quickly eliminate or control the two enemies in Madeira and take command of the Black Hole in the Sal de Balbreeze area, the hostile residents would undoubtedly notice the abnormality and rush their rooms to the scene, making the situation more complicated. Upon hearing Room 1, Jenna was equally shocked but she didn't question Lumian or waste time seeking answers. She retrieved the arrow of the bloodthirsty, made of obsidian, and plunged it into her chest, despite having used it only a few hours ago. At this point, she cared little about the accumulation of mutations in her body. Similarly, even if something was amiss with Seal, she would have to wait until they escaped before inquiring about it. As the arrow of the bloodthirsty pierced her chest, a dense black fog emanated from Jenna's back, forming a pair of colossal and rather illusory bat wings. With a powerful flap, she lunged for the woman in the blue beret and the man in red pants. Simultaneously, black flames gradually condensed in the witch's palm. The colossal bat wings extended from bottom to top, obscuring the painter's line of sight. The man in red pants swiftly turned his paintbrush around and dipped it in silver paint, drawing a menacing lightning bolt on his clothes. Silver-white lightning detached from the man's white shirt and struck Jenna's illusory membrane black wings, numbing her entire body with the crackling electrical energy. The dense black fog that had formed the bat wings was diminished by the lightning, and Jenna began to descend slowly as she lost control of her flight. In that critical moment, Lumian's form materialized in Madeira right behind the painter in red pants. Without the ability to fly or float, Lumian chose to teleport. Seeing Jenna use the arrow of the bloodthirsty to create wings of darkness and fly boldly towards the two presumed pixies, Lumian understood that his companion was likely drawing the enemy's attention and creating an opportunity for him to swiftly attack one of their targets. Which is rarely fought in such a manner. Ha! Ah. Lumian exclaimed as a pale yellow light resembling a stream of air, shot forth from his mouth and struck the man in red pants. Before the painter, who had just drawn lightning, could react or even realize that Lumian had appeared behind him, he closed his eyes and lost consciousness. Without suspension, he plummeted to the ground. The woman in the blue beret remained composed. Figures emerged in her eyes, as if they held a world within them. One of the figures traversed the boundaries of fiction and reality, moving from the realm of fantasy into the world within the painting. Dressed in a light blue dress with long, thick blonde hair and serene light blue eyes, Aurora. It was Aurora. Upon witnessing this, Lumian's resolve remained unwavering. His eyes burned with anger. Are you worthy of imagining Aurora? As he descended from the sky, crimson fireballs materialized around his body and were launched towards the woman in the blue beret. The woman extended her right hand and pressed it into the void. Her entire being suddenly turned illusory, her expression vacant and cold. Numerous fireballs landed on her, but they didn't detonate, as though there was nothing there. They passed through her figure and exploded nearby. At the same moment, the painter in red pants landed before Jenna with a distinct cracking sound. The excruciating pain brought him back from the unconscious state induced by Lumian's spell of harumph. He instinctively opened his eyes. Just as the woman in the blue beret dodged the explosion, she exited her peculiar state and flew toward Jenna, who was about to land. In an instant, she collided with Jenna, sending starlight and sparks flying like meteors. Crack! Jenna's body shattered into fragments transforming into mirror pieces that reflected the sunlight. Her form reappeared beside the profound darkness within Sal de Ball Breeze. Lumian descended with a whoosh, his feet landing heavily on the ground, his body swaying. At that very moment, the three of them, along with the woman in the blue beret, seemed to sense something. They turned their heads, casting their gazes towards the intersections leading into Avenue du Marquet. Women with detached dispositions, fleeting eyes, and indifferent expressions emerged from different directions. They were Room 12, Seraphine, and Room 7, which Lumian and Jenna had recently encountered. Gabriel followed closely behind Seraphine, 
his gaze growing increasingly vacant, his face contorted with agony. Jenna and Lumian felt a creeping unease, as if they were inexorably descending into an abyss. Suddenly, a hand extended from the darkness within Sal de Ball Breeze. It was a hand devoid of flesh and skin, composed of withered, yellowed bones stained with rust. In the enigmatic cave adorned with a colossal mural, the young painter altered his form and broke free from the skeletal palm's grasp. He existed in a state between reality and the spirit world, untouchable by anyone and unable to touch anyone. His only capacity was to observe as the empty space on the rock wall and the ground intersected, turning dark and viscous, akin to a bottomless swamp. At that moment, an incomplete skeleton, composed of dark red stained bones and rust, emerged from the swamp. The skeleton appeared to hail from ancient times. It extended its bony fingers into the oil painting on the rock wall, corresponding to the incomplete Sal de Ball breeze. Beneath it, more yellowed skeletons crawled out from the depths of the swamp. Some bore shattered iron-colored armor, others carried rusty weapons, a few were missing a third of their bodies, and some were devoid of their heads. In the market district, beneath Eglise St. Robert, within the Inquisition. In his office, Anguline de Fran, OIS, donned in a golden shirt, attentively observed his subordinates delivering intel one by one. A violent explosion in the direction of the Deep Valley Cloister. Abnormal activity detected underground. St. Vive Cathedral has issued an order to maintain maximum vigilance tonight. Someone at the docks is organizing a huge strike tomorrow morning and distributing weapons. There are also people organizing a march at the factories to the south. The purifiers had a vast network of informants, surpassing even the most prolific information brokers. The manifold reports concerning unusual events in various locations within the market district nearly made Angulim lose control of his expression. His facial muscles twitched ever so slightly. When it finally grew silent, and no more subordinates came in to report, Angulim stood up, adjusted his collar, picked up a substantial dossier, and slammed it onto the table. While doing so, the purifier deacon cursed silently, Hidden Blade, do you want me dead? Ever since Hidden Blade had informed him about Gardner Martin's collaboration with the Carbonari, the anomalies between the Carbonari and the Deep Valley Cloister, and the hostel's situation, various irregularities had emerged from every corner, relentlessly testing his nerves. Only a few hours had passed, but Angulim felt as though a tempest was gathering. Phew. Angulim exhaled and compiled the gathered intel, Hidden Blade's reports, and the questions she had requested clarification on into a single document. He pinned it to the wall with a thumbtack, hoping to discern any patterns or overlooked details. The purifier deacon's gaze roved the room. After some time, his eyes settled on one of the documents. Hidden Blade had inquired about the secret of Eglise St. Robert's old cemetery but hadn't received an answer. The old cemetery lay within the current Sal de Ball breeze. Angulim's heart stirred, and he resolved to seek answers to this question once more. It was one of the few things he could undertake at the moment. Blasted Hidden Blade, once this matter is resolved, if you don't leave the market district, I'll request a transfer. Angulim inwardly cursed as he hurried into the telegraph room, angrily composing a telegram. He intended to convey to the higher-ups that they shouldn't be overly strict about confidentiality classifications when it concerned intelligence. The sooner he could figure out the details, the sooner he could unearth the truth and forestall impending catastrophe. After a ten-minute wait, Angulim received a response, the old cemetery of Eglise St. Robert is situated above a node for the ceiling of Fourth Epic Trier. In the past, there was a breach that led to the release of some Fourth Epic deceased. Subsequently, it was reinforced, and the situation was contained. When the sealing system for the catacombs replaced such nodes, the old cemetery lost its significance and wasn't retained. Chapter 468, Q&A Game Eglise St. Robert's old cemetery had once served as 4th Epic Trier's node for the seal. However, leaks had occurred, allowing the ancient dead to crawl out. Angulim carefully considered the information and felt that there might be hidden dangers lurking beneath Sal de Ball Breeze. He returned to the office and fixed his gaze on the piece of paper pinned to the wall. 
the paper not only clearly detailed Hidden Blade's previous inquiry about the old cemetery's secret but also provided the circumstances under which she had made the inquiry. This was all part of their investigation into the sick church case. Their goal was to uncover the reasons behind the unusual quietness of Trier's heretics and their activities as though they had gone into hiding for some massive endeavor. Hidden Blade suspects that the old cemetery's secret is somehow linked to the heretics' plans? They aim to use the former leakage point to bypass the seal and open the door to Fourth Epic Trier? Angulim, with his experience, immediately connected the dots. Entering the telegraph room, he informed the higher ups of his theory and made a recommendation. Send one or two teams underground to investigate the original leakage point as soon as possible, preferably led by saints. After sending the telegram, Angulim breathed a sigh of relief. His next task was to assemble his team and coordinate with the police, military police, and army to prevent the protests from escalating into riots before dawn. This process would inevitably lead to clashes with members of the Iron and Blood Cross Order and the Carbonari. Beyonders would also be involved. Additionally, as 007, Angulin needed to find an opportunity to contact Hidden Blade and share the secret of the old cemetery with her. There was no more time for casual chats in the Telegram group, he had to activate their prearranged practical approach. Apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Seal is missing too. After informing Madame Judgment and Demoness of Black about Gardner Martin's abnormality, Franca returned to the market district, only to realize that Jenna, who should have been asleep in bed, had vanished. Before she could inspect the house, Anthony Reed, with his buzz cut, visited late at night and reported that Lumian had mysteriously vanished. There were no signs of a fight at the scene. Yes, Anthony Reed was even more certain that something was amiss. It wasn't Lumian switching to a safe house for sleep. There are no signs of a struggle here either. Franca walked to the guest bedroom door and looked at the lifted blanket. She could tell that Jenna had taken her time before leaving. Not only had she removed her pajamas and changed into her female mercenary attire, but she hadn't messed up the bedroom. Franca furrowed her brow, pondering the possible reasons. Although she knew this was a serious matter, she still habitually complained inwardly, why does it seem like my girlfriend ran off with my boyfriend? Amidst her thoughts, she remembered that Jenna hadn't handed over the grayish-white cloth bag she had obtained from the cyborg monk to the strange boy, Will. Franca immediately turned her gaze to the coffee table, recalling that it had originally been there. Seeing the grayish-white cloth bag vanish, the demoness of pleasure heaved a sigh of relief. Jenna must have been notified by the strange boy, Will, to deliver the mission item somewhere and collect the corresponding reward. And why did Seal disappear? Could it be that Will's request was for Seal to accompany her? Yes, after all, he was invited by Seal's major arcana card holder, Madam Magician. Doesn't seem like a terrible thing? Anthony Reed keenly sensed Franca's change in state. So far, that's the case. Franca produced a palm sized mirror. I'll use magic mirror divination to confirm. She retrieved Jenna's pajamas and caressed the mirror with her free hand. Simultaneously, she recited in Hermes, Celia Bello's current location, Celia Bello's current location. Although the name Jenna could also be used for divination, as Jenna had been using this stage name for a long time, and most people around her called her that, Franca felt that it would be more accurate to use her real name at a time like this. In the gaslit living room of the apartment, the lights dimmed and the environment became oppressive. The mirror's surface emitted an aqueous light, as if it had sunk into the depths of a river. However, Franca saw nothing. Snowflakes kept appearing in the mirror like noise. The divination yielded no results. Franca frowned again. Could it be because of the presence of the strange boy, Will? However, after handing over the mission item and obtaining the lucky gold coin, Jenna should have separated from Will. They shouldn't have been together for more than five minutes. Theoretically, it can't be such a coincidence. Franca was cautious. We'll try again in five minutes. Anthony Reed nodded gently and asked, Do you need me to go to Aubert's du Coke door and retrieve one of Seal's clothes? No need. Franca shook her head without hesitation. 
that fellow bears Mr. Fool's seal and the aura of the Blood Emperor. It would be strange if I could gain anything from divination. Time ticked by, and finally, five minutes passed. Franca used the simple magic mirror divination to inquire about Jenna's location once again. There was still no answer, and no scene appeared. That's not right. Franca immediately switched to the complete magic mirror divination form of praying to certain entities. In the dark mirror, an aged voice echoed, accompanied by the sound of water. Celia Bello is in an undetectable location. Undetectable. Franca began to feel that the problem might be more complicated and troublesome than she had guessed, so she asked, Where is Lumian Lee now? Amidst the sound of water, the aged voice replied, I can't see, I can't see. The voice gradually faded into confusion and disorder. Franca hastily ended magic mirror divination. She paced back and forth, feeling that she had to report this matter to Madame Judgment. But before that, Franca clenched her teeth and said to Anthony Reed, I want to use magic mirror divination to pray to an unknown and hidden entity. The results of his divination are the most precise. Perhaps it can help us obtain an answer, but you have to swear to the god of steam and machinery not to divulge everything you hear later. No problem. Anthony, clad in military green attire, gestured a triangular sacred emblem on his chest. After Anthony swore an oath to the deity he believed in, Franca didn't hesitate. She lit three candles in a ritualistic manner and extinguished the gas wall lamps in the room. In the dim light, her right hand caressed the mirror's surface three times as she recited an honorific name in Hermes. Eyes that watch all living beings, the stigmata from the primordial land, the omniscient one who serves the fool, the great erodes. The glass of the makeup mirror darkened, fluctuating and enshrouding at times, emitting aqueous light. As a psychiatrist, Anthony Reed suddenly felt a strong sense of unease, as if a pair of eyes had scanned him from top to bottom. Franca finished her preparations and asked, Where's my friend, Celia Bello, now? In the mirror, an aqueous light flickered, revealing an image, it was a mind that was too blurry to see the details clearly. Immediately after, the scene shifted, revealing a portion of Avenue du Marquet. Franca recognized it immediately as the Salle de Ball Breeze area, but the building didn't exist. Instead, it was replaced by a dark and crystal-like barrier. Jenna, dressed in a light blue dress, stood beside the barrier, her expression solemn as she observed an unrevealed part of the scene. Beside her was a figure suspected to be Lumian. As expected, they're together. Where is this place? Just as these thoughts crossed Franca's mind, she saw a few lines of ancient Faisak words dripping with blood appear on the mirror. Based on the principle of reciprocity, it's my turn to ask a question. If you answer incorrectly or lie, you will be punished. Franca closed her eyes, waiting for the question to be raised. The blood-red letters formed another sentence. Have you ever fantasized about doing Triurian's favorite activity with Jenna? Thankfully. Franca breathed a sigh of relief. The shame of this question depended on Jenna's presence. If she were present, Franca would rather slam her head against a wall. But now, there was only one psychiatrist watching. Is there a problem with telling a psychiatrist that I have a psychological problem and like women, my good friend, so much so that I want to do that with her? Franca couldn't help but blush, but she replied smoothly, I did. Anthony Reed, who was observing, wasn't surprised at all. As a spectator, if he didn't discover Franca's abnormal feelings and thoughts about Jenna, it could only mean that he wasn't up to standard. He hadn't expected Franca to be relatively calm and not ashamed. Franca then asked the magic mirror, where's the Avenue du Marque where Jenna currently is? This time, there was no scene in the magic mirror. Instead, bright red terms appeared, a world in a painting. A world in a painting. Painter, Pixie. Franca immediately made a connection and a guess. On the mirror's surface, bloody words distorted and squirmed, forming new words, based on the principle of reciprocity, it's my turn to ask a question. Have you ever fantasized about doing Triurian's favorite activity with Lumian Lee? Dot. Franca's face burned. She could feel the temperature rising. I, I haven't. 
She subconsciously wanted to respond, but then she remembered the pain of being struck by lightning. She gazed at the magic mirror, striving to forget that there was a psychiatrist beside her. Her lips quivered as she replied, I, I have. Sometimes, just occasionally. I can't control myself in my dreams. Anthony Reed didn't allow his gaze to shift to Franca's face, nor did he allow his expression to change. It was as if what he saw and heard was ordinary. This was the basic professionalism of a psychiatrist. Franca hurriedly concluded magic mirror divination and entered the master bedroom. She organized information on Lung Mian, Jenna's disappearance, and the magic mirror divination's response into written information and reported it to Madame Judgment. After completing this matter and returning to the living room, she was about to discuss the situation with Anthony Reed when she heard a rumbling sound from the northwest of Trier. It was as if multiple cannons were firing. Chapter 469 Reinforcements Cartier Arast, Trier's Garrison Encampment Under the dim moonlight, a significant number of soldiers poured out of various buildings. They organized into teams with remarkable precision, either firing cannons at the distant roadblocks or shouldering rifles as they advanced toward Avenue du Boulevard in coordinated squads. Among them were combatants equipped with steam-powered backpacks and massive firearms, strategically positioning themselves on elevated vantage points and in concealed spots. Inside a building within the camp, Albus, his hair appearing to be dyed red, sat confidently in an officer's chair, his legs casually crossed at the edge of the table before him. In his field of vision, disembodied heads dangled by bloody spines, almost like they had extended tails. These severed heads soared toward headless bodies clad in blue soldier coats adorned with golden threads. They aimed for the vacant necks, inserting their bloodstained spines with precision. Crack! They completed their integration simultaneously, twisting left and right to acclimate themselves to their new hosts. The freshly created soldiers promptly retrieved their weapons and charged out in an orderly formation, following mysterious directives. Albus Medici clicked his tongue and remarked, This is quite the reminiscent sight. Will this night turn into a bloodbath? Beyond the multitude of towering steeples and the golden hued buildings, Magician and Justice were alerted by the distant rumble of cannons. An early uprising? Magician, dressed in a crisp white collared shirt and a beige dress, gazed with starlight in her eyes, as if she had glimpsed through the veils of the spirit world and witnessed the turmoil at the military encampment. Her prior astromancy predictions had suggested that the catastrophe was still some time away. However, when Jenna caught the cyborg monk and discovered their ties to the heretics and job of transporting paints and brushes, it was evident that destiny had shifted, setting the illusory gears into motion prematurely. The catastrophe had begun without proper preparation. Justice, garbed in a light blue dress, listened to the booming cannons and responded with a composed tone. Given the scale, it's clear that this won't topple Entis's current government. It can only incite a certain degree of temporary chaos. Could there be strikes, protests, marches, riots, and other forms of civil unrest colliding? These are the strengths of the Iron and Blood Cross Order and the Carbonari. Perhaps Gardner Martin and some of his associates went into hiding to spark the flames, but it appears their coordination isn't strong enough. Without effective collaboration, they can't establish a connection. Magician's gaze shifted toward the southeastern region, where Cartier de la Cathedral Commemorative, the Market District, and Cartier du Jardin Botanique were situated. Justice nodded in agreement and added, This means that our efforts have yielded results. They were compelled to accelerate their plans. It's impressive they accomplished such a feat given these circumstances. As soon as she finished speaking, the doll messenger, dressed in a light gold gown, materialized from the void and handed the letter from judgment to magician. Good evening, Miss Justice. A good day to you, the messenger cheerfully greeted Justice. She was a misophobic, obsessive-compulsive creature from the spirit world with a penchant for beauty, and Miss Justice was the embodiment of her preferences. On the other hand, her employer had many shortcomings that she found intolerable. Therefore, she often took on additional tasks herself. 
This, however, had built a strong bond of closeness and trust between them. Magician unfolded the letter and quickly scanned its contents. Her expression underwent a subtle change. A world in a painting. Did Erodes use the lucky gold coin and the full seal on Lumian to gain a vague glimpse of the scenes within the painting world? Partial glimpses of Avenue du Marque. After murmuring to herself, Magician turned to Justice and said, I have a rough understanding of what those heretics are after and why they are utilizing the hostel's form and the essence of its rooms. We can't afford to waste any more time. Let's take action now. Control or eliminate Lady Moon before we search for the painting world. Justice nodded. Agreed. She then smiled and added, We should place our trust in our comrades and collaborators. Very well. Magician took a step toward the Sacred Heart Cloister, her beige dress hem billowing in the breeze. She raised her hands, and a constellation of resplendent stars materialized around her. They appeared both distant and densely packed, converging to create a night sky over the highlands. The countless stars cast their radiance upon the surface of the Sacred Heart Cloister. With a determined effort, Magician lifted the void in front of her, as if bearing a heavy burden. Amidst the tumultuous yet silent vibrations, the Sacred Heart Cloister, along with its myriad steeples and the ground beneath it, was projected into a pitch-black void. Fierce hurricanes and layers of darkness encircled them. Almost simultaneously, brilliant sunbeams illuminated the interconnected buildings, as if conjuring thousands of miniature suns. They resisted the encroaching darkness, striving to reveal the concealed void. Magician and Justice vanished, reappearing in a space that seemed to bend in contract, forming a dark sphere. Close by, a crouching golden retriever activated psychological invisibility, carefully observing her surroundings and maintaining the highest level of vigilance. Painting World, Avenue du Marque From the darkness that corresponded to Sal de Ball Breeze, dark red and rust-stained yellow skeletons emerged. They exuded a palpable aura of death and the strong scent of rust and blood hung heavy in the air. When gathered together, they created and intensified a frenzied and violent atmosphere. This sensation was tangible, immediately shaking the crystal barrier enveloping the darkness. It produced numerous cracks before silently collapsing. Witnessing this horrifying scene, the woman in the white halter dress who had brought the Sansons to Avenue du Marque in the various rooms with similar auras to Seraphine's brought over, certain words spoken by the doll messenger flashed through Lumian's mind. Those old bones! With a swift thought, he seized Jenna's arm with his left hand and immersed his consciousness into his right palm. Bright red scars reappeared, and an exceptionally violent, maddening, and domineering aura surged from his body, causing the blue sky white clouds, and the setting sun to visibly quiver. Even Seraphine and the other rooms, despite their experience, were taken aback and couldn't help but shudder. The two pixies outside were even more terrified, convinced that a formidable presence had descended and that the painting world was on the brink of collapse. The yellowish, ragged, and incomplete old bones creaked and turned, bowing their heads in unison to Lumian they refrained from instinctively attacking the nearest humans. Lumian raised his chin slightly and pointed his right hand with an icy determination at the rooms and the two pixies. The old bones, clad in tattered armor and brandishing rusty weapons, transformed into dangerous incandescent fireballs that exploded towards every genuine target. The blue beret-wearing pixie's pupils dilated, and she abruptly extended her palm into the void. Her form turned ethereal once more, suffused with even greater emptiness and indifference, as if she had hidden herself in another realm. Boom! The white-hot fireball merged with her form, resulting in a powerful explosion, but it couldn't reach the distant fantasy world and harm its intended target. The painter, donned in red pants, had suffered a severe fall, with fractured bones and a lingering sense of dizziness. There was no time to change his condition. His only option was to attempt a rapid repositioning, employing the maximum speed a sequence 8 could muster. Yet, just as he sprang to his feet, he was struck by a blazing white fireball. Boom! The pixie was left in a gory state from the explosion. His abdomen was torn open, internal organs spilled out, and his left arm severed. 
severe burn marks covered his body. He lost consciousness, his life ebbing away. The incandescent white fireball hurtling towards Seraphine and Gabriel suddenly veered into the wilderness, distancing itself from the indifferent and vacant human models by several hundred meters. The farther it flew, the weaker it became. After enduring for a hundred to two hundred meters, it eventually touched the ground and exploded. Perhaps the most dangerous factor was the woman in the white halter dress, with curly black hair and a beautiful face. She appeared soulless as multiple blazing white fireballs were aimed at her. However, the hazardous fireballs either bypassed the raised palms of the human model or exploded prematurely in a strange manner. Some even ascended into the air and transmuted into fireworks. It was akin to Room 7 being impervious to attack. Not far from Seraphine, there stood a stunning woman in a bright red dress. Her eyes held a vacant quality, and her aura appeared somewhat detached. At that moment, she watched a blazing white fireball hurtling toward her like a meteor, remaining utterly motionless. The blazing white fireball grew fainter and smaller. Just as it was about to collide with its target, it completely extinguished and reverted to a yellowish skeleton holding a rusty spear. The skeleton swayed a few times before disintegrating, the withering sensation becoming more pronounced. In the cafe diagonally opposite, an elegant plump lady in a black dress materialized. On one hand, she seemed to have lost her vitality and appeared unusually ethereal. On the other hand, she displayed a yearning expression and gaze. She opened her mouth as the incandescent white fireball approached and raised her hands, clutching a silver knife and fork. With a whoosh, she sliced the blazing white fireball in half. An illusory vortex filled with fanged phantoms formed in her mouth, devouring a portion of the fireball, neutralizing the threat. Boom! Most of the fireballs lost their course and veered off, shattering the cafe's glass and toppling tables, chairs, and nearby outer walls. Beside the darkness of Sal de Ball Breeze, Lumian watched the old bones transform into blazing white fireballs, attacking the various rooms and the two pixies. He didn't wait to see the final outcome or seize an opportunity to launch a surprise attack. He grabbed Jenna's arm, kicked with his right foot, and lunged towards Sal de Ball Breeze's original location, where the old bones had emerged. Chapter 470 Three heads, six arms. Lumian and Jenna plunged into the darkness, the area that should have been Sal de Ball Breeze before the hostel's rooms and the blue berade pixie could escape the entanglement of old bones. His vision plunged into darkness before specks of spiritual light emerged ahead. They converged like resplendent stars, turning densely packed, akin to a black velvet curtain adorned with diamonds or countless grains of sand and water. Amidst these spiritual lights, an ancient, heavy, illusory, and mysterious door materialized in distortion. Iron black, its surface marred by dark red rust, as if a large amount of blood had spilled upon it. An underground trier, within the undetectable mine. In his untouchable state, the painter witnessed yellowed skeletons clamoring into the colossal oil painting on the rock wall. Iron black and dark red lines outlined themselves in the previously empty Sal de Ball breeze, forming a door that shouldn't exist in reality. It's not time yet, not time yet. The painter, with tassels adorning his trouser legs, stared blankly, unable to believe such a development. Though he and his accomplices had been attempting to depict this imaginary door, they knew it was destined to fail. At most, they would complete a fifth of it before having to start anew. They persisted for the experience, anticipating that once the ritual commenced, they could draw the crucial parts swiftly. Having already finished the main part of the hostile oil painting, they had nothing else to do. Why not try a few more times? What if a miracle occurred? Now, a miracle unfolded without their attempts. The painter gazed at the transformation before him, a mix of anticipation and shock. He couldn't help but look up at the cave ceiling and silently mutter. Do we not need cooperation from above ground to make the entrance appear? Could the abnormality in the painting world be causing this? If we don't coordinate with the surface in time, even if the entrance appears, we won't be able to bypass the seal and enter. 
Lumian and Jenna descended as if through a dark pipe, uncontrollably approaching the void adorned with spiritual specks of light and the bloodied, rusted door. Almost simultaneously, Lumian's left chest heated up, and terrifying ravings echoed in his ears from an infinite height and distance. Familiar with this sensation, indicating the corruption of inevitability in his body, Lumian knew Termoboros was up to something, and Mr. Fool's seal had been triggered. However, unlike before, Lumian refrained from attempting to crack the seal to steal inevitability's power. Consequently, he didn't enter a state of excruciating pain, just a bit dazed. In his daze, Lumian saw Seraphine, Room 7, clad in a white halter dress. Other rooms with varied appearances and attire, yet nearly identical dispositions, seemed to detach from the painting world and overlap with the fake Avenue du Marque. The left chests of these rooms emitted a faint glow, suggesting they too had seals on them. Lumian's head spun as a scene, whether real or fake, unfolded before him. Seraphine and the other twelve rooms stepped into the void and surrounded him, invisible and hidden connections intertwining. Jenna, arm clutched by Lumian, sensed something and turned her head. Flesh on Lumian's left and right shoulders writhed as two illusory heads emerged. One head looked like a ten-year-old Lumian, covered in dirt, and his eyes filled with ruthlessness. The other, nearly thirty, with blood-red hair and iron-black eyes, looked violent and crazy. W.H., Jenna felt as if she had entered a nightmare, witnessing her companion transform into a monster. Lumian's body expanded, gripping Jenna like a palm-sized puppet. Behind him, illusory arms sprouted from his ribs. Lumian didn't neglect the changes in his body. He saw his current form in Jenna's eyes. A three-headed, six-armed giant. It bore a striking resemblance to the monster in Cordu's ruins. However, Lumian didn't lose his mind. He was certain the fool's seal on his chest and Termoboros were still intact. An illusory collision reverberated as Lumian crashed into the ancient, heavy, and mysterious door, causing it to tremble and creak. It was about to open. At that moment, the spiritual spots on the black velvet curtain lit up, stabilizing the iron-black door stained with blood and rust. Witnessing and experiencing this, Lumian suddenly grasped what hostile was, why they referred to him as Room One, and the heretic's intentions and plans. The concept of hostile likely emerged after the Tree of Shadow disaster. At some point, Maipu Meyer, ostracized, established contact with other cults, informing them of Lumian's existence and state. They imitated the situation where an evil god's blessed was sealed within Lumian's body, creating hostile rooms 2 to 13. They invited various evil gods blessed to take up residence, establishing a mystical connection among them based on this systematic similarity. When Lumian entered the painting world, actions taken on the other rooms of Hostel were equivalent to acts on Lumian. When the Hostel took shape and all the rooms were pieced together, Lumian couldn't help but be affected. Since the rooms displayed the levels of their residence, Lumian underwent a corresponding change. The resident within him was an angel, Termoboros. After the mysticism-based hostile ritual, Lumian, lacking the strength of an angel or a true mythical creature form, had briefly attained the level of an angel. This explained why Voice and Sanson and company didn't leave the room and attacked Lumian directly. Termoboros was sealed, so they naturally wanted him too. They had to maintain this state until the ritual ended. Of course, the heretics weren't kind enough to help Lumian experience the state of an inevitability angel. Their goal was to use this opportunity to enter Fourth Epic Trier. Opening the door using an angel's level. Hence, the hostel had to align with some areas of the market district and exhibit environmental similarities. Lumian speculated that the Sal de Ball Breeze's underground corresponded to a weak spot in the seal. In the past, there had even been problems. Many old bones, guided by Alista Tudor's aura, had crawled out. The corruption leaked, affecting 13, Avenue du Marque. This made Lumian wonder if his arrival in the market district and his stay at Aubert's du Coke door had something to do with the attraction the underground area had on hunters. Due to this crucial information, the Salle de Ball breeze in the painting world remained blank and dark. The streets surrounding it and the people who often appeared nearby were replicated in appearance. 
When the corresponding ritual truly commenced, the surfaces market district and the underground market district would likely undergo a switch. Reality would become a fabrication, and fabrication would become reality, revealing or outlining the seal corresponding to Sal de Ball Breeze, weakening it to the extreme. When the time came, Lumian, an angel, could open the door to Fourth Epic Trier. My Pooh Myers returned to the market district aimed to harness his actor abilities, acting as different individuals. He would enter various houses and assist Pixies in grasping the specifics of these streets to complete the massive painting of Hostel. Worried that Lumian, Franca, and others would notice in advance, he avoided their rooms, lacking sufficient knowledge. Looking at the mysterious door beneath him, Lumian tried to distance himself, but he couldn't break free. It was as if a huge magnet was sucking him, now an angel, behind the door, causing him to involuntarily squeeze inside. Thanks to countless spots of spirituality in the surrounding darkness, the ancient door, stained with blood and rust, didn't open. Lumian sensed that this was because the hostile ritual hadn't fully commenced. He and Jenna had barged into the painting world ahead of time, disrupting the heretic's arrangements. Now, if the hostile ritual was to be completed and the surface and underground switched, there were at least two key points that couldn't be matched. Firstly, the subterranean seal, which could only be released by destroying Trier and eliminating most of the people here, now had the switch between reality and fabrication, a temporary acquisition of an angelic level, and the discovery of weakness in the seal, thus, the requirement could be significantly reduced. However, lowering the requirement further would necessitate a riot bringing chaos to the surface trier. Secondly, it was afternoon in the painting world, and the sun was only westering. The sky was still bright, but in reality, it was the middle of the night. The moonlight was dim, and the darkness was dense. Avenue du Marquet, Market District In a double-breasted brown coat, Anguline de Fran, OIS noted the secret of Eglise St. Robert's old cemetery on paper, placing it in the safe house provided by Hidden Blade, hoping she would discover it in time. The purifier deacon guided his robot toward Imra and Valentine, who awaited near Sal de Ball Breeze. At that moment, the rumbling salvos reached his ears. Instinctively, he turned his head to see Trier's sky illuminated by flames. An army rebellion? Anguline furrowed his brow. Now, most purifiers from the diocese were dispersed to quell strikes, marches, and protests after daybreak. Unexpectedly, trouble arose in the military camp. Was news of the massive strike deliberately sent to us, forcing a dispersion of forces and making it impossible for us to organize manpower to resolve the problem in a short period of time? A conspiracy by the Iron and Blood Cross Order? Angulim instantly had a suspicion. In Cartier Arast, a wilderness emerged from the sacred heart cloister that had been thrown into turbulence and darkness. Lady Moon's voice resonated, her smile evident as she addressed magician and justice, you might not have guessed who's sheltering us this time. Before she could finish, the sound of a baby crying echoed. Wah! The baby's cries were vibrant, bringing forth endless golden sunlight. The entire sacred heart cloister transformed into a blazing sun piercing through the turbulent storm and distorting space. In the real trier, the still-sleeping citizens were jolted awake by the sunlight. In apartment 601, Franca and Anthony Reed instinctively looked up at the suddenly bright sky. A dazzling golden sun hung in the sky, positioned to the west. Chapter 471, Topsy-Turvy Angulim, racing towards Eglise St. Robert with Imra and Valentine to gather more intel and receive the latest orders, suddenly found himself blinded by sunlight. It was as though he had been shrouded in darkness for too long, struggling to adapt to the sudden brightness. After a few moments, he and his teammates gazed skyward. In Trier, where it had been late at night, the scene had transformed into a sunny afternoon. Feeling the warmth of the sun, Angulim couldn't shake off the chill crawling down his spine. He sensed that the problem had escalated dramatically, and a catastrophe loomed on the horizon. In the blink of an eye, a series of explosions echoed from the wrist docks, Le Marquet du Cartier du Gentleman, Suet's steam locomotive station, and the nearby depot and warehouses. Thunderous rumbles echoed through the air. 
Even from a distance, Angulim and his comrades witnessed the crimson flames and burning structures. Gunshots, salvos, and shouts pierced through the chaos. The entire market district plunged into anarchy. Is Cartier Arrest's military rebellion thinning triers beyond their forces to support the insurrection in the market district? This can't be the same group responsible for the earlier docks and factory strikes at dawn. What is happening? Angulim's expression hardened as he changed course, hastening towards the epicenter of the most intense explosions. Imra and Valentine followed closely behind. In Sal de Ball Breeze, the cafe on the second floor, Gardner Martin donned his silver-white full-body armor and positioned himself by the window. A smirk played on his lips as he observed Angulim de Fran, OIS and his team departing the area. The leader of the Savoy mob could already envision the chaos unfolding at the wrist docks, Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman, and other key locations. Without reservation, he unveiled the hidden might of the Iron and Blood Cross Order in the market district, aiming to sell maximum chaos in the shortest time possible. Whether it was Blood Palm Black overseeing Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman, Vincent Lorraine at the wrist docks, Parsifal managing the depot, or Faustino, the infiltrator at Suet's steam locomotive station, each was leading a team in acts of arson, detonating explosives, and unleashing indiscriminate destruction and carnage. Fortunately, we were well prepared. Even if we had to expedite our plans, we can still complete the corresponding ritual, Gardner Martin remarked to Supervisor Olson, standing not far behind him. Olson, resembling a starving bear, clutched his small brown suitcase, his voice indifferent as he inquired, You didn't eliminate the demoness? Gardner Martin grinned. No need to waste effort on such a foolish demoness. She poses no real threat. Moreover, taking her down would be time-consuming, and you're aware of their formidable survivability. It might cause us to miss the crucial moment. As for the others causing trouble, I dispatched Albus to the military camp in Cartier Arast. Lumian. At the mention of Lumian, Gardner Martin's smile broadened. He lifted the visor of his helmet, peering out the window once more. Under the brilliant sunlight, the flames of Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman painted the sky crimson. Shouts, cries, gunshots, and explosions reverberated through the air. Gardner Martin tilted his chin upward, closed his eyes, and contentedly awaited the unfolding climax of the play. The ritual was on the brink of completion. In the painting world, the westering sun in the sky assumed a heightened realism, its glow merging with the faint shadow in an uncanny dance. Similar transformations unfolded across every structure. Vendors and pedestrians on the streets ceased to be lifeless figures, now frantically darting about in pandemonium, desperately seeking refuge. The subterranean market district and its surface counterpart gradually transitioned into tangible existence. One was now bathed in flames like an oil painting, and the two began to mirror each other, interweaving as projections in the spirit world. Suddenly, like illusory objects flipping upside down, the painted market district emerged on the surface, severing its complete seal with the rest of Trier. The authentic market district had transformed into a mural within the cave, linked to the underground. In the actual Trier, Sal de Ball Breeze existed in darkness, mitigating the effects of the seal. Within that darkness, the three-headed, six-armed giant, Lumian, adhered to the enigmatic door. With a resonant creak, it slowly swung open, stained with blood and red rust, revealing a crevice seemingly ablaze with invisible flames. Rumble. Trier shuddered in its entirety, and the sunlit sky descended into a twilight adorned with fiery clouds. Cartier Arast, Red Swan Castle. Count Poufer, roused from his slumber, snapped awake in the midst of a dream. Bloodstained sunlight filtered through the thick curtains, accompanied by cruel and frenzied screams. The beige castle, adorned with ancient bloodstains, trembled violently, as if a colossal entity beneath the ground clung to its foundations. Poufer felt a summoning and a magnetic pull from the depths of his soul. Excitement painted his expression as he hastily vacated his bed and dashed out of the bedroom. In his frantic haste, he disregarded slippers and eschewed a change from his dark red cotton robe. Barefoot, he sprinted down the corridor, the hem of his robe swinging behind him. How many nights had he yearned for this awakening? 
it signified the long-awaited recognition from the remnant spirit of his ancestor, the fulfillment of the prophecy by the mysterious leader of the secret order, and the dawn of hope for the Sauron family to reclaim their strength. It meant the end of the curse that haunted the other Saurons and the promise of rebirth. Count Pufer understood the potential consequences for himself, but he faced the situation without flinching or hesitation. Hadn't every member of the Sauron family, choosing to reside in Red Swan Castle and not relocating after reaching adulthood, been mentally prepared for this moment? To become the vessel for their ancestor's resurrection, to merge with him, was an honor for every Sauron family member. Descending the stairs, Count Pufer entered the underground maze. In the darkness behind him, a figure emerged from the vicinity adjacent to the stairs. It was Elrose, donned in beige hunting attire with her long auburn hair tied into a ponytail. The girl, bearing both the Sauron and Einhorn bloodlines, followed her cousin at a steady pace, her presence silent yet profound. In apartment 601, three rue de Blouse's Blanches, in the market district. Franca and Anthony Reed found themselves momentarily bewildered as they witnessed the sun appearing and hanging low in the west. It's past 2 a.m. What sun could there be? What was going on? Why was this strange phenomenon happening? Their thoughts were abruptly shattered by the reverberations of explosions and gunshots in the market district. Anthony visibly trembled, instinctively attempting to dodge the unforeseen onslaught. Fortunately, having chosen to remain in Trier earlier, he managed to regain control more effectively than in past episodes. A shared glance exchanged between Franca and Anthony revealed surprise, confusion, and underlying worry. Has the catastrophe struck? Anthony Reed queried in a deep, resonant voice. Franca, brow furrowed, mused, but according to Bouvard's corpse's prophecy, the catastrophe was accompanied by rain and water, and now. Before she could complete her sentence, her spirituality alerted her to something outside the window. An unmistakable phantom materialized in the building opposite, the two figures overlapping and swiftly parting ways. Simultaneously, a wave of dizziness enveloped Franca, as if she had plunged weightlessly and failed to utilize an assassin's feather fall. Anthony Reed experienced a similar sensation. He spoke solemnly, indiscriminately affecting everyone. The effect of a ritual? A ritual to trigger the catastrophe? Just as Franca considered suggesting leaving the apartment to approach the Fool's Cathedral at the Lavini docks for a clearer understanding, her attention was drawn to the abrupt changes in two items tucked within her hidden pockets. She quickly made a judgment based on the locations they were located. One was the palm-sized primordial demoness figurine, which, even through clothing, exuded an abnormal coldness. The other was the ancient silver mirror from the underground, an object connected to a peculiar mirror world. It trembled subtly, as if stirred or resonating with the current environment and nearby objects. W.H., Franca's eyes narrowed. Coupled with the simultaneous movements of the two items, she suspected the presence of a high-level beyonder of the demoness pathway nearby. In the sacred heart cloister, now transformed into a sun, the continuous cries of an infant filled the air. The cries unsettled Madame Magician with a starlit visage, causing a multitude of door-shaped insects to crawl in and out. Miss Justice, her skin covered in grayish-white scales, was compelled to placate herself. The piercing sunlight forced the two major arcana card holders to instinctively shut their eyes. Before them, voids intersected, and layers of starlight blocked the spreading flames into the distance. They recognized the incoming force all too well. It was the divine power of the eternal blazing sun. Although this true god hadn't physically descended from the spirit world into reality, Lady Moon, who had nurtured a deity, and the newborn baby she held, indirectly channeled some of his strength. The power of a god. Magician and justice, though struggling to endure, remained composed. They knew they weren't alone. Upon discovering Lady Moon's hideout in the Sacred Heart Cloister, they had anticipated the worst-case scenario. On the Blue Avenger at the Lavini docks, the hanged man Alger, adorned in a sailor's attire with dark blue hair, positioned himself at the bow of the ship. Witnessing the sudden brightening of the sky and the sun hanging low in the west, a mix of worry and excitement washed over him. Swiftly, he retrieved an item from his possession. 
it was a card featuring Emperor Roselle with raised hands and a papal tiara adorning his head. Behind him, the depiction showcased lightning, violent winds, and tumultuous waves. The Tyrant Card One of the cards of blasphemy crafted by Emperor Roselle. The hanged man Alger had made a special trip to Trier, abstaining from involvement in operations elsewhere, anticipating the worst calamity. Through prior communication, pre-installed imprints, and adept prayers, as a saint of the sailor pathway, he possessed the ability to employ the tyrant card. This allowed him to temporarily harness someone's power, enabling resistance against the sun and the sky without jeopardizing the stability of the astral world. Whoosh! As Alger bowed his head in prayer, the tyrant card illuminated, causing Trier's sky to darken. Countless water droplets descended to the ground beneath the sunlight. Rain, a deluge of torrential rain. Chapter 472, Weather In the midst of the torrential rain, the hanged man Alger concluded his prayer. His body involuntarily straightened, and his head snapped up. The tyrant card in his hand suddenly thickened and brightened, transforming into a luminous book. The pages of the book rapidly flipped, revealing various forms of Emperor Roselle. He alternated between the attire of a sailor, sporting a nautical hat, and singing with head held high amidst the waves. The scene settled on the emperor donned in a papal tiara and a pontiff's robe. His interaction with the dim sky summoned a colossal bolt of lightning, piercing through the clouds. Rumble. Amidst the thunderclaps, the illusory figure of Emperor Roselle merged with the hanged man Alger. His demeanor abruptly became dignified, and the Srenzo River around the Blue Avenger instantaneously calmed, resembling a windless lake. Adorning the papal tiara and draping the pontiff's robe, the hanged man Alger conjured a silver staff condensed from lightning. Stepping forward, he ascended into the sky, surrounded by the wind. Rumble. Above Trier, thunder roared, and a visible hurricane swept up myriad dark clouds, forming a colossal, dark, and ominous vortex. Within the vortex, dense bolts of lightning of various hues intertwined, extending out to shroud the blazing sun in the west. Whoosh! The rain, like an open faucet, cascaded into every nook of Trier, creating a misty fog that enveloped everything. In the blink of an eye, a layer of water covered the ground, illuminated by both sunlight and lightning. The citizens, roused by the morning sunlight, now felt an impending apocalypse as they stared at the pitch-black backdrop untouched by the blazing sunlight and snake-like lightning. In the profound darkness corresponding to Sal de Ball Breeze, Lumian, a colossal giant standing over ten meters tall with two additional illusory heads and four exaggerated arms, witnessed the mysterious door to which he was attached slowly creaking open with a weighty grinding sound. Gradually, a crack emerged, and within the fissure, formless flames flickered. This time, less than a tenth of the nearby spiritual light spots remained. The various mystical symbols and connections had either dissipated or weakened to an extreme degree. The iron-black door, tainted with blood and rust, finally broke free from its constraints, and the crack became more pronounced. Before the collision of torrential rain, lightning, and the sun, the formless flames behind the door retreated silently, unveiling an endless path with no discernible end. Holding Jenna tightly, Lumian couldn't resist the ominous pull and descended through the door. His left chest glowed, and, along with the entire hostel and the other twelve rooms, they were on the verge of passing through the mysterious door. In the real market district, on the second floor of Sal de Ball Breeze. As reality and fiction switched, Gardner Martin, Supervisor Olson, and the members of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, who hadn't gone to set fire to wrist docks and other locations, seamlessly transitioned into the painting world. They remained on the ground, beside the deep darkness that represented Sal de Ball Breeze. This was thanks to a figure who had silently materialized behind them. Behind Supervisor Olson stood a man in formal attire, sans a bow tie. Aged between his thirties and forties, he possessed a high-nosed bridge, deep-set eyes, and light blue irises. His slightly curled brown hair framed an unusually stiff countenance, his eyes reflecting open disdain and arrogance. Behind Gardner Martin stood an old man with meticulously combed dark red hair, 
clad in a blue military suit adorned with a sash and medals. Though wrinkles marked the old man's face, his dark eyes emanated sharpness capable of toppling houses and uprooting the earth wherever they landed. They were the president and the most powerful vice president of the Iron and Blood Cross Order. Under their guardianship, Gardner Martin and Olson remained unaffected by the heretic's ritual, refraining from entering the painting world. As for the other upper echelons of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, they wreaked havoc in various parts of Trier, diverting the attention of official beyonders. Observing the dark depths of Sal de Ball Breeze morph into a pair of blood-stained iron-black doors, the four members of the Iron and Blood Cross Order entered without hesitation, as if they had executed the maneuver countless times before. In the deepest depths of Red Swan Castle, within the hall located in the underground maze, Count Poofer, clad in a robe and barefoot, had already arrived. By the glow of white candles, he fixated on the rusty bronze coffin. The coffin's lid shifted, unveiling illusory purple flames that filled the interior. These flames merged with the iron black ring embedded in the ground, beneath the bronze coffin. They blended with the viscous blood and withered hearts within the ring, forming an entrance, a deep entrance tainted with blood and rust. Through this entrance emanated a lofty, bloody, and frenzied aura from the underground. Count Poofer trembled under the influence of the aura, yet his eyes burned with fanaticism and fearlessness. This was his first proximity to the ancestor's mind. A twisted smile adorned Poofer's face as he strode forward, passing through the peripheral glow of candlelight and approaching the anomalous bronze coffin. In the entire world, only the Sauron family members with the corresponding talents who had bided their time in Red Swan Castle, the mysterious leader of the Secret Order, and the long-dead Emperor Roselle knew that beneath Red Swan Castle lay another breached seal of Fourth Epic Trier. The repairs had been completed using the hearts of generations of important Sauron family members as a seal, yet the problem proved irreversible. Vermont Champagne Sauron, who once dominated the Sauron family, had gone mad and entered the upper levels of Fourth Epic Trier. His frenzied spirit lingered at the seal, inextinguishable. His anguished roars echoed, affecting everyone in Red Swan Castle and those of the same bloodline. Now, it was time to put an end to the curse that had caused the Sauron family's decline and trapped the Saurons in nightmares. Count Poofer felt a potent sense of mission and honor. With the conviction that he would die here, he laughed maniacally, pressed his hand to the edge of the bronze coffin, and lay down. His figure plummeted into the deep entrance stained with blood and rust. As Count Poofer vanished into the bronze coffin, Elros Einhorn, in a beige hunting suit with a ponytail, entered the hall. Her gaze swept over the white candles and the bronze coffin, scrutinizing the changes in the seal. She then cut her finger, dripping three drops of bright red blood on the ground. Lowering her head, she recited solemnly, the embodiment of iron and blood, the symbol of the calamity of war, the priest who controls the weather, the great Snarmer Einhorn. After finishing the incantation, the blood on the ground boiled, expanding into a blood-colored lake before condensing into a figure clad in iron-black blood-stained armor. Standing over 1.8 meters tall, with long dark red hair and flamboyant golden earrings, the figure exuded androgynous, handsome features. Dark and brown eyes fixed on Elros as the figure nodded gently and spoke, well done. In the previous war, the family lost its most important object. We must seize every opportunity to make up for our losses, even if it's just a portion. With that, Snarner Einhorn entered the deep entrance of the bronze coffin. Elros's eyes flickered as she observed the scene. Finally, she sighed and said, Regardless, the Sauron family's curse will end. In apartment 601, three rue de Blouse's Blanches. Franca, with a mixture of surprise and concern, took out the primordial Demonis bone figurine and the ancient silver mirror she had obtained from underground. Uncertain about the significance of the abnormality in these two items, she decided to place them at a distance. Her plan was to wait and observe subsequent changes before deciding on the next course of action. At that precise moment, the classic silver mirror unexpectedly reflected the primordial Demonis figurine, even though it wasn't in its line of sight. This occurrence triggered a seismic disturbance throughout Rue de Blouse's blanches. Dark light surged from the mirror, enveloping Franca and Anthony Reed before they could employ any abilities. 
As the darkness subsided, only the coffee table, sofa, and various furnishings remained in apartment 601. Adjacent to the mural depicting a segment of the market district, behind the ecstatic painter, an ancient silver mirror detached from the painting world and gently descended into the shadows. Gradually sinking deeper and deeper, it swiftly vanished. Amidst the indescribable heat and the swirling world, Lumian and Jenna landed on a ground covered in pale black stone bricks. Their eyes were met with the sight of a magnificent city in the distance, featuring asymmetrical black buildings and vibrant red houses. A thin fog intermittently shrouded the city, giving it the appearance of a mirage, the kind occasionally encountered by pirates and sailors. In the wilderness beyond the city, dark clouds gathered, lightning flashed, thunder rumbled, and rain poured. A colossal figure, dozens of meters tall, stood surrounded by these natural phenomena, barely visible and indistinguishable. He lingered outside the city, enveloped in smoke, flames, hail, lightning, torrential rain, and violent winds, as if perpetual. Is this fourth epic trier? Lumian speculated, though uncertainty lingered. This wasn't quite what he had expected. Jenna subconsciously turned to look at him and noticed that he had reverted to his original appearance, no longer abnormally huge. He no longer possessed three heads and six arms. Chapter 473 Weakening of Corruption You've recovered, Jenna whispered to Lumian. She refrained from speaking loudly, fearing that it might agitate her companion and trigger the same mutation again. Plus, there was the concern of attracting the ominous giant's attention, shrouded in smoke and rain that made it elusive. Lumian locked eyes with Jenna and realized from the reflection that he was back to normal. Subconsciously, he responded, this means the hostile ritual, conducted by the heretics using me as a template, has ended. Suddenly alert, Lumian scanned the area. With the hostile ritual concluded, he anticipated the arrival of the evil gods bestowed from the other twelve rooms. His gaze focused on an unusual area adorned with pale black stone bricks, dominating the scenery. It sprawled out, filling Lumian's field of view, except for where it stopped short of the distant grand city and the colossal figure amidst the turbulent weather. Stretching across his vision, grayish-white stone pillars loomed every twenty to thirty meters, some standing tall and others succumbing to collapse. These pillars, broad enough to span the reach of three to four people, obstructed Lumian's and Jenna's view beyond. The sky above, supported by these stone sentinels, took on an odd translucency, as though an unseen fire silently raged, invisible to the naked eye. The resulting glow cast an eerie brightness, akin to dusk on a war-torn battlefield. Lumian, lacking dark vision, could perceive his surroundings clearly without conjuring a crimson fireball. He didn't notice Madame Puali's and the other bestowed of evil gods. Did the residents of the hostel not enter, or are they scattered in various places, arriving at random locations, he mused aloud. Unfazed, he redirected his focus, hoping Jenna possessed the pertinent information. Though Jenna grappled with the concept of random, she grasped Lumian's intent. Without delving deeper into that mystery, she pivoted to the more pressing concern. What should we do now? At the same time, Jenna made a connection. The hostel was created using Seal as a template. Based on the mystical knowledge involved in a demoness curse, could Seal harbor an evil gods bestowed within him? Ah. Uh. He seemed to have mentioned before that he had Mr. Fool's seal on him, and the one sealed is an evil gods bestowed? The transformation was actually similar to the effects of a curse, but due to the seal, there were no serious consequences. What do we do? Lumian assessed the chaotic scene before him, a colossal, blurry giant amid smoke, rain, lightning, and flames. He chuckled, our move now is to put some distance between us and that giant. We'll head in the opposite direction of the city, find a secure hiding spot, and observe the unfolding events. Our goal is to locate an exit swiftly. Despite feeling an unusual pull towards the giant and the city, Lumian managed to resist. He was no longer under the intense attraction that had gripped him before, now that he lacked an angelic level. Rationality prevailed as he carefully considered the risks and benefits. The giant, undoubtedly godlike in nature, seemed to be in a state of madness. 
Lumian, a Sequence 6 conspirer, couldn't afford to approach it casually. Just a glance could make him lose control. The city, possibly Fourth Epic Trier, held its own dangers, one that caused even demigods to perish within, with potential undead creatures and corruption like the old bones. Lumian had the full seal and the aura of Blood Emperor Lista Tudor, but he couldn't feel as relaxed, carefree, or fearless as returning to Kordu before the corruption. If he had entered the Fourth Epic's Trier with such intentions, he might have turned into an irrational, perpetually lingering monster sealed with an angel in the blink of an eye. With that, Lumian turned and sprinted in the opposite direction of the giant's figure in the ever-changing weather, away from the magnificent city. He needed to put some distance between himself and the looming threat. Nobody could predict if the massive creature would make any noise. The unrestrained voices of high-level Beyonders posed a grave danger to mid-sequence Beyonders. Jenna put her trust in the season seal and followed him with grace. They maneuvered past the grayish-white stone pillars, some standing tall while others lay in ruins, pushing further into the area paved with light black stone bricks. As Lumian sprinted, a slight frown creased his forehead. He could feel a significant drain on his spirituality after the intense battle in the painting world and multiple spirit world traversals. If another mishap occurred, he questioned how long he could endure. I need to find a way to replenish my spirituality. In reality, it's midnight. Should I lay low until 6 a.m.? Lumian contemplated as he dashed forward. In the fake market district on the surface, torrential rain cascaded upon Seraphine and the other rooms. They stood on the street across from Sal de Ball Breeze, their chests radiating with various hues. One by one, figures materialized, piercing through the void and descending into the profound darkness. They entered the iron black door tainted with blood and rust within the depths of the shadows. Seraphine gazed at the surreal scene, her vacant eyes and rigid expression suddenly overtaken by sorrow. Rainwater drenched her long brown hair. Beside her, Gabriel's face beamed with joy as he spoke in an otherworldly tone Is it over? Can we be together forever? Seraphine's rain soaked face twisted. She instructed Gabriel, leave this place and stay away from me. Why? Gabriel questioned, perplexed. Seraphine's role as a hostel room had been fulfilled. There shouldn't be anything else, right? The monster could resume its normal life. Seraphine uttered in pain, with the tenants gone, the hostel's rooms no longer hold any value. Before she could finish, a pair of transparent dragonfly-like wings sprouted from her back, etched with open, cold eyes. Silently, Seraphine's form disintegrated. The wet lake blue dress lost its support and plummeted to the ground. Adorned with writhing flesh and blood, each piece bore dragonfly-like, dreamy wings and eye-like patterns. Seraphine's head remained relatively intact. Surrounded by blood dragonflies, a few wheat ears and mushrooms sprouted from her face. Raindrops struck her face and slid. She opened her mouth, as if leading to another world, and her voice turned shrill. We're not bestowed, but the work of pixies. Go! Gabriel stared vacantly at Seraphine, a composition of blood dragonflies and a head. An indescribable sorrow etched across his empty, cold face. In the midst of the pouring rain and sunlight, he instinctively took a few steps in the opposite direction before halting. The playwright turned, retracing his steps toward Seraphine. A gentle smile curled on the corners of his mouth. I'd forgotten. I'm already a monster. Where can I go? I'm grateful you let me run on my own in the end. As Gabriel spoke, he bent down, allowing his knees to touch the ground and the puddles. His arms enveloped the countless blood dragonflies and Seraphine's struggling head, and he planted a deep kiss on the lips adorned with wheat ears and mushrooms. Thud! 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 The blood dragonflies sliced through his flesh with their wings, burrowing into his body, draining his life force. He persisted in the kiss. Raindrops pelted them. Before long, translucent and dreamy wings emerged from Gabriel's back, stained with blood. Amidst the spine-chilling gnawing sounds, Gabriel's body collapsed and melted, likewise for Seraphine's head. 
In the midst of the ensuing blood, strange shaped dragonflies with translucent wings, resembling meatballs, soared into the air, resembling bright fireworks in a storm. Suddenly, blazing sunlight descended, engulfing the area and the abnormal bodies. Not far away, Angulim, Valentine, and Imra spread their arms in unison. Upon returning to Eglise St. Robert, they remained unaffected by the ritual, no longer within the world of the painting. They stayed grounded, and once the situation stabilized, they made their way to Sal de Ball Breeze. Cartier Erast, Sacred Heart Cloister. Storms and lightning veiled the golden sun, but for now, they couldn't thwart the sunlight from piercing through. This caused the entrance to Sal de Ball Breeze to blur and tremble, yet it persisted. The painting world that had swapped with the surface gradually became ethereal, drawing nearer to returning to the rock wall. After Magician and Justice escaped the onslaught of sunlight, they realized they had lost Lady Moon's trail. The former's eyes sparkled with resplendent stars. Soon, she saw Lady Moon's silhouette. The evil god's blessed didn't conceal herself as she forcefully entered the unstable darkness and the mysterious, illusory iron-colored door. With a flash of starlight, the major arcana card holders, Magician and Justice, arrived outside Sal de Ball Breeze. The two hesitated, uncertain whether to pursue her. At that moment, Justice softly exclaimed, I feel that the underground's allure and beckoning towards me have weakened. Their hesitance stemmed from the fact that delving deep underground into Fourth Epic Trier would subject them to immense and abnormally terrifying corruption for demigods. The heretics didn't mind. Essentially, they had gone mad. At most, their madness would be more intricate and thorough, but they had no choice but to consider this issue. The corruption is weakened? Magician was surprised. As far as she knew, only two individuals could cause this phenomenon, one was Mr. Fool or the Celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. By temporarily bolstering the seal's power, they could curb the various corruptions in Fourth Epic Trier and diminish them. The other was the deity who had gained a rudimentary grasp of the greatest abnormality underground, the lord that created everything, the omnipotent and omniscient god, the lord who reigns behind the curtain of shadows, the ruler of the mind world, and the degenerated nature of all living things. Chapter 474 Encounter Justice, adorned in a simple yet elegant dress, turned her head to glance at magician, discerning her thoughts. The woman nodded slightly and uttered, it would have been abnormal if he hadn't intervened in this incident. You, too, know what he wants most. Magician didn't hesitate. With a sigh and a chuckle, she stepped into the faltering darkness. Justice followed closely behind. As they vanished, sunlight flooded the sky from St. Vive Cathedral on Trier's Island area, coalescing into a miniature sun. The sun's rays pierced the darkness of Sal de Ball Breeze, illuminating a translucent woman in a white robe adorned with golden threads. She possessed a captivating beauty and emitted a holy aura, as if impervious to the touch of dust. Trier's guardian angel paid no heed to the sacred heart cloister as she passed through the illusory door with a crack. Simultaneously, a whistle resonated from the patriarchal cathedral of the god of steam and machinery to the north of Trier. As if part of a ritual, it emitted an iron-black chimney, serving as the building's spire. A substantial amount of pale white fog billowed into the air, contorting and writhing to take on a discernible form. The figure that materialized was tall and handsome, with long chestnut hair. Cloaked in a monk-like gray robe and a white apron, he was Saint Bornova, recently assigned to the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery in Trier. Unlike Saint Vive, the angel didn't enter the seal, instead, he hovered in the air, vigilant against potential mishaps, including an attack from the Rose School of Thought's abomination. At that moment, a colossal hurricane erupted, enshrouding the golden sun above the sacred heart cloister in dark clouds, lightning, and torrential rain. With the advent of this apocalyptic phenomenon, the already unstable effects of the ritual, disrupted by various interferences, could no longer be sustained. The figures and the paintings lingering on the ground and the illusory illusions of surrounding buildings became instantly recognizable as fake. This virtual reality-like scene seamlessly overlapped with the tangible market district once more. 
Just as the surface and the underground were on the brink of switching, a figure materialized abruptly in front of the mirror-like darkness of Sal de Ball Breeze. This figure sported straight eyebrows and blue eyes, along with long chestnut hair cascading to the waist. Adorned in a white shirt with ribbons and flowers, a brown captain's coat with intricate patterns, beige pants, and dark brown leather boots, the ensemble exuded an eclectic charm. In her left hand, she gripped a golden item engraved with mysterious patterns, resembling a miniature lamp. Silently, the wick extending from the lamp's mouth spontaneously ignited, emitting a viscous, aqueous golden light. Within the luminous glow, a distorted and indistinct pale gold figure materialized. In a dignified and majestic voice, it conveyed, to resolve your father's problem, we can only allow him to accept another corruption at the same level, one more compatible with him, forming a certain balance. The woman holding the peculiar lamp scrutinized the pale golden figure deeply before her body suddenly turned ethereal, disintegrating into countless symbols and words. Like a torrent, she surged through the iron black door and the completely collapsed darkness. Franca and Anthony Reed, emerging from the dark light, regained their vision to find themselves in a dimly lit mine. A feeble light seeped into the mine from a distance, offering limited visibility. Damn it, did I enter that special mirror world again? Did the anomaly in the market district cause the primordial demonus figurine to resonate with the ancient mirror, triggering a chain reaction? Franca cursed inwardly. What is this called? When it rains, it pours. As a spectator, Anthony Reed's immediate response upon confirming his condition was to observe his surroundings. He noted that the mine wasn't overly expansive, with no other tunnels branching off. There was only one path ahead, leading toward the faint light. Franca, in that moment, realized that this place differed from her previous visits. It felt like she had reached the end of a particular dead end. Granted, she and Lumian had never thoroughly explored this special mirror world, making it normal for them to be unfamiliar with uncharted areas. Where are we? Anthony Reed inquired of Franca, who clearly held some knowledge, when he saw a figure emerge from a crevice in the rock wall beside him. The figure curled up and hugged him, trembling. The figure, dressed in military green attire and sporting a light yellow crew cut, was Anthony Reed himself. As if sensing Anthony's gaze, the figure turned his head, his dark brown eyes filled with resentment and malice. Unfazed, Franca sighed with familiarity. Your mirror version isn't too aggressive. The trembling Anthony Reed vanished. Franca averted her gaze and briefly elucidated their location and the means of departure. Upon checking her belongings, she realized that only the ancient silver mirror was missing. The primordial demoness bone figurine remained securely in her possession. Franca concluded, the problem now is that the path out is guarded by a powerful monster. I relied on Seal's uniqueness to divert it last time. I don't know what to do now. Let's find another exit first. Yes, we have to hurry. Staying in this mirror world for too long will cause problems. All right. Anthony Reed, lacking experience in this area, chose to heed Franca's suggestion. The two of them paid no mind to the faces lurking in the darkness on either side. They swiftly moved forward and entered the only tunnel. As they progressed, the illumination increased, and visibility improved. After walking for a while, Franca and Anthony Reed halted at a suspected exit. It resembled a cave, sealed by pure light. After exchanging glances, Franca initiated the use of magic mirror divination and other methods to confirm the authenticity and danger of the exit. However, she received no response. Phew. Franca exhaled and said to Anthony Reed, Let's give it a try. If it's not right, we'll retreat. There's no other way. Okay. Anthony Reed nodded and placed his hand on the door of light alongside Franca. Their figures passed through. Lumian and Jenna sprinted between towering, collapsed grayish white stone pillars until they reached the edge of the area covered in pale black stone bricks. However, what awaited them was still the pitch black and blood red city with the giant figure shrouded in violent winds, lightning, heavy rain, smoke, and flames. The only change was their perspective, now positioned on the side instead of facing the giant and the turbulent weather. 
Confused, Jenna muttered, we were running in the opposite direction. Why did we circle back? Lumian glanced back and explained, as a hunter, it's unlikely for me to get lost. The current situation suggests that there's a problem with the directions of this space. Perhaps, no matter where we run, we'll eventually return to this vicinity. Fortunately, the distance between them and the giant figure had barely increased, estimated to be two to three thousand meters. Upon hearing Lumian's explanation, Jenna cast her gaze forward. Beyond the pale black stone bricks, in the wilderness connected to the majestic city, mirror fragments were scattered. They weren't large, but there were thousands of them. Lumian surveyed the scene, contemplating an alternative plan. A sudden realization struck him, a swift method to rapidly restore his spirituality. In a space effective at weakening the influence of an evil god, he could execute a ritual, siphon the boon, and ascend to sequence six ascetic of the inevitability pathway. By destabilizing various states, the ritual would promptly restore and amplify Lumian's spirituality. In essence, he could exchange the stability of his current state for the enhancement and replenishment of his spirituality. Before initiating the ritual, Lumian needed to ascertain one crucial detail. Would this place render Mr. Fool incapable of observation? If that were the case, Termoboros might exploit the ritual to escape with the unintelligent seal itself. After all, the core of the ritual involved breaking the seal and drawing out the corresponding power of inevitability. Just as Lumian was about to instruct Jenna to keep a vigilant watch, a figure emerged from a shattered mirror in the wilderness. Their pupils dilated, and instinctively, Lumian and Jenna sought cover behind the grayish-white stone pillar and the partially collapsed rubble. The figure swiftly materialized, standing over 1.7 meters tall and clad in a black cloak. Lumian stole a quick glance in that direction before retracting his gaze. The figure seemed oddly familiar. Before long, a familiar voice rang out from the side. You're not slow either. The, this is Gardner Martin. He's involved too. Lumian didn't dare to peek out. Then, he recalled the identity of the cloaked figure. The Carbonari member he had encountered, the one followed by Franca. Shouldn't the Carbonari be causing chaos on the surface? Lumian wondered. At that moment, Jenna produced a mirror and gestured if Lumian needed assistance. She could use mirror magic, utilizing mirror-like items to display their reflections onto a designated mirror. Numerous mirror fragments lay nearby at the edge of the wilderness. Lumian shook his head slowly and mouthed and gestured to Jenna, signaling her to wait a moment. He decided to act at a critical juncture. There was no need to take unnecessary risks at this point. At that moment, a mellow, deep voice responded to Gardner Martin, where's the president of your Iron and Blood Cross order? Headed there, of course, Gardner Martin replied with a smile. It's the stage for important figures, and we have our own mission. He paused a beat before continuing, why are you still wearing the cloak? Is it someone new beneath? You're still as cautious as ever, the deep voice sighed. Lumian and Jenna heard the rustling of clothes. Lumian immediately signaled Jenna with his eyes. Jenna took the hint and recited the incantation silently, her hand resting on the mirror. The aqueous light on the mirror's surface flickered, revealing a figure. The figure wore a cloak without the hood. His hair was thick and slightly curly, and his eyes were as sharp as an eagle's. His beard was neatly trimmed, and the bridge of his nose was slightly raised. W.H. Lumian recognized the person. Philip. The deceased General Philip. Chapter 475 Conspirer. Recognizing the black cloaked man as the late General Philip, a surge of realization struck Lumian's mind, cutting through the darkness. He connected various dots and reevaluated details he had previously deemed a stretch. Earlier, Lumian had queried Gardner Martin about his support for Hugues Artois, the spokesperson of numerous evil gods. Martin asserted that he was well aware of Artois's nature and the sinister forces backing him. Martin endorsed Artois for Parliament with the belief that he would repeatedly bring calamity to the market district, compelling citizens and workers to rally behind the Iron and Blood Cross order, 
preparing for a future government overthrow. Until today, Lumian had accepted this reasoning on the surface. Even if Martin hadn't disclosed the complete truth, he had unveiled a fraction of it. However, now it appeared that 90% of Martin's statement was a fabrication. Hugues Artois had been groomed by the late General Philip and thrust into politics. Gardner Martin had clearly established a cooperative relationship with General Philip long ago. His backing of Hugues Artois wasn't merely an opportunistic exploit, rather, he had been intricately involved in the plan from the outset. Similarly, General Philip, having feigned his death and diverged from his intended fate, utilized the Dream Seekers charity organization to finance painters and other evil God bestowed. Simultaneously, he joined the Carbonari, fomenting riots and rebellions. Lumian found this not entirely surprising, but the connection with Gardner Martin and the Iron and Blood Cross Order added an intriguing layer to the details. By the time the hostile ritual officially commenced, Lumian had already grasped the essence of this conspiracy. Yet, some explanations seemed a bit forced. For instance, how had Meyer Maipu, having left the Bliss Society in frustration and returned to the market district to prove himself, managed to contact the painters or the evil gods bestowed planning the hostile ritual? One plausible explanation was that Susanna, while still the high priestess of the Bliss Society, had established connections with other cults before her demise. As Maipu Meyer's lover and a crucial member of the Bliss Society, he should have had some contacts. However, upon closer scrutiny, it felt a tad contrived. Did Maipu Meyer truly maintain good relationships with believers of other evil gods? Would he naturally seek their aid when confronting challenges to prove himself? Despite Maipu Meyer's knowledge of an angel sealed within Lumian's body, he couldn't fathom exploiting this information beyond offering sacrifices. Unless the Mother Tree of Desire bestowed a revelation directly, why wouldn't the recipient, potentially having received a divine revelation, flaunt it? Why face ostracism from other Bliss Society members? Lumian found that all the details made more sense now that Gardner Martin and his connection to General Philip were revealed as part of the conspiracy. Following the Tree of Shadow disaster, Gardner Martin tasked Lumian, Franca, and their subordinates in the market district with investigating the incident and Hugues Artois' assassination. However, he would undoubtedly gather information about the Bliss Society's actions, mistakes, and issues through General Philip. In these circumstances, Maipu Meyer, seeking a return to the market district, naturally established a connection with General Philip, who had shown interest in such matters, and provided crucial information. Consequently, Gardner Martin had long been aware of what was sealed within Lumian. The entire hostile ritual might have been conceived by him, General Philip, and the painters. One of them harbored a long-standing desire for Fourth Epic Trier and possessed extensive knowledge of secrets and mysticism. They understood the seal's operation and its past leaks. Sal de Ball Breeze, owned by the Savoy Mob, and 13, Avenue du Marquet served as a testing ground for the Iron and Blood Cross Order's new members. The other had a deep connection to the domain of fate. Through the financial support of the Dream Seekers charity organization, he had united many cults, accumulating vast knowledge in various aspects. The reason why Hugues Artois had numerous evil gods bestowed protecting him wasn't merely due to his ability to interact with problematic individuals or the deeply ingrained enlightened perception he had on others. Instead, it was because his backer, General Philip, a veteran of large-scale wars, had long been dedicated to cooperating with heretics to achieve a crucial goal. Lumian suspected that Gardner Martin hadn't officially tested him and allowed him to join the Iron and Blood Cross Order out of initial trust. Instead, he had finalized the hostile plan and decided to keep Lumian under close watch, exerting various influences and manipulating him. If the Tarot Club hadn't intervened and the ritual hadn't been hastily advanced, it was highly likely that Gardner Martin or a demigod of the Iron and Blood Cross Order would have been the one to ultimately confront Lumian and transport him into the painting world to activate the ritual. As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian's understanding became clear. Everything Gardner Martin had undertaken since the Tree of Shadow disaster was geared towards the hostile ritual. As expected of a former or current conspirer, Lumian sighed sincerely. Certainly, 
Gardner Martin might not have been aware of the residual aura of Blood Emperor List the tutor that Lumian carried, but he likely harbored suspicions. However, he couldn't fathom the core issue. After all, he was aware that an angel was sealed within Lumian Lee's body, a walking anomaly bound to attract attention. Regarding whether Gardner Martin knew about another organization backing him and Franca, Lumian believed that Martin had sensed something awry, but the precise details remained elusive. Even Maipu Meyer, not present at the Tree of Shadow ritual, was unaware of the events during that time. Lumian signaled Jenna to cease the mirror magic to evade detection by Gardner Martin and General Philip. Meanwhile, he pondered. Why does the Iron and Blood Cross Order covet Fourth Epic Trier so intensely, going to such lengths in preparation? What is their ultimate goal? If I hadn't arrived in Trier, stayed at Aubert's Du Coke door, and attracted the fallen tree spirit Susanna Mattis, what would have been the original plan of the Iron and Blood Cross Order and the various cults? How did they intend to bypass the seal and unlock the door to Fourth Epic Trier? As the latter question surfaced, Lumian recalled something. Gardner Martin had once directed Rat Christo's smuggling caravan to transport an item into Trier through an underground tunnel. This item activated the special mirror world hidden underground. Later, Franca sensed that item while tracking the black cloaked Carbonari member, General Philip, who had faked his death. Now, General Philip had also entered this place, suspected to be Fourth Epic Trier. They had made extensive preparations, including orchestrating a massive riot. Their goal was to use that item and its connection to the mirror fragments in the wilderness to infiltrate this place through the seal leak that once appeared beneath Sal de Ball Breeze. Later, they had a better choice, me. Damn it. Gardner Martin's words about why he supported Hughes Artois' election as a member of parliament were mostly true. He did need such a person to incite public anger in the market district, not to overthrow the government, but to satisfy the ritual. Heh <laughs> pushing villains into power while posing as the leader of the resistance. He's both the antagonist and the protagonist. He's truly extracting the value from all the people in the market district dry. Lumian reacquainted himself with the sequence name Conspirer through Gardner Martin. At that moment, Jenna grasped Lumian's meaning and discontinued the mirror magic. Gardner Martin smiled and said, It's indeed you, Philip. Let's enter fourth epic trier. Philip. Jenna, who had only a vague impression of General Philip's photo from the shadows, now realized that the cloaked man Franca had been trailing was General Philip, the one who had faked his death. Philip's deep, mellow voice resounded. Aren't you going to find Lumian Lee? If he becomes your loyal subordinate and joins your team, you can immediately complete the ritual, consume the potion, and advance to a demigod. Gardner Martin sighed and responded, I find it a pity too. An angel is sealed within him, and he alone is a team. I've given him many chances, but he never understood what loyalty meant. Now, I have an alternative. Let him perish naturally in fourth epic trier. An angel sealed within him? Jenna's eyes widened as she looked at Lumian. Lumian smirked and scoffed at Gardner Martin's words. I'd be a fool to believe you. The person scheming to use me from the start talking about loyalty and pity? Just as Gardner Martin and General Philip turned around to walk toward the magnificent city, two figures emerged from a mirror fragment in the nearby wilderness. It was Franca, dressed in a blouse, beige white breeches, a small dark brown coat, and black leather boots, along with Anthony Reed, clad in military green. Franca scanned the surroundings and spotted Gardner Martin, encased in full body silver armor with his visor raised. Anthony Reed's gaze locked onto General Philip's face featuring a prominent bulge on his nose. The eight eyes met, and the air momentarily froze. Count Poofer's figure materialized at the edge of the wilderness, in front of the pale black stone bricks. Gazing at the giant shrouded in storms, lightning, flames, and smoke, standing dozens of meters tall, he sprinted over with the fanatical expression of a sacrificial lamb. It was Vermanda Sauron, who had lost control and gone underground. The former Archangel, the Conqueror, who was very close to a deity's throne. 